opportunity against Louis to find the siege, but it's costing him everything for it. Yeah, out of the center of that fight there, Louis just sweeps the floor with Numidon's middle, and he's now going to be pushing back those ranged units. Numidon! Oh my god, 27 population in the siege, and all of it is under siege from the cab. Rothbow's trying to cut him down, but now that means the Langsnake are not being sniped. I yeah. think this is going to break the bank for Numidon. Yeah, he doesn't have that much gold in reserve, though, but he does have decent enough income, maybe to remass on, uh, on crossbows if he had to. But the second crossbow mass is still alive. Yeah, but the second line to give nice chasing in. The lag's neck I'm pursuing. This is awkward. Every time you turn around, it's a nice little slice into you. And also, remember, they have got the Zorn House, so the bleed damage coming through. Numidon down to 20 crossbows. You know, the, the issue I'm seeing this game is Numidon, he ended it from a Charlie perspective when he needed to find a way of being offensive. And Louis has been constricting the map like a boa. Mango coming in with a heavy hit. No dodge attempt coming through. Jean at least hits the ground flat dead. But I don't think this matters anymore. Essentially, Louis is just looking to play French versus Juji now. But the Mango's like, this is what I'm worried about right now. Like, okay, it looks like he's gonna be protected from it for a second. Gonna be moving by Louis. Two Sprills is not enough. He takes out the anti seize but the Mango's on guard and no! He's gonna lose the Sprill on the other side. This time's coming from Jean. I don't know if this is going to be good enough. Mangos take out another one. Number 50 up. XP. Castle goes up. But now, Louis can just wipe you out on this. Da, 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 da. So this is really important, by the way, because B needs to get out of his base. Gold's a problem. He's, 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 he's exhausting the gold way too quick. Bro, Bloodline's been queued up. Oh. Villages. What the hell? What? <laughs> Lucifron. Wait, did he accidentally select them with the army there? Divine Restoration is going to come out. He's looking to snipe the back line. Oh my gosh, these recipes just <laughs> changed <laughs> the game. Where is he going to Oh my... What the my. heck just happened? The upgrades aren't in. He's, he's got all these me? expensive techs and he just fought over this gold. Why this gold mine? Oh, he's just starting to dive in. Game bait, deep, great micro there. B, he pulls him into the main formation. Nice. I'll try and extract value on the back side of this, but this is tricky. B has the numerical advantage. He also has the better quality units when it comes to infantry. These knights need to hit hard for Lucifron. They look to do that. Arch is taking out the spears, and the knights are in on top of green. A good fight here for Lucifron, and B, he can't run away anymore. He has to stand and fight, but this is going to cost him. Arch is so much fierce. And This is the problem for a few knights that we need. The Ghazi count is way too low. We see a little bit out of position with the military mass. Wham circles around with the knights going for the dive and circling around with his main military. BC feels like he has to take it. Wall gets deleted. It sounded like behind this, but multiple camel lances going down and it doesn't feel like... <gasps> oh, oh, this is no. over. The, the villagers, they have nowhere to go. The knights circled, the horsemen circled. Like, there's nothing that BC can do, but we've seen him crawl from the depths before. We've seen him come out of games where he's been in worse off positions than this, but it does not seem like it is getting any better. Villagers are still running, still circling, and look at his food income. 286 food per minute. Yeah, I'll tell you what I really like is composition as they're coming in here. I Major think they're on the back side though. So far we're gonna want to try to dive past this, but the choke point's just too stuck into that location. Hasn't been able to cut through it yet and just now gets past it on top of the Manjanique. Manjanique trying to fall back in between the crossbows. Puppy Paul still taking the fight. And looks like he is still winning the fight, but Manjanique is still alive, getting healed up by some villagers. Great micro by Marine Lord. Range units still attacking the best they can, but will have to fall back as I don't know where the sofa mass is anymore. No, the sofa tried to dive in on the Manjanique and they failed their mission because this is a three pronged attack. East, west, north side of Marine Lord's base. We split up his units in all those different areas. Spearmen have no idea where to go over on the eastern side. They had some sofas to deal with. Now they have other units to deal with. Manjanique trying to get repaired on the middle side. It looks like this eastern side is going to get cleaned up, however. The but sofa Western broke through the spot. The this was really oh. the key. Now the farming eco gets hit. Marine Lord hasn't yet reacted. Just now reacting. But military units are starting to get cleared up from Puppy Paul's side. And his mass is starting to get thinned out. Potentially. Sofa diving in yet again. There's still spears though on this front line. There isn't a ton of other units here from Puppy Paul yet. Good engagement from Puppy Paw making marine lord back up a little bit we're seeing it's the constant army composition changes that i am just falling in love with with this game they're realizing 
what unit the opponent is making, and they're just making the counter. Something within the grand scheme of things, when your head is on a swivel, you're on four different places. Something that you might not necessarily think about. Oh! And that's the huge differing factor. Got that. He's at about 2,500. This is late game for him. Yeah, the farm transition has fully come through and... Okay. <laughs> See, that's, walls aren't that good, you guys. Walls aren't that good. That's good to know. That's good to know. Oh my gosh. And yes, villagers don't matter as much for Molly. They do matter a little bit, especially when there's this many villagers. Hello, Puppy Paw? P oh, puppy he's trying Paul. to stick he's it, and he's not, he's not gonna, he's not gonna, stick gonna it. finish it. There's six villagers left. He loses. It's, a, it's done. GG game number one. Throw a knight in there that might end up going down. You're seeing plus eights oh, on your screen look over and at over this again. Juicy XP coming in, but TC fire was just close enough, so a lot of those spears were actually getting taken down by PC fire, which is not where you want to be. Knights arrived just a little too late, and JD gets surrounded. He has 44 units on the field compared to half that for Puppy. Yeah, and I mean, John Dark's best unit, which is the Royal Knight at this part, ends up becoming null and void, and it's very expensive. A lot of them are going to end up going down. Arboletra is basically making up the majority of the force now. Not really much of a front line. They're only John's champions, which are good against Spearmen, but there are just way too many Spearmen that can find restoration coming in clutch. John Dark! Oh my god, I can't take this anymore. At, what is that, six, fifth, six times she's gone down? Dylan. That fight where there are some Camo Lancers, and if he walks into that Manjanique, that could be an issue. That ranged mass does take a pretty good hit, but they're overall going to stay survived. There's a lot of Shaman in the background for the Mongolians. Not something that we're really used to. Those villagers are getting caught right, traversing right next to <laughs> that Mongolian arc. Oh, Jesus. This is devastating. It's up on the south side. BC doing a good job. Mike ring against those Spearmen. And I think, you know, even though this is a technically a hold for certain, I think this was a very good fight by Beastie. Yeah, I think this could have gone a lot worse for Beastie looking back at it. He's still taking decent trades here. There's not a huge troop mass, and, and that's really where the troops are scary. It's not when there's 10, 15 of them. It's when there's 40, 50, and Zertan does not have food. This is where, what I kept saying, like, he needed to keep this location secured, and he hasn't been able to do so. Villagers pulling out the shivs. Villagers are going for the archers as well. There's nothing to defend up. Archers here that can really take a, a good fight. We can see this Ghazi starting to push in, but Spearman just enough there to hold these Ghazi Raiders off but the archers just keep plunking away and plunking away. Even more importantly, he can pick off a lot of villagers here after this battle's over. You can actually see the Ayuba villagers on the run with their gold, their bags are packed, and Louis is just gonna sit there and take this fight. I think he figures, you know what, let's do it before he gets all his upgrades in. That's... Oh man, and this keep might not go up. That's a lot of archers. Oh man. Oh no! Uh... <laughs> that is a ton of, I mean, how many villagers there? 10? A lot of villagers. Oh my like lord. Damage. He's not reacting. It's that it's that ghost raid. You're getting so many pings. You don't know what's going on. As you can see though, Joan could be the tipping point in this fight, but will it be enough as the keep is just about finished? A few villagers going down as they're trying to build it. Oh, that was a perfect time for Joan to get her next level in, and that keep is gonna be finished. And I think Louis is gonna be able to hold this. Military, you think about how many villagers they have. So that's all something that comes into play here. As we see that red palace up about to go down, but a lot of mangonels from Louis. One, two, three, four, one, four mangonels. And right now, Louis pushing out. Maybe if you get to like seven digits, the game crashes for the both not. Yeah, it's very possible. But now as you can see, free, uh, <laughs> free bombard has been spawned out by uh, the French. And Jones back there with her nerf gun taking shots. And more siege moving on up. Magic didn't have a single spring gold, and his entire army got annihilated by those mangonels. The rest of the stragglers are being chased down by knights, and you see the mangonels completely ignore this keep over here. They just want to take out those premium units to hand cannoneers. Magic forced to flee, forced off the gold line. And here comes the ram push. Will he be able to hold? Big, big, big fight right now. Louis, lots of rams there. Of course, hand cannoneers, not the best option for taking those out. What is going on as the dust clears? Just all I see is gunpowder smoke plumes. Yeah, it's, it's hand can near plus mangano versus how is magic gonna be able to get himself out of this one? Um, I don't think he can to be honest. I think 
hand cannon use only isn't going to solve his issue, and we touched on this before, Fitz. It's population efficiency. Spearman, hand cannon here just cannot beat this army. Against one of the best night killers in the game. And here he goes, yeah, it works. Ganisari is firing off villagers, taking a, a shot there at the night. Seem to be kind of fleeing. Manganel is going to take a huge volley on the archers in the back line. Look how much health they just lost there. Ganisari is absolutely cleaning up anything that gets close. It doesn't look like Dima has lost many units at all in this engagement. There's that healing from Joan of Arc coming in. Trying to get back there as Warp just chases and chases and chases. Uh, all three sacred saves. Was he able to hold it? I thought that northern one was going to go down, but I think he might have held all those sacred sites. Oh, man, that's going to be huge. If he's able to keep Dima pinned to his base, I mean, three minutes left, that could be a real possibility. Man, I'm chasing all the way back to... His main base, Dimu now under the cover of the town center. Vortex though continuing to push up. We'll look at uh, a meat grinder here though, as we've got uh, the Malian unit production happening right on top of Vortex. But he's got lots of knights, he's got lots of man arms. This might be enough of to take. It's hard to really tell here. Dimu needs to stand on that sacred site. He killed it. Oh my gosh, is he gonna pull this off? I, it was looking like Dimu was about to grab it. Very nice split. Uh, split micro here because oh they're Lord. all over the place middle we got something going on what is that okay he's got a key to protect that it's down to the northern and south sacred site i think vortex might pull this off i, I think he has it i think Debo Biz judged this he was trying to intercept the reinforcing forces if he just stands on that sacred site with everything he has to the south i think yeah. he has it now he's desperate to send in two sofas trying to pause it at three two oh. Now, I know they got rid of Joan of Arc's, like, area of attack inside of towers, I believe. What about rams? Uh, I guess I haven't tested if that... What was that? <laughs> that was a... That was a... <laughs> the torch shot from downtown! What was that? Archer's curious choice over here. This Magnol is lagging behind over here. Being a non-factor in this fight has to retreat for a time being. Yep, we've got two Manganels for B getting ready to volley. Can Ram get away from it? Looks like he does. Trying to get the Springlets forward. That Malian army is shoving in there before any of those techs can come in for Wham. But this is a good time for B to take this fight. Springlets being very effective in this engagement. Uh, you see B losing his siege units, but I think B got that last volley off there on his archers and with his army is able to do enough damage. So how is he going to follow up with this, I guess, would be the question. You can see Manganels barely still alive. It's hanging on by a thread. Um, looks like we're going to have some Musafati gunners being mixed in over here by MIB. Whereas a couple of John's champions are coming in for Wham. I'm not the biggest fan of going so heavy on the Spearman and uh, crossbow department for Wham, though. Especially the Spearman, they won't be very population efficient lately. For now, it's fine because he's not 200 out of 200. But eventually, he's going to have oh. to... Oh, my lord! Eventually, wow. he's going to have to transition to something more um, population efficient. But for now, the spearmen are just shredding all these sofas. He needs to transition into making an army right now, because Joan of Arc is moving with a vengeance. And right now, lots of... Yeah, and <laughs> just when we're like, okay, how's the way I'm going to react? He's like, this is how I'm going to do it. Boom! Bring the villagers out. Nest of Bees getting huge value there. He's repairing them. Able to take this army pretty uh, single handedly. Reinforcements are going to be challenging. Imperial Aid Delhi coming up. Not something we see every day, especially at this level. Look at all the Manganels. He has one, two, three, four. Putting the siege and siege Akuti underneath the keep. And uh, let's see if he's able to hold this. I'm shocked by Anjan continuing to fight on despite this onslaught that's been going on. Uh, there's been 100. <laughs> 100, 104 villagers killed. Uh, if we total them up, I guess it's just about 150 from both players. A lot of days, but here we come. New elephants, and what is that? They come with their trainers. These scholars are here to bring healing to all. And uh, oh boy, oh boy, Anton's got to be worried. You see, in those scholars skipping across the map. Here comes the elephants, and they got cool little flowers on their head. Those are also melee elephants instead of the ranged elephants. So they actually have 300 extra HP compared to the units that you've seen before. There we go. And you called this litter core, I gotta say. I, I, I wasn't sure we would actually get to see some elephants. This is beautiful. 
Okay, here we go. A million elephants coming out of Beastie. I haven't seen this in a while, but let's see how it goes. Against pure hand games and spears, I think it's gonna get eaten alive, quite honestly. The castle and the oh my gosh. Oh, he could have turned this around somehow. I mentioned yep. early in the game that, you know, as strong as Delhi is, if this goes super, super late, army composition gets a little rough for the Delhi Sultanate. I mean, he looks like he's surviving this push. Maybe he just needs to wear out Anagen's gold here because he is eating, killing right at the last second. It was looking like he was going to take him out. But losing a, basically his only remaining army here uh, to some of those. He is able to kill some of the fishing boats, but man, it would be great. And on water. Beautiful demo. Yeah, Vortex pushing up. Marine Lord, of course, will be reinforcing from the docks nearby. You gotta be very careful playing close to the dock because the demos can come out. He's also got the heated shot. You can see from the dock, taking some shots to his boats. Vortex taking a lot of casualties. You can see seven villagers. Oh, man. Okay, Vortex gonna be pushing in here underneath the town center. Not a great spot to be. But you do see actually there's this, uh, there's the scholars in there. The, I'm sorry, the uh, imams uh, dishing out some healing. And Vortex pushes under the base. At least if you're a Huge Vortex raid. fan. Oh my gosh. That is exactly what Vortex needed in this game. He took a gamble detaching the calf from his army, but now it's kind of paying off a lot of damage on the eco. Marine Lord is the one that's going to dive super aggressively now. Wow. We've seen this before. But look at all these archers. Of course, the Tower of Victory going on. Uh, though the Ghazi gonna get shredded most likely by this Janissary. Well, I don't know how well this game is gonna go. He's trying to pick off the Janissaries and the archers. Okay, but it looks like Marine Lord is just eating up this Delhi army. Palace Guard Mass. There is no better way because they have to defend the, the Nest of Bees, right? Like the entire comp that Chinese run in Castle Age is siege and melee to defend. Lion's Neck force you to clump up to keep them protected and then punish you for it. So if Louis cannot turn this fight, he's pretty much done by the next wave. And it's looking like he might be done with this one. Nest of Bees holding the choke point. Village is trying to repair, but the Longbow's already diving in and Louis Without the capabilities to, to man a serious defense here, it feels like this actually might be the killing blow. Nesta B is just about staying alive. They're in the choke, they're getting repaired. First, this will be though going down, Lumberman. But the quality of Crossbow Stirrup down the way could not be denied. These arbitrary really are the late game bloomer for John Dark. Yeah, at this point, the Horseman as well. Having so much additional pierce armor, like usually the crossbows still do a lot of damage through the armor from the uh, from the horsemen. At this point in time, though, it's reduced significantly with the lead and the additional plus one pierce armor. Puppy Paw in theory would need to tank quite a lot there, but no, Vortex is actually target firing her and John. Oh, puppy Paw, Puppy Paw, no, John, she's gone down. Wow, the upgrade Wait, just in time, but it wasn't fast enough. <laughs> no, 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 that's more. worse. That's so much more. worse. Oh no. Whoa, Knights, whoa. when they go down, <laughs> they propose. Dude, oh, that's a lot of value. Essence, and unfortunately, they're oh, about to lead all. Puppy Paw will get back just in time to protect it. Mango oh, Shock does so almost low. kill it, though. It's so low. Wait, pulling villages to repair oh, no. might not be advisable. Oh, no. And it's out. Oh, no. And he doesn't have gold. He doesn't have gold. It's about to run out. He doesn't have the gold for another one. I don't think he has those he villages anymore. I'm telling you, he's gonna do it. You know, he's when we say it's it. much faster for Iron Bid, it doesn't really look that fast when you just watch it like this. Oh. Ah. He's just playing with us. He's just See? playing with us at this <laughs> point in time. It's, it's, actually, like, it's actually very important because the reason why it's important to actually gather those berries down as much as you can, it's more optimal early on, right? You don't have wheelbarrow yet. So if you can make them last the very last second, between the units, what they are now fine. What do you think fine. is more realistic, them fixing parting or them just adjusting the stats of the unit? <laughs> You know, I, 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 no comment. All right, I, I've already been sorry enough about catch rage for the day. We don't need to go deeper into this. Right now, this fight looks fixed. There'll always be a doom stack for, for Louis, though. He's losing out. Yeah, so that's, that's really bad. Like, Ayubit's winning against Delhi here with, like, the early engagements. That's setting Ayubit's up for, like, a perfect timing for the transition, rather, into Castle Camelot yeah. is now in, and I think that, that looks like that might be a, a GG state. Louis. Five villagers behind. Military is easy to get, get short up. Relics are always being dragged back by both players, but the problem is you now have nothing to defend your base with. 
the stretch of Volo comes in. But the archers of his, they've been also focusing on the Camel Lancer. There must be some full process Louis come up with. Um, I think maybe it's the idea of having that flexibility to do that, those different builds we just highlighted. Whereas, like, I feel like when you're going for the uh, IO opening, you always feel bad. Are you kidding me, dude? <laughs> Wait. For TC spot. There we oh, go. No. <laughs> Oh, uh, that, uh, that is a win right I'll there. Oh, just cancel, cancel, cancel. Build on the other side. Go in. If she goes in, she's going to instant target down. Like, look Ooh, at that. Bird like of her that. HP. <laughs> yeah, you cannot lose her. You definitely cannot use, lose her right now. No, she's going. Louis? She's, oh, she's done it out. She's down. She's down. John is. Wait, she's alive. About to go dark. Free HP. Okay, huh? dude, he's, he's got to be close. There it is. There it is. That's there what he's is. waiting. Level three is in. But Marine Lord. I think he should have what he needs to hold here. Cruel is going to complete. If he retreats towards it, it might cost him a few traders, but this army will then become unbreachable. Does he think Anatan is trading as a Chinese? No. What? <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? No. What? He's actually <laughs> setting up fishing, huh? dude. <laughs> out of all the things, out of all the things, that is the, li that, that is the last thing that I expected. I mean, that dot drop actually is going to pay dividends. Not in the immediate two minutes, but three, four minutes down the line, Anatan's going to be out of food. Yeah, the Gulums are absolutely wiping the floor with the front line there. Oh, three is a couple of great hits, but it's not enough. Uh, it's not going to be enough there. The village is not able to keep it alive. Are we not seeing just some archers? Like, they're. Oh my god, goodbye, Roman. Uh, not just that, Roman. Look at the queue of explosives on the way. <laughs> Yeah, it's... I haven't seen B for much longer in this game. I'll I'll tell you that, and it's not just because my glasses are fogging up. No, de demos have that, that effect. Typically, they blow everything off the screen, like all those fishing boats! Okay, that, that did that. That is it. Like, we're, we're done here. Let's just get to game number three. All the fishing yeah. is just... And he's on five scholars. This could be B star, where he just pulls all the scholars as well for this next big fight to help heal as well. And the heal actually makes a big difference against the Unobligations as well. What happened to these eco count? We'll pause that for Flash coming in. Unobligation. We'll clear up these spinners quickly. There's no horse from behind the surf. Just Samurai now being added Banana Tan. Melee Tech level 2 hasn't come through just yet. But the melee defense is not there for B either. Outpost is going to help a lot to defend this, but this is a strong army. However, B has already lost the Ghazi, and this is where you have to pull away a great fight there for Anatan. The army yep. value right now, it's so far ahead for BC with those eight Janissaries He's gonna have to out. leave the archers behind, like you can't defend this. Janis are moving in, archers are trying to trade it out, but look how quickly you die with the fortitude activated. Lucifer on, about to get pushed all the way back, likely to lose the sacred sites. This is where the game begins to get scary. Time to start day number two of the Elite Classic 2 playoffs. Oh boy, is it going to be a fun one. One and all, welcome back to the for Action. I, of course, from KP. Joining me is always the wonderful Winston. Winston, it's crazy already. We started with eight at the beginning of the weekend. By the end of this weekend, we would have culled half of the remaining players. And I think it's fair to say, we were both watching those games yesterday. Some big surprises happening in both of those series. Yeah, I mean, yesterday, the weekend before, everything's just been so crazy. This whole tournament, honestly, has been really fun. I feel like that's my biggest takeaway so far of the Elite Classic 2, is it's matched the hype and fun of the Elite Classic original, right? I don't know if it was called 1 at the time, because, you know. But the Elite Classic 2 has just proven to be a really, really fun one so far. Um, Yeah, watching these games yesterday, some... Some really wild stuff. I feel like the highlight for me was the Louis B match, where Louis just... Wow, you know, it's it's impressive. Like it, it yep. that was that was like, okay, is B having an off day or is Louis just on it, right? And he seemed really solid. I mean, he's been impressing, right? Like uh he finished off his group stage towards the end, being able to beat Marine Lord 2-1. Um, he has been pretty consistent throughout. I actually think like, you know, they they were closely matched. It was him, Wham, and uh Marine Lord towards the end of the group. You didn't know who was gonna get it. And that mattered a lot, folks, because you're wondering, like, where's M Lord? Oh my god, is he already out? No, don't worry. He's waiting. He's anticipating. He's already qualified through to the final weekend. The way that the group format worked is the top of the group out of 10 players went straight through into the semifinals. Second place in the groups went into the quarterfinals 
And then finally, the remaining players had to duke it out yesterday. Uh, that was where we saw Vortex versus Lucifron. Lucifron opening that series strong, showing us why Zhuzhi is actually better on her than the Chinese, and then showing us every way to lose after that. Um, it was quite a quick series, but I agree. On the other side of it, B versus Louis. I think that result is, is what maybe a lot of people came to expect after the group stage. B has been struggling. Uh, he's a player that actually admitted himself that, you know, when you look back at you know, uh, when he started streaming again about a month or two ago, he played a few games and he said, I don't think this meta is going to be my meta. And I think that's kind of held true. Um, in fact, I think we can even have a look at the standings here uh, to see how they have been performing. Because it was interesting to watch that series. Like, there were moments where B kind of looked like he actually might have a leg to stand on. I think overall, draft wise, I favored Louis' approach. I mean, let's be real. Letting someone have Ottomans and the best Jean Dart picker having Jean, probably not the best way to draft out of B. Yeah, yeah, B also, yeah, like you said, letting Ottomans through, he did that in the groups as well, and I feel like it's it's suspect to me a bit, right? Ottomans have just proven to be so dominant. They hit this timing, you know, from like 15 to 20 something minutes where like what are you supposed to do <laughs> like like ottomans are just so dominant at that tier at that period of time and it's on most of the maps here that the elite classic has right the elite classic is largely land maps right it's like most of the maps focus on the land and that's where that ottoman timing just like feels so powerful and dominant and here we yeah. see the standings for group b yeah, BC and Wham, of course, just fighting over that top spot, right? Uh, towards the end, BC, just a few more wins, getting that edge over. Uh, B, though, really the, the big story coming out of the group stage was how the 3D clan series made it or broke it, right? Like, the remaining opponents seemed a little bit easier to deal with. Of course, that series was completely wild between Anisand and B. Um, kind of funny, actually. I think that was the one most convincing time in the entire tournament where I felt like B's anarchy, the chaos that he brings to a draft, actually bore fruit. That's not anything against him. I just think a lot of these players have kind of figured out a very optimal route uh, to the remaining sieves. But in that series, we had all kinds of wacky stuff. I believe he had a Frisian Marshes game where he picked the Abbasids and decided to build docks on the little ponds, which is just something that nobody ever does on that map. Um, but you know what? We don't need to talk about me. He's gone at this stage. You know, the, the person to really kind of highlight is Louis versus Wham. Louis yeah. versus Wham, the, if I remember correctly, in the group stage, um, they were on opposite sides, right? So they wouldn't have contested at all. You did, however, have Poppy Paul and Louis in the same group. And although they are not the same person, they do have a, a similar approach to their metas, right? Courtesy of the fact that they would have been scrimming together. Same reason why we say if you figured out how to deal with Vortex, you probably have a good idea of how to deal with Lucifer. Yeah, I mean... Not really sure. I feel like still at the same time, both of these players have their own distinct styles as well. Um, you know, Wham practicing a lot with Puppy back in the day, and I think still today they do practice quite a lot. So I think both of them have some of their own some of their own ideas. Um, and yeah, honestly, the way that Louis's been playing feels really, really, really clean. I think that's how I would describe the games that I've seen of him re recently. It's just like there's this. I don't describe it, but like, especially when you see the Jean d'Arc games, I think you mentioned this earlier, right? Like when you see how he's playing with like these very intelligent and like well-crafted strategies that just work. And it's like all the ideas feel so obvious and clear cut and he's just executing them very well. That to me is the markings of a top, 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 top tier player, right? And I think, I think if he's able to kind of like get through this and like show that again and again and again, I think we're looking at potentially even a top three player. Um, in Louis right now, the way that he was playing last week and yesterday just showcased that to me a lot. Um, just the quality of that, like the, every decision point, like when he attacked, when he retreated, how he attacked, how he retreated, like how we transitioned into new units. All these things just kind of merged together into that that feel that honestly you don't really get outside of Beastie and Marine Lord usually. Yeah. Um, but seeing that in Louis it gives me a lot of hope <laughs> that maybe we have another top three contender here, um, which could be really exciting. And Wham, Wham's been playing his his ass off honestly recently. I think I'm really excited to see how he handles this. Um, I think Louis could be very challenging for him, but I think he certainly has what it takes. We saw that in the group stage; he just dominated. So I. I'm really excited to see how this match goes. I feel like it's going to be fireworks uh, starting off with Rocky Canyon in the draft. Interesting. Yeah. I, and this is the interesting thing, actually, is I think like to your whole point of Wham and Louis and the, how they've been playing, 
First 20 minutes is going to be make or break. I think that is where Wham has been looking most threatening in this tournament. He has had a very clean group stage off of his clean execution of his build audits. It's been almost impossible to get him off of his clean timings, in fact, for practically all the people in the running. On the other side of it, Louis, he has a little bit more of a shaky ground occasionally. He has some very creative and innovative drafts that usually help him in that early phase. Where Louis thrives, though, is in the late game. This guy is a beast. Even Beastie himself has mentioned that, right? Like, you know, if there's a player that he doesn't want it to run into 50 minutes into a game, this is the guy. And I've watched some scrims together. I've seen exactly why he feels that way. With picks like Jean d'Arc, which I think work a lot better in the late game than French, he shows it every day of the week. But we might even get, be getting to see that here. Because opening-wise, bans applied are going to be the recent ultimate. It's just a reminder, the way this UI works is if you see a Civ ban next to a player's side, it means they cannot pick it. Their opponent has applied it to them. Opening-wise, Louis is going to go for a very strong one here. Um, Iobids has, has kind of just been a really strong go-to at the moment. I think some players have looked non-unstoppable, but wham, yoinks away. What I would argue is Louis' second best Civ. Yeah, getting Jean. I think that's going to be really clutch here. Um, yeah, the human pick as well, it feels like it sort of solved a lot of these like castle age timing sieves by just dominating right away. Right. I think the strat has been military wing into just like two production buildings and just going all out aggro with that. And it seems like that timing is really scary. And then they can very quickly age up after that if they need to flex out of it. So it seems like a very like safe pick against some of these sieves that are maybe a bit slower. Um, probably don't want that against Jean, but We'll see what else Wham picks, and that might be a solid pick for Louis later. It's Yeah, it's, so the, the way it works, you have a very important choice to make straight out of the gate, right? Eco wing with the free villagers, or you go for the military wing. It's pretty much that every single game, unless you're playing a water map, in which case advance and wing is kind of a no-brainer. And the reason is that right now, white eco wing is just as good as the desert raider. The desert raider allows you to block a greedy play and force a reaction. Now, we, as you said, have some builds where you prolong feudal, you engage, but a lot of the builds actually using military wing are just meant to involve the other player, right? Like, imagine you're up against China and they want to build a good loose 2C. They're not getting that second TC away from base, right? Or you're up against the HRE and they want to go fast castle. Too bad, bud. You're going to have to add in an outpost because I'm about to hit you with a Desert Raider. And that's all for free and instantaneous. The alternative is if you realize your opponent's actually going to try to aggro you, but the Desert Raider doesn't have a good matchup, Growth Wing is a no-brainer every day of the week uh, because the point in the game where you get it, it's a 15% increase in your economy. It's insanely powerful when you think about it that way, right? Like, it's stronger than a Mansa Quarry when you think about it that way. And, you know, speaking of Mansa Quarries, we are seeing Marlins, funnily enough, as a following phase pick priority for Louis. This surprises me considering that so far, Marlins actually haven't been looking as crazy OP as most people would believe, right? Like, going into this, this playoffs, I think... When you collate all the results so far in this tournament, they are at like a 42, 43% win rate. But a lot of those have been against Delhi. Um, and when he, he banned Delhi beforehand, and then he picked Malians. I think that's where Malians were really struggling. We're on like Arabia, for example. We've seen both of the Civs picked, and that's where Delhi just dominates. It seems like in, I think it was like, two games yesterday it happened that matchup and in both games it wasn't on arabia both times so i think it was arabia in the second set and coastal clubs in the first potential I, if my memory serves me right that was the matchup for ottoman molly or sorry delhi Malian. and i think i might be wrong about that anyway but yeah Mal banning banning delhi i think and then picking Malians, i think was really smart there from louis i think getting rid of potentially one of the harder counters just because of the timing it's just the timing of it like delhi just has way too much stuff too early for Malians, and then Malians' timing just gets delayed, and then they get like that second pit mine just pressured and then knocked out, and then they're just sitting there, and then suddenly Delhi's like Castle Age with like 15 Ghazi Raiders, and they're getting relics, and it's just like, what do you do? Um, and uh, that's why we saw the Delhi ban then applied the other way, right? Where like, okay, yeah, exactly. I see what you're up to. Wham says, I'm not letting you have that for free. Um, it has an interesting knock on effect. Both having Delhi banned out, you'd think Japan wouldn't be that high of a priority. I really like this from Wham. I actually think the Japanese. Uh, Delhi matchup can go either way. It requires a very specific style, though, that I've only seen Delhi wise Dumu able to execute. What you get instead by having the Japanese, though, although you don't counter a Delhi pick, you do counter a lot of what Louis has gone in for here. I really do like the Japanese up against the Ibids. I think that is a skill based matchup where you can actually beat them with Onomusha comp with Kaburiya as a priority. And then also the rest of this draft for Louis is oh. a little bit rough there. Like French and Order the Dragon, 
not great against Japan. It's kind of interesting, actually, that we're seeing all the Dragon drafted here. Louis is one of only two players to have a win with that Civ in this entire tournament. Yeah, so I think it's probably best for him that he has it. <laughs> I mean, better for him than Wham would have it, right? He'd probably not feel very comfortable with that if he hasn't been playing it. Um, we've seen the Order of the Dragon on, what is it, Mongolian Heights, right? There's that, the barracks play. We saw that twice, yeah. I think, so far. Yeah, we I saw think, it in the, times. I think we saw it in a B Beastie series, right? Where it completely flopped because he'd done it against the Mongols, which is like one of the civs that you can struggle to do that against. And yesterday, um, Lucifer on Vortex, same thing. It was yeah. against Mongols and the Mongols just dominated. So when I'm having Mongols for Mongolian Heights, which is very fitting, by the way, <laughs> I think that's funny uh, thematically, oh. but yeah. We don't um, have Mongolian Heights, actually. We, have we don't have it in this draft, right? We no, have Golden Heights. Okay, okay. The interesting part to me is that Cliffside is not hit in this, despite the fact that Louis' later part of the draft makes a lot of sense for Cliffside. Like, you I, take it? Um, it it's Coastal probably Cliff? Golden Heights. I think, like, Golden Heights could make a lot of sense, or it could be that comfy pick. Um, you mentioned Coastal Cliffs, right? Because we saw that Numidon Louis game where he got the win. That, On Coastal way, Cliffs, right? Yeah. Yeah, but that, I'm going to be totally real with you. What happened in that game will not happen here. Like, if, if that plays out the same way, Louis. Looked really cool winning that game. We were talking before we came on screen because we saw it in the replays. Numidon's approach that game, he had so many openings that he just kind of shied away from, right? He told. Right. Wham doesn't have that same kind of <laughs> yeah. approach, right? Doesn't he doesn't hesitate. Problem. No, yeah. so it's going to be interesting. Opening game, okay, dude, this is a great way for Louis to start. Yeah. Ibids versus Mongols. I'm a little bit surprised Wham came out swinging with this. I thought he might try to save it for some like Golden Heights, but admittedly he's got HRE there. Then again, like what you're doing with Frisian. This matchup, Winston, heavily favors the Ibids. It's insanely powerful. Your only play is typically to go in for a very, very aggressive outpost rush that starves the gold out. If you miss that timing, though, very difficult. And here's the thing that makes it difficult. If it's not a fourth spawn in gold, it's going to be a Desert Raider coming out from Louis, and the timing on that Desert Raider releasing is often quicker than your villager can build the outpost. And it completely shuts the play out. From there, it turns into a fast castle build, where what are you going to build to deal with these Lancers? Keshik's not a great choice, right? And the biggest advantage you have as the Mongols on Rocky Canyon is trading. You can't trade if the map is being flooded with Camel Lancers. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I'm, I'm curious to see this play out. I, it makes a lot of sense, all the things you said, but it still comes down to the execution, right? Like, there's kind of an if there. Like, if you get the tower up on the gold, right? If, yeah. you, have, if you have a good map here... Um, for Mongols, where, you know, maybe Louis Gold is forward, it, it could be a lot easier, and then suddenly it's just up, right? Um, and then the whole game state, like, all those statements are just delayed for Ubid. so I think it is definitely going to come down to maybe some of that early aggression, if that's what we see from Wham. I think you kind of have to expect it. That's what Mongols have been doing in the meta very consistently. Uh, there hasn't really been a lot of deviation from that, so I'd be curious to see if there's anything up Wham's sleeve here. Or if it's going to be kind of as you predicted here. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because, like, looking outside that element of the draft, I still feel like Wham got a bare chunk of it, right? Like, the issue I do see with Louis' draft is that whenever I see the Marlins coming out, I know it's going to be a follow-up English pick. Like, you're basically picking Marlins to protect the English pick, but, like, I have yet to be convinced, right? English are by far the worst performing Civ with about a, I think it's a 28% win rate. And they've had 25 games in the tournament so far. They're looking abysmal. And like the best map for them, which is Cliffside, isn't even in rotation here uh, from the map pool selection. So curious to see what Louis really has in mind with that pick in particular. But agreed, like this, this opening Golden has already Heights, thrown. Right? It has to be, right? But like it's like if it's it's for like maybe a backup pick on Golden Heights if you feel like you're gonna get like hard countered with another pick, maybe. He doesn't yeah. really have many great Golden Heights saves. Like you're saying Order of the Dragon, maybe, right? But like you don't want to pick Malians there, you don't want to go Biz there, you don't want to go French there, um, and you don't want to use Malians there, right? So it's we like I feel like Malians, English right? for Golden Heights, right? Like like we used to see the Malians pick with the transport ship play, but then people realized like it's really cheesy, and you end up just sacrificing a lot of villages to do that play. Yeah. But maybe uh, he's getting creative with that kind of element. Maybe he's trying to make a return to it. Um, I, like I do that love. Just <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's, it's gonna lose like yeah it's like i don't like it but i'm wondering if he's, he's got some sort of permutation we haven't seen i was just about to say though i love the fact like you're not just seeing the delhi priority you're seeing the chinese priority on each side that makes a lot of sense uh wham and poppy paul have been the two most impressive people in the chinese i've seen in this tournament so far closely followed by louis louis even able to overcome some what i consider hard hurdles such as coastal cliffs with byzantine um chinese matchup which i will always favor byzantines louis i think the only player who was able to get the turnaround win there 
So like, you know, it's it's interesting because China would have been great for Golden Heights. Uh, let's say Mongols got saved there as well. That matchup used to favor Mongols. It doesn't quite work that way anymore. China now with the supervision spam can actually beat Mongols in a prolonged um, spam and spam. Yeah, with the adaptation to the build. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure. I think we've seen that for sure. Um, but Mongols are already being used here. We'll see. I heard a sound. We're getting close. We're, we're, we're prepping. getting close. We're a minute out. It's um, I know. It's interesting to think because like I'm looking at the rest of this draft. Jean versus France could end up happening. Like I, I most people want to say that's Jean favored. It's there are ways French can participate. It's just they're predictable, right? Like that's the reality of those two sieves. The way they clash is like if you're playing French, you're not out aggroing a Jean, are you? You're just trying to play greedy instead. So I imagine he's going to try to to pivot to dodge that. Um, yep. I'm thinking like things that could deal with Jean quite well here. Order of the Dragon is a double-edged sword. I don't like it as a pick because anytime you make a mistake, it's doubly punished, right? So we might be looking at Byzantines. That would be like Louis' best opportunity. If he can like suss out where Jean's coming out and get Byzantines, because most of his other civs struggle. I think Marlins has kind of been a bit wonky recently. And I can guarantee you, despite what happened historically, mm. the English Jean experience actually is one where she won. Um... I'm not sure. Like I, Biz against John. I, I don't like Biz <laughs> against John. I don't. I don't think it works very well. Okay, I feel okay. like pick something else. Like the all bad I, options. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Like, I don't. I don't love the drafts against John. Right. I feel like that's that's really interesting when you have Ottoman and Rus banned right away. I feel like John becomes a top tier pick. Right. Yep. So I I don't know how much I like Biz there, but. I mean, I guess if you have to, right? You're right, like, pick something else, right? Louis has no choice. But we'll see that when we get there. As instead, we are off with Wham and Louis. Mongols of Ubid. Rocky Canyon. That's right. First game in a possible seven-game series here. Whoever wins here will go through the semifinals to face off against Marine Lord, who I imagine is waiting with anticipation, dissecting every bit of this. Ibid's Mongols and Rocky Canyon, though. Both sides have some perks. We mentioned already the Ibid interaction going fast castle against Mongol trade is nice. And this is a map where Mongols typically want to trade. Now, there has been an adaptation I saw towards the end of the group stage. I think most notably Zertan done this, where instead of going for the trade that is expected from the Mongols, you actually go for a Deerstone play. And it gives you a little bit more of an aggressive ramping and a more optimized all-in timing. But step one to do that is good gold spawns. And I've got to say, I think Louis uh, got good gold spawns for him. He has one either side of his base yes the second one's a bit further away but even the primary is kind of masked around the back side here so it might be difficult for wham to get the outpost up aggressively enough yeah because you're gonna have to walk like between that force and the tc to get there quickly and otherwise you're gonna have to walk all the way around and that feels like it's just too far away from the other gold and I, like the way that we, the way that we've seen players adapt to playing against mongols it, it's been in, like people have been doing this since the game came out basically you just go to gold really really early right and you just try and get your gold before they can even get there right um and with that in mind i don't know if wham's gonna even get a lot done with the start like you're saying like if he goes millwing if he goes villagers i think obviously there's potentially a lot of opportunity still but oh. I think if he goes I don't think for the eco wing, like yeah. someone's dropped a brick on his head. It's... Yeah, like no one does that, right? It's like you just go mill, you have the the camel, and you just live, right? Like, mm -hmm. and and that's the thing. Like timing is everything. Like I've seen this before, where you'll be five seconds out for finishing the outpost, and you just get shot down by that desert raider. It's really difficult. So villager pull on the way, two spin following up. He hasn't scouted this. This is bad news because it's likely he's going to wrap wide around the north side of the tree line. Might end up that he's just a little bit too delayed with this play. Uh, Louis, meanwhile, has already triggered the tech up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the, the yeah reinforcements coming in. So the first Desert Raider is just going to be there really early. Um, so we'll see if there's any sort of follow up or like a delay on an important tech. Like sometimes being able to deny wheelbarrow can feel good or like a couple of units that cost some gold. Maybe an eco tech or two could get delayed by this. But otherwise, I feel like Louis just gonna get what he needs. Yeah, so the bill's sneaking around here. Wait, it, uh, that's just auto pathing, right? It looks like he actually might sneak by. It looks like the outpost should go up in time here, as long as he starts it straight away. He has got the wood for this, so Wham will be able to deny this gold out. But the other one, 
it's a little bit far out, but it's not insanely out of left field, right? And something we have been seeing from either players right now, the optimal build, in fact, it's the one that Marine Lord has been running, the guy who is unbeaten with seven wins on that Civ, is to actually, no matter the matchup, just play a little bit of feudal timing, just get a few units out, like two or three horsemen, a few archers, and then go for a tech up on a delay. Yeah, the stable, the range, and then you also have the reinforcements supporting you. You just feel really, really solid, right? Um, uh, because you just have that extra military to like buffer it, and then you don't have to invest as much. Whereas you have the mobility of those free cav units without having to like invest so much of your food, which just feels so good, right? It just feels so, so good. It's the uh, the golden age spike as well, right? Because like if you delay your castle age timing, you're gonna unlock GA2, which gives you the 50% increased research speed. It's a really big deal if you're scaling to archers already, because it just means you get that upgrade 20 seconds sooner. Which might not sound like a lot, but when you think your opponent's now trying to rush to punish you, 20 seconds is the difference between making or breaking a fight. And we're gonna see Wim trying to trade his way to keep like to keep safe here, but this is gonna be really hard to defend against because there's mobility on the field already, right? Well, that's, that's, that's funny spawning. Immediately able to shoot. That was cute. Yeah, I like that, that positioning <laughs> from Wham. Well, he just it's, rallied it to that side, right? That was yeah, cute. That, that's a, like this is kind of the, the insane thing when you think about it. It's actually someone that like gets slept on with a bastards even with military wing there, right? Is you can choose which side these units, these powerful units that instantly spawn are going to come out of. So it gives you positioning advantage when your opponent's trying to dive you, if they're trying to shift sides. And, you know, this is not a lot of damage straight away, right? But what he's doing is he's denying this mining camp being taken out, being set of blaze. Curiously enough, Louis at this pace shouldn't be able to stop this from going on fire, right? I think it's going to go on fire yeah. to the tower, right? Unless he gets repaired, right? Uh, it's about but to. Like, but like, you're not going to pull a villager if you don't have wheelbarrow here, right? Okay, he is on the way. There we go. He I'm tried one earlier. I think he could say, yeah. I think it's really important for Louis to spot the, like, screw this mining camp. Who cares, right? I think the biggest, imp most important thing is to make sure he spots the silver tree. Um, I think he has scouted uh, uh, it. Lu Lu uh, Louis, <laughs> buddy. Well, I think Wham's going to take that. I don't even know if Wham saw that, to be honest. But I mean, we'll it's, see. It's, it's not 50 resources for you, but it's definitely 50 resources and more gone for your opponent. That's a rough start, especially for a guy who's no doubt not going advanced, uh, going for a growth wing here, right? Like when you see people eating the berries like this, it's meant to be an advanced wing play. And we are going to get that initial aggression we talked about. Archers coming out, horsemen coming out as well. Wham, so far, only has the spears. Yeah, the Khan honestly doing work over there on the berries. The tower going up on the gold to defend it. And that first Desert Raider is now making its way over to the trade. Has to get in the range of that. Oh, he's tower getting the knight could be huge. Wow, okay, yeah, too no, late. Okay, that's too late now. Louis, if he just done this straight, surely not. What? Well, <laughs> okay, I'll boost this bill. up. He does get the veal, so it's definitely worthwhile. If he just got melee straight away, though, that tower never even goes up. And at that stage, like, you're just stripping Wham of any sort of detection and also any amplification to his trade speed here. Still, yeah, that's gonna hang around pay... with Big Bird. <laughs> Payback for uh, Louisville <laughs> that, that uh, was in range of the tower that he didn't notice. Balance and all things. You know what the crazy part is? Is actually Louis, this comp is perfectly countering what Wham's doing. So he gets a little bit of a window yeah. here to poke, but sadly, not quick enough on the torch through, right? So has to back away. And this is usually where you're going to see the Ibe player just kind of slow down a bit, like not escalate more military, because something quite awkward what? has happened here for Wham. You say that. Oh, wait, is he There's a ram. ram. <laughs> no, that's, that's, a at ram. Home. that's at home. That's at home. Yeah, yeah. That's just to home. deal with this. Yeah. Yeah, because like he's secured the gold in the outskirt, but that's not long term, right? That's one outpost, so you, you're limited. You want your primary gold so you can go up to 10 villages eventually. But like the, the issue of Wham's comp now, that's really good out of Louis is that Wham has no cavalry and he's gone for trade, right? Like Keshix is your premium yeah. unit. He's now going back for it now, but he got delayed off his timing. And it means that Louis with what is basically a two thirds cav army can now just play white flanks to shut the trade. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really important. And we'll see if Louis is able to spot it. I mean, there is no trade yet, right? I think Wham is playing really patiently. He doesn't want to invest in trade that's just going to get raided so obviously he's seen that same issue that you have where it's like okay i can't actually protect my trade right now against these units that louis has so he's not going to waste his time investing in it but that does mean he is delaying that investment right so it's like his whole his whole landmark the point of it is you get trade up right and that landmark hasn't given him any value whereas there's lots of units tangible on the field because of the uh, reinforcement wing already and the spearman gonna pop out gonna get an opportunity to wail away at this ramp 
Archers are coming across to try and force them back inside the outpost here. So it looks like he got the value he was looking for here, right? Like, yes, the ram is pretty much dead, but what other use do you really have for this ram, right? Like, you're not going to attack the enemy base, even if you were some Mongol player that could pack up. But I think it's going to gonna roll across and go deal with another outpost. <laughs> I mean, why not, right? What's, what use Dude. is it doing at home? It's really going to defend you well against archers, right? No. But uh, it's more the case of, like, even though he's repairing it, it's kind of not necessary for the next eight minutes of gameplay. <laughs> <Yeah. You> know, <laughs> just watch it roll up his sleeve and go across the map. It's like, I'm going to kill every Mongol building after that statement. Oh. <laughs> after that statement. It's personally <laughs> offended by you, KP. What, what have you done? How dare I oh. say that it's a worthless tool now? It's like, I, are you kidding? I'm going to lead this army from the front. Um, Louis, in the meantime is looking to block out the trade. So this is exactly the problem we were talking about with Wham's comp, is that he doesn't have that mobility. This is also another kind of awkward thing when you choose Silver Tree, right? Is you don't have Yam now on all that infantry mass until mm -hmm. your Castle Age. And you remember to click the tech. <laughs> you have to stuff. remember to get it. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll see. This is, this is interesting. I mean, Wham's being really patient here at this stage, right? He, he's saying he's basically banking on the fact that his aggression did enough i'm not sure it did in this case i'm a little scared for wham that the timing here from louis on castle age could be really really good what's uh, scaring me more is the fact that louis unlike a lot of iber players we see at this point in the game hasn't lost the desert raiders <laughs> he's up to four at this rate by the time he goes castle he'll have six right and that's when it's worth upgrading and you don't see it much but when you do get those desert raiders up into veterancy they pack quite the punch the range damage increase the melee attack absolutely bonkers what you can do to trade lines. So that has me a little bit worried. Wham right now is coming to the outpost area. That's going to be double outpost with Arislet, so difficult to dive this area of the map. And now his rotation is difficult because of that wall that Louis is setting up between the two tree lines. Yeah, that's really tricky. Uh, most of the army for Louis was out of position, but yeah, walking right into the defended spot from Louis, it, it's just too much, right? The Ville is all just garrisoning. That's nine garrison arrows. That's going to be enough. Now the army from Louis, kind of on the backside here, but I don't know if it's in much danger. It's quite mobile here. And you have you, the camels. You can't contest that. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> this is what sucks, is you need so many Keshiks to take that fight because you're up against the Lancers in particular. Uh, the Desiree's Ram in particular. So, like, this issue right now, I mean, he can't trade. Like, if you check the south side neutral trade, Louis is a step ahead of Wham. He's guarding both of these sites, so there's realistically no eco-inflation for Wham in this game. Oh, first trader's out. Or is Rogers. that the first trader? I think it is. I think he produced one a little bit earlier. Nice little chip there. Mm. Does get an eco kill. Louis is pretty much ready to go. And this is interesting, actually. He doesn't feel rushed. We aren't getting advanced from wing. I guess we're looking at logistics or growth. Oh. Like, growth is kind of intriguing considering how much food he's already taken from near his base. Yeah. And there growth. it is. Growth. Yeah, not even needing the discount, right, uh, to get there quickly. He's feeling confident and... Wham's not up yet. Wham's not even close to clicking up, right? So Wham's going to be stuck in feudal for a long time dealing with this upgrade that is surely going to come in quite quickly, right? Um, yeah. Louis has plenty of income. Well, I mean, the, the, the crazy now. thing to think about here is like the reason why you can go growth wing so confidently is there's no rush because there's trade escalating, right? Like you haven't been blocked on your counterplay. You've guarded against Wham's eco escalation. So although it seems kind of greedy, it's like, okay, if Louis doesn't need more eco, why do it? Because it's it's kind of a free play here. Like, Wham hasn't got an army that's going to break in your base. And if you just keep spamming archers, he never will. Because Wham would need to afford Keshix as well to get a dive that hits. The Ram. <laughs> the Ram is just <laughs> chilling. He's like, job's he's done. A, whoa, he, he's a war hero, dude. <laughs> you know, he's got all the peg legs in this situation. Like, I remember the time I took, I took on the Mongol army, pushed them back. <laughs> Yeah, I got stabbed how many times? Still living, still walking, still thriving. Uh, that's funny. A way of now making his own ram, so looking to push this tower complex on the gold mine, but it feels like it might be a little bit too late as the age up is surely going to come in quite soon. And you can oh, forfeit it, right? Like, if, if he attacks the outpost, whoop de doo dah they you think go to the other mind. gold, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and on top of that, can we check the golden age? Because we must be getting close to level two at this stage. Like, we're deep enough in the game here. Yeah, he's five away, make it four, right? Like, it's very easy now to spam down a few racks. It's actually, it's about to be three away. So it's probably going to be a Ghulam transition. I think that works really well against what Wham is doing. And you need yeah. three racks for that anyway. So you're going to get the veterancy on your archers 20, uh, 20 seconds sooner. You're also going to get the upgrades on things like Undermesh 20 seconds sooner. 
it's going to make it very difficult for Wham to find a window of opportunity here. Yeah, Wham, even, not even ahead on the, uh, the Blacksmith upgrades at this stage, right? Like, he, he's all in here, and I think he's going to be a bit surprised by the size of Louis' army here, right? He's not going to be happy about this. You know, he's going to get some resources if he's just allowed to burn this, but I don't know if he wants to waste his time burning. I think he needs to run deep for Vil kills, right? Like you said, look at the eco. Yeah, 51 at, Vils at, on the field for Louis. Look at how far you'd have to rotate, though. This is the bigger problem, right? It's just such a wide wrap, and you know you're going to be cut off the moment you go around the back. Love the walls coming up from Louis to make sure there's no 360 rotation anymore. Meantime, traders are still just kind of getting blocked out by the reigning horsemen. But even if they do start trading now, like, it's not... It's not impressive, right? It's like three or four traders maximum in this game. In fact, he even loses one to just the horseman. And time's running out, my friend. We are now 10 seconds away from that veterancy. Once that comes in, this entire army is dead. The ram, the grizzled vet goes, hey, I'll show you guys how to deal with spearmen. I learned this in my youth ages ago, he says, as now the... I mean, vet <laughs> upgrades come in. And, it actually oh did matter. It did matter because yeah, it stopped it the cashings charge again. Yeah, it did. <laughs> It blocked this gap. Well, Rams on the other side. I, I guess the, the congregating at this stage. <laughs> like, who's the bigger <laughs> war veteran? I mean, it's pretty clear here, though. These Rams, not going to last yeah. too long. Desert Rays are going to move in. And the first Camel Lance is out. So this dive coming in. Wham, he needed a good hit. He's just been hit. You could argue there was a good hit in this fight, but not the way it needed to be. GG wow. instantly comes out. Louis, surgical in his execution. Not only winning the Ibids, but also now stripping away powerful mongols from wham's arsenal yeah that was really really hard to deal with i think um i think the way that he ended up playing that louis louis build everything just kind of made sense and i think you were super right about it like the timing just did not work for mongols there like the the desert raider came out and they just defended and the tower creep never happened it was just this one outpost denying one of the golds and we just saw louis say okay you're there i'm gonna go over here You've delayed your agent for it. I don't know how you play this matchup if for if you're Mongols, right? Like you, you at can't. this stage, <laughs> it's, you legit it, can't. It, it feels like you'd have to do something so radical, like that doesn't make sense, right? It feels like you'd have to yeah. not make the spearman and just try and like age up without it. But like that's giving up so much of what Mongols are good at and so much of how the Mongols are played. So yeah, really tricky there. Um, not really sure what Wham could have done better. Uh, pick a different set. Is uh, where I'm gonna go there. It, it's, yeah, it's like, almost an impossible matchup. Like I, I you know, to, to put it another way, I obviously do a lot, like a lot of content midweek on my own channel, right? And uh, Phyllis Bodo, who everyone knows, is, like the most prolific Mongols family in the game right now, pops by. And every time I'm like doing one of those casts, he's like, I don't know how to win this matchup. So the guy who plays more Mongols than literally anyone else on the ladder right now has no clue how to win with them. It kind of says something, and it's something I've been seeing on repeat. The issue is the Ayurved's opening plays all just work so well against the Mongols' options. The only thing I think could even look remotely good is to go Deerstone and then play a compact economy as the Mongols and try to come out when you're ready. Because like the issue is anytime you choose Silver Tree, straight away you've already said to your opponent, I'm playing a wide map. But the issue you saw in that game is because Wham wasn't able to open with Keshiks, he was already a mile behind. Louis was great to identify that. And we are indeed going to be getting Order of the Dented on Golden Heights. <laughs> yeah, Order versus HRE. So we got the German matchup, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What are you predicting here? Lots of Spearmen? <laughs> so this is, this is where it gets weird, right? Because actually... Or do you just land, ignore it? On, well, on land, this matchup heavily favors Order of the Dragon. It's like insanely biased towards them, like 65, 70%. We don't see a much on water though. Um, I think the spearman can be very strong, but the issue I've been seeing with people trying this order the dragon build, like we saw in Mongolian Heights, you just get outnumbered, right? So what I'm curious about is if Wham has some timing in mind with spear spam that involves, say, a second racks, that would be where I'd give him the edge. That's, that's his limitation, right? HRE, very good at gathering resources, very bad at escalating production early on. So that's the thing I'm being looking for here. Um, I'm not expecting Eva to necessarily go straight for the dock. I'm curious, though, whether we're going to get some sort of proxy racks plays. Yeah, that's, that's I guess, the biggest question. It's, it's going to be, if players are investing in these Spearman Dark Age, which it feels like if your opponent does, you kind of have to. Otherwise, you're seeding water for free, basically, and then you lose map pressure. So it sort of feels like, are players going to be building these proxy barracks, like kind of in the stealth forest? We've seen them be just right next to the dock. We've seen them be at home. We've seen them be in the middle of the map. Um, we've seen sort of all sorts of permutations of it. 
And I think a lot of the strategies don't really take into account exactly where it's placed, but in the end, what really matters is where the barrack is placed. So it feels like it should be on these players, like the forefront of their mind is where's my barracks going to go here? Um, and will the timings actually work for me compared to where the, bar the my opponent builds the barracks, right? Because there's there's all sorts of advantages there, like the walk time to do it. That's more idle vill time. That's a delay on the first spearman, right? Like a lot, a lot of little nuances here um, that I think are going to matter. Um, and I think that's probably going to be a lot of this game. I'd be surprised if we hit like a mid game where both players are on even footing. I think very likely we're just going to have a very one sided, like dark early feudal situation, right? So it's interesting because when you dissect it, what you realize is actually initially at the very beginning of that feudal age, based on, say, proxy raxes from each side and the gathering rates, HRE has a slight edge. But as you go deeper into Dark Age, they lose that edge, right? Because the longer you're in Dark Age, the worse that one prelate becomes, right? Your 40% buff at the start on your whole economy goes down to 35, then 30, then 25. Then all of a sudden, right. the base rate inc increase the order of the dragon at 28% is just better. So like, this is something that, that Wan needs to figure out. It's like, how long can I afford to hang around? I can't give him fishing for free. Surely that would like be wild. Unless right. Wan gets some sort of you know, two-third cheap split, in which case maybe he has a Burgrave rush in mind. Because one thing I've noted on this, the reason why Order the Dragon is so favored is I'd say the meta revolves quite heavily around Feudal and Early Castle right now. That's where Order the Dragon peaks. The worst it gets it, it, for them is when you're an imp plus on both sides. They're all about momentum between Feudal and Castle. And it makes a lot of sense when you think about it, right? Like Golden Cuirass men at arms are bonkers strong for the um, Order the Dragon. On the flip side, you don't get a counter to that until you're in Castle Age and ramped up to like 15 to 20 minute arms, right? So I think what would be interesting to me is if Wham's got some sort of fast castle build in mind where he just completely ignores water. Yeah, that could be a really interesting adaptation, but I feel like giving away water, I mean, at some point you have to deal with it, right? Like, I feel like letting your opponent have five or six fishing ships for 10 minutes while UFC feels really bad it's not um right. <laughs> yeah i mean the good i mean it's kind of different on golden heights especially this version of golden heights right now the the those three deep fish are really far away like they're really really far from the dock so they're not like as efficient as we used to think maybe because it's so far but i mean if it's uncontested you're not even investing into it basically it's just it's just going to pay off for sure right so I you guess we'll just see how these players view it. And wow, immediately we see a barracks. So <laughs> here we go. Game number yep. two Wham versus Louis, old versus new. And we are going to get that racks on one side. Now, the, the question mark, Louis, he's the one we anticipated going for it. Here's an interesting thought. Why hasn't he dropped a racks yet? I don't know. Uh, maybe <laughs> Doc first going, proxy? He's legit going straight for it. I, this has to be proxy racks, right? There's no way you drop a dock straight away. That would be wild. Well, I mean, the Mongolian Heights build is you build the dock first, yes. right? And then you're gathering shorefish. Maybe he's just going to do that build. But that build hasn't been very good, but only against Mongols. So maybe it works against HRE here is his idea. M my thing is, I don't know how uh, much you practice this build order, right? Like I think against this in this matchup, like how often have you played this? Like I've never, have you no, played okay. this matchup on this map? I, this I, I, on. I have not seen it this played once between people in practice but like so, so hear me out the dock first build i actually hate a mongolian heights i think it's bad there i think it's i think bad. so too <laughs> i think it's bad but that's what people are doing right like but, I'm, I'm not the pro player right like i'm not the one like developing the strats right so clearly they see merit to it right i, I think they've just been lying to each other like you remember how vortex <laughs> said like vortex on his tier list and he put order the dragon as nest tier sieve and hasn't picked it once in this tournament just saying you know like <laughs> i wouldn't trust them all the time <laughs> The, I think the reason it works better here, though, is like on Mongolian Heights, you're walking towards each other. So like the racks on a delay feels really weird. But doing it this way, where you racks afterwards, would work what? a lot better, right? Where is he just, going? There's no is way he going to build it far away? Like, I mean, is he going to no wall way... it in? No, he's going to wall it into the corner, maybe? Yeah, like, but, but I was about to say, there's no way you just go fast feudal here, right? That wouldn't work. That would be too slow. But this well, is... she would have walked home if she wanted this to This is really home. slow. This is crazy. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, he's going to have reinforcement speed, but like Wham is already there. The, the only benefit that Louis can get here is that Wham doesn't see Spearman. 
so Wham stops producing his own, right? That's mm -hmm. that's the, the goal here. And then you surprise him as the dock is going down. You surprise him with like two or three o OTD um, spears. Surely Wham like just doesn't stop pumping though, right? Like his mindset's got to be, I, I need a lot of spears here because there could be a delayed play, right? Ah. Uh... Dude, you say you that, but he has food and wood. This is the plan. If you get three Order of the Dragon Spears right now, quickly out, you can defend this. But the Vill is walking home, which means all Wham needs to do is get the dock burning. I kind of don't agree with sending the Vill home here. I feel like uh, maybe he's just giving it up. But why is he turning Spearman? Oh, I'm confused. <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> This so, meta has lost me. Okay, but hear me out, hear me out, right? Like, if, if you make it the other way, where you don't, like, have this racks on delay, you just have the dock, and your opponent does this play, right? He still has his dock afterwards, but by doing it this way around, you can still contest him, beat his spears with your spears, because yours just are better, and then you take a dock away. So it's like, yes, you're losing 150 wood, but so is the HRE player. And if you remember what my statement was before, the longer Dark Age goes on, the worse it is the HRE. We're already at a stage where he's not buffing his entire economy, right? Half his eco isn't buffed with 40%. So at this point, his economy is already worse than Louis. Is uh, he looking... Okay, thank God. I thought he was going to try to go Feudal Age first and then upgrade. That would have been a mistake, but... It's it's definitely I'm... a peculiar peculiar build. Like, I'm, I'm, I know you've got big reservations because of it, but, like, once he has free Spearman here, you if you look... Fight. Yeah, Wham doesn't yeah. even have all his spears here. He split them up a bit. No, my only thing would have been, I probably would have been greedy. I would try to go now, right? I would go right now, now that the dock <laughs> is burning. Yeah. And then I would have the Vill to repair. But he's going to go at four spearmen. Mm -hmm. What overkill? What? But he guarantees the dock kill, right? And then Wham... Yes, like the... yeah, he just guarantees the win, right? And, and it's, it's kind of the escalating water. the pain, right? Because like you're watching Wham actively invest at that point he's adding in these ships he's like oh life is good and then there's no value there but can we check has wham actually added a single fishing boat yet dude are you no. kidding me they both faked each other <laughs> and here <laughs> comes to see it now but like you just walk away yeah like wait yeah but you're still gonna lose the dock right like, there's, there's no way you get an archer ship out before that dock goes down we won't talk about that guy he was he was he was drunk Our, on the yeah there's no way you get one out, but another dock could go up and Wham just has to, because the Vill is still here. Like, that's what I mean. Like, if Louie just had his Vill here and he could have repaired his dock right now, and then he could have maybe, I don't know. I don't want to judge it too much. I feel like Louie's cooking. Yeah. He's cooking something real spicy here, and I'm liking it. I'm just, I'm learning. This is me actively learning. <laughs> okay, like, what is this? He's building the extra dock. He's building the extra he's dock. He's found it. Yep. He, so he's found the rack, but... Look what's happening up here. Walls are going up, and this is an yeah. issue. Louis did not send an extra spearman up to check this. So although he's burning a dock away, you may notice a big difference between these two players. One already has a little progress bar towards age two. The other's just like, oh no, what have I done with these spears? And then that chapel's just going to amplify it. You were talking early early on about how, you know, by, the, by a certain point, the prelate kind of scales out of the economy. Well, look at, I mean, the chapel's going up, and suddenly all of Wham's villas are going to be inspired again, right? And... <laughs> Suddenly, his economy is going to be much better, um, I feel like, than Louis. That villager right there, I, I tell you what, he could run marathons. He's coming back oh. across to try and get another dock up. Spim stabs. Does protect the racks here. So I, I don't know if Wham will be able to torch this, but he's got what he wanted, right? And yeah, Louis just discovered the wall is up. This game just got very difficult. He needs to rush that dock up, and he needs to be super quick about it, considering he's about 20 seconds away from an archer ship blitzing his face off. Yeah, and then the water's gone, right? I mean, we'll see. It looks like it looks like Louis actually wants to send the Ville back forward and build another dock. Yeah, yeah. Like, he's been walking There's for a while, yeah, but there he's is. hesitating because the spears. I think you legit just have to go. You've got extra health on that on that uh, villager. Ville, it should yeah. be hard for him to die. The problem now is you wait so long, the Feudal Age came through, right? Like, Wham actually has better spim in here. I think the best thing you do here is just dive in and kill that Villy. If, if Louis lets you, that's nice <laughs> positioning from Louis. Going to be blocking to protect that Vill. That's really clean. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He's he scout's getting in the way as well. It's too late. Louis, he's going to get that dock up. No uh, way can you stab this quick enough, surely. Village up. Low on HP, but not low enough. Job done. Wow. That was huge for Louis. Okay. 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 I like it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. This is interesting. And here's the thing, right? Like, wham, open with the archer ship. So Louis is like, okay. <laughs> he gets 40 food. 
a bit oh, more food in the bank. He's got also another kind of interesting thing here is like right now, Wham is escalating uh, his archship count, right? That's not great if, let's say, Louis decides the undermesh is worth it quite quickly. He's going for a second dock, though. This is interesting because Louis can now shift those spearmen and attack you on land. Cool. And the double galley going to get countered by the single hulk here. Interesting. Where's the gold, by the It's on the backside. Okay, but here's a problem right now. Yeah, he needs to get archers out ASAP. He knows those spearmen have to be doing something else now, right? They're not burning the wall. So he needs to rush out a few archers. Two or three archers he needs isn't a lot. Be enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he needs a lot of archers here. He needs like six or seven. Uh, and it's going to take some time. But oh, I don't know wait. how many windows... Oh, the wood line is just open here. Wait. Yeah, re remember that little short cliff side that was nice for Wham getting early sheep? <laughs> now it's bad for this. Naval engagement, though. There's a demo for Wham. The galley getting focused down. The demo could move in soon. Nice like bait and switch here. Wham is playing this super clean. What? Wait. Uh, is he? Louis getting away with repairs here. The village is repairing. Oh He's not even being attacked right now. Demo's going to come out. It's going to be a push in here. Doesn't oh, get the hit. Get the whiffs. Wait, that's actually huge. That oh villager. My. Dude, that villager just saved the day. I can't believe that. That's he crazy. had no ship in range. And the only time he got hit is when the random shots attacked it, right? Like, remember, wow. that villager already lost 20 health to the spearman. He lost, like, what? An extra eight health in that engagement. Wow. That was really, really good for Louis. Like, that was really, really, really good. Uh, this this is looking rough now for Wham. He's got archers being chased by the spearmen. Um, the man in arms just getting <laughs> absolutely wrecked there. And yeah, between the fishing ship healing there, the dock repair and the vill, mm -hmm. he was able to sustain there. And I don't think Wham fully respected how much healing was coming in on that ship. And uh, this is where we reach that ugly phase of the game, right? It's like now if the water is kind of decided, like let's say like neither player gets the fish, it just keeps going back and forth there. You're still at a base instinct down to your standard land game between these two sieves, right? Like the extra resources going towards that aggression. Order the dragon are favored there. With this build, with the mine work, and men at arm spam. If they get into Golden Karas, get five or six of these bad boys going in, what does Wham have to deal with that? Like even five, six minutes from now, he won't have much. Yeah. Yeah, this... This feels like Order the Dragon is going to be in a very good position very soon. Um, I, I think demo? it just depends on the... Oof. Just shy. Wow, now he's efficient here, though. Wow. Uh, okay, I mean... Yeah. The galleys are quite pricey, but like getting two demos in return isn't too bad here. It looks like Wham should be able to break this now unless he gets caught off guard by a demo coming out. So it's all a matter of timing. Oh, wow, <laughs> you say here. that. <laughs> As you say that, a demo pops out for Louis, but Wham is paying attention here. So they will just back off. And this is going to be a bit of a stalemate for a while. Both players just on one dock, right? Actually, did did Wham add another dock for production? He did. He added it a it Looks ago. like he did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, so I'm he should be able sure to out that's compete, been scoured, right? Yeah, like, I don't think that's even been scoured. Demo is going to be a whiff. I, I think, like, Louis, he hasn't really made a convincing move on Lana at all, right? Like, it looks like his goal here was to get Castle Age in a really cheeky fashion. But that's going to cost him water, right? Like, this should just be him wiped out now. It should. This dock is going to be sticky to take care of. And there's a demo. Oh, Wait, there's a demo wham? in the queue. There's a demo in wham? the queue. What? Okay. That okay. should have been worse. There wasn't a manual detonation straight away. That could have been two springles. But that... wham. <laughs> my, heart, to my, heart. my heart can't handle that. Oh my gosh. My, you should have seen me. I was just like, <sighs> yeah, that was panic in my voice. Uh, that, that demo being in the queue. You never want to go that close to a dock. Like ever. Mm. You just have to respect the demos, especially with hulks. Like, whew. but way I'm able to get out of it with only one loss there. Um, okay. All right. It looks like Louis done per, uh, building on the water now. And, and Wham knows it. So that, it. that villager dying there was moving to wall off on the relics because he now knows what mm -hmm. this is going to be. This mm -hmm. is like one of the annoying points in the game for Order of the Dragon is because they suck at relic races because unlike the HRE, they can't prep prelates before they age up. But with the way this game is played out, like Wham hasn't had that classic uh, like classic prelate prep, right? Like he's just been stuck pushing everything in water. Instead, Louis, um... these five spearmen that won him the early game, aggression, have persisted for the last several minutes. Wow. I mean, he could break in. He could have broken in here, but he chose to just hit the wall that was already up. This, that could have been really bad for Wham. I mean, Wham has like no military, so 
he's going to be relying on the TC to defend that whole chapel, and he just has to ha hope these walls hold. Oh, the boar, though. The vills on the boar are completely exposed. He Not a ton know. of military to kill anything, but he could force him back. He, he Meanwhile, the Akin chapel. Like, he, these issues, he doesn't know. The scout's dead. Like, Wan doesn't actually have any vision. If you check on the map, he's running pretty blind in here. Regnitz is on the way, but he's looking mm -hmm. at all the wrong places right now. And well, Regnitz is going to follow up on a delay from Wan. Golden Kuras is also being prepped. So, Louis, quite interesting, considering he's only got one minute at arms out. And I'm kind of curious if you really want to play mass men at arms into, like, a prolonged castle, especially if your opponent's HRE with fishing. Yeah. It's tricky. Yeah, because HRE with fishing now. The, the Regnets, able to get away with the Regnets here, too. Um, that's interesting, because, yeah, w Wim's going to have Prelates pre-positioned. So as soon as he's up, he's going to get three Relics here, right? That um, is the He's aim. sending them now. Uh, it doesn't look like he's done that. Oh, yeah, he's got one on the left. He's yeah. going to get the one on the right. Um, it's... It Still could actually fun enough be a free split for Louis because this prelot on the yeah. other side should not be able to get back. Like Louis would have to completely miss and whiff here. It's funny because it seems like he didn't notice the prelot went out ahead of time, right? Like he's attacking yeah. the wall instead of walking over. And there it is. Wait, wait, Louis, Louis, no, not like this. Well, he still can get three. The one in the middle of the map. Well, didn't he wall that one in? In the middle? No, 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 no. no. It's not walled in. I think but, he like, wanted to, but. The, no, he was trying to... So there was a wall in attempt by Wham on the left side one, but no real attempt by Louis. It's going to be a 3-2 yeah. split for Wham. Yeah, we'll <laughs> oh, see this. Dude. Yeah, that's really good. He might be able to intercept with a knight, but it's kind of a punt, right? Like, realistically, he's the only one with a scout, so you can kind of sniff things out, but it's still a lot of ground to cover for just one guy. Oh, we got a foot race. I mean, Wham's going to win it by a lot, but it's still a foot race. It's always so funny. Could, could you imagine being, like, the pro on the other side, like, running this marathon? Did you, this like, guy? see him? Did you see <laughs> him? It's like, it's like the equivalent of you running the marathon, the other guy just took a taxi. He's like, God damn it. <laughs> oh, he's just going to put it in the dock. That's well smart. Played. You don't have to take it all the way home. Mm -hmm. I mean, still gives the, the, the ships are going to protect the dock, right? That's really smart. Holy, that is high IQ. I'm sure players are doing that, but I, I never think of things like this. Wait, there's no way. There's, uh, you shouldn't get that one. It looks like there's a product coming out from red. So Louis will get the other one on the left side. No, wait. it's a spin. Oh my god. Please do not lose the one closest to your base. And that, <laughs> that, I mean, that one's that. basically free still. Wait, can the, is the product's running in. You say it's free. It should be. There's no there's way. A knight. Yeah, there's yeah. a knight. There's a knight in crossbows. It's there's too also much. another prelate coming out. This oh, one concerns me though. Like I can't. That's believe. a big boy knight. That is a big boy knight though. He's gonna like two shot this prelate. Free and shot. goodbye. Oh. <laughs> well, Lord's gonna come out no, the base. No, Louis. But, uh, hold. Okay. 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 We're good. We're good. We're good. That was almost scary. <laughs> almost scary. A little stretch there, Louis was, but he noticed. He noticed. He's way too solid to like let that happen. Oh man. It's still like so. This game's kind of weird in that you'd be like, okay, GG. You know, Wham got three relics. He's got fishing, but I don't think it's necessarily over just yet. Like he doesn't have a counter, a solid counter yet, to these Gilded Knights. We're already up to four of them. Wham has basically got the same number, and he's meant to produce a lot quicker. This dive feels questionable from Louis. He's going to be losing a lot of pretty expensive units if this fight continues. Uh, what else do you do? Like, you, you know if this game now drags out, it is going to be mean, an HRE win. You have to try and do damage. Was that damage? I mean, like, damage, damage to yourself. Yeah, to himself. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I mean, it's okay. Like, it, you, need to, you need to trade, right? I guess that's the idea. But that's a lot of knights with vet spears in the back, too. They're taking this a lot is... of damage, though. He's going to have to retreat from this. I mean, the crossbows are actually, like, doing decent on the backside, but he didn't abandon them. Like, that's kind of surprising, right? Like, well, like he just leaves the them now. almost dead. Yeah. He's going to try to raid down. He's going to block out the prelate on the sacred site. New knight is going to come out. Louis, the problem right oh, here is, nice. you know, he hasn't got, like, great gold income. Admittedly, he's holding on to 1,000, but realistically, in the grand scheme of things, like, it's not a lot of passive income, right? And that's problematic because the way that he's losing prelates and then the fact he doesn't have as much gold to replace them, it means it's very difficult to just make these knights go the distance, right? Like kind of a, an Abbey of Memes effect where you drag them home and heal them. Instead, when I see Lou with this much gold, I'm starting to wonder, is, th is there kind of like a little tick in his brain saying, go Imperial Age? For Louis? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, on Order of the Dragon, it, it, it feels like this stage of the game, like you're saying, like 
there's just a timer before your units just it feels like they don't work like late castle age doesn't feel like a good time for order of the dragon personally i always like to just go to him pretty quickly here he could actually afford it if he had a market but it looks like he's just gonna wait for the food naturally right yeah, because um, like the, the thing about to your point around why Castle Age feels weird is like this opening feels bad because Gilded Knights, like you have to raid so efficiently with them to feel like it's worth the investment consistently, right? Especially when you start to reveal it, your opponent's going to be building a counter. Knights on the other side, just much cheaper, it means you typically have more of them, and that means you can spread out across more ground to punish. Love this from Louis though. The double outposts, this is what makes the Order of the Dragon more of an aggressive sieve, is the way they aggressively farm the map. They're able to be more efficient with their garrison spots compared to their cousin Civ. Yeah, it's it's really healthy for Louis to have those outposts up and around and able to just make use of the map food. And yeah, like Wham isn't able to go to the middle deer himself, right? Like he just can't. Uh, the one night on it would just be devastating. He also has kind of delayed his crossbow production. Interestingly, uh, he prioritized a big spearman mass, which I think I like. But at the same time, having like 10 crossbows here would just shut down i feel like the play for louis really really nicely so if he can get up to that number i think things will look really good for him it's uh attack and defend logic right he wants the spears to hold his base his knights to raid he, if he uh. goes crossbows he doesn't have that charge coming in for the guild of knights though outpost not up wham quick to pull away but these guys just hit so hard and where are the spears i feel like most of them ran out to the mid map Ooh. Wham, no. Wham just getting... Oh, actually, a smart surround here, maybe. Gets one knight. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a fair trade, though. I mean, it's double the price for those knights, right? The Spearman now in defense. These knights, though, are tanky boys. They don't really care. Denying the food is really good here, but Louis just going to go up to Castle with the Swabia. Or, sorry, in with the Swabia, right? And he's pretty much ready to pull the trigger. He's got a lot of gold in reserve as well, so good look towards some upgrades. Even adding Lance I really like this. You're up against Spears and a few crossbows. Lance Necks are ridiculously tanky in that situation. We also have to remember that in the recent past, the Elspark? dragons... I, this, dude, like, no. No, okay, okay. I was <laughs> get, like, why is he get, stalking get, get food? Get out like, of my why? <laughs> Dude, I, I thought... Well, it'd be so ballsy. Imagine just putting it forward right now on, like, the sacred site. Oh, but you I mean, guess like, you just this can. game's over, you just pull the villagers, you build an, an elves back in their base, you're like... Yeah, like, you it? just... I thought... I mean, he was <laughs> stocking the food. That's a lot of fishies for Wham. He's got to be feeling good about that. Now, and yes, this... I did just call them fishies. Deal little with it. Little fishy wishies? He did get well, the upgrade, too. We saw that earlier, yeah. Uh, so pretty well, efficient here. Well, he gets fishies. Louis looking to get his wishies here. He's up in Imperial Age. He has got a thousand stones. So this isn't just a greedy now I dive and get kill play. He has got the ability to get a keep dropped. In fact, can we check where, where it is? I think it? it's to the right side of the regnants here by the looks of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's just a smart spot. Just hold that front. Um, it does leave the resources on the right pretty exposed. A lot of access to gold is about to be cut off when the gold in his base runs out. There's one on the south, right? Um, mm -hmm. But we'll see. The keep will go up just fine. Yeah, it and kind we're of gonna start like the keep placements. doesn't really secure anything, right? Like it, it, it protects no, you against it the does. rush play, but it doesn't. It really holds the any middle, resources. and then your army is free to play the right more. So it like indirectly secures, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. That like typically when you get a keep like this, you want it to secure a new resource as well, right? Because you mentioned the gold. The gold is gonna be running out quickly. You're now playing order the dragon and building land snack with two relics. You're going to need a lot of gold very soon. And although you say you can protect the right side against this army, right now he doesn't have the solution. So there is going to be a little bit of idle time. And what worries me is whether Louis can actually get enough Lance Neck together to take back the gold veins. Yeah, this is interesting. The ram now from Wim, I find spicy as heck. Is he going to ram down that keep? He's, his units are getting hit by the spray of the <laughs> Just okay, cancels think... it. He's like, no, this ram is dumb. I know, I know. He's, he says, walking away, shaking his head. No, this was a bad idea. You know, are going like, to need, I think, I think bigger was, uh... siege than that. I don't think rams work at this stage. Was that maybe oh one of the situations where he prepped it before the tech up came out? He's like, well, I bought it. I might as well use it, right? <laughs> it's like just one of those situations because mm -hmm. looks like he's backed away entirely. Wham is going to be following the shadow of Louis up into Imperial Age. Not a bad timing. Um, and this is where the game gets kind of dicey. It's like, you know, Order of the Dragon are very favored in this matchup in the early game, even in the mid game. But when you get into the Imperial Plus stage, that's where the HRE has quite a bite to it. And what matters then, if Order of the Dragon want to win in Plus, they basically need like three quarters of the gold on the map. Because if you I can't was... scale hand cannoneers, you're in trouble. 
Yeah, but how is Louis consistently getting away with this? Like, he always has Vils on the map, and yet he's only lost one. Like, how are these Barry Vils not dead? Like, wham, build a scout, please. Like, like he just walked by another group of Vils, and I feel like it would just be game-ending earlier. Maybe now that the Swabby is up, it's less so, but like... Knights? Yeah, the Wait. Knight's gonna get a lot of value here. Did he complete the wall? Because that might be a quick torch roof. Okay, it's half HP. Which is a few. There's here. enough. There's enough defenders here. I don't think that the run through would be. Well, it'd be annoying <laughs> if the knights can get a lot of damage in. They're gonna take. They're too so long. tanky. They're not tanky enough. Spears should be able to clear them up because they are actually just not attacking back. Another interesting thing on the south side. Oh, uh, fight Wham, on the south. Wham's built rams, right? <laughs> he's built rams down here. Ooh. Okay. So he's not giving up the gold. Louis. Oh, this fight is... Uh, yeah, but watch this. Lance neck. Here come the big boys. Uh, for a swing. <laughs> this is scary. This is Watchmen. very scary. Oh, no, these lance necks are going to eat. Oh, no, oh. no, 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 no. <laughs> Run. Run. <laughs> oh, they're all dead. They're all dead. They can't even oh, kill the gosh. horsemen. They're so bloody tanky. Come on. Oh. And that's... That's good eating. That's mm. some good grub right there for those Lanch Neck. They are well fed now. Wham's whole engagement force killed, and I don't know if he got any kills in return, really. There, you know, like, like there's when... a few horsemen on the field, right? Yeah, you know, that like when you crazy. get one of those those big German sausages and you like slice it down, and the cut's so clean. That's Lanch Neck in that very moment, all right? They, so sharp, man. Like, just click on them, see the stats on these units. They're kind of insane. They recently got a small buff. They got 10 HP increase mm -hmm. overall. Uh, so like, it doesn't scale even higher on imp, but it's still 10. Uh, HP more. Not a bad increase, right? It means you can survive an extra few spear stabs. And they mm -hmm. slice through so quickly. The only thing I'd say that Louis is missing here, no inspired warrior tech. I've noticed that he tends to neglect this tech, whereas most of the most successful dragon players are actually optimizing with that in their build. 15% is a lot on these units, considering how high their base damage is. It is. It is a lot. Um, they can be countered with enough ranged mass. But when building hand cannons here, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I, I don't know what else he's supposed to do, I guess. I think you have to. I mean, against the full melee comp, Ribalds. Yeah. Honestly, Ribalds, a few could uh, be good. But eh, maybe not against uh, the slice of the Lanch Neck. Yeah, I don't know. This is build, tricky yeah. if you're Wham. It's like, do you want to build Ribaldoquins when, like, you're up against a Culverin Civ, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, or just even Springles in general. It, it does feel a little bit weird. I love that you're thinking outside the box, but, you know, that's one of those things where it kind of feels like it's so expensive to put you in the box, whereas hand cannoneers are also more mobile. And you have to remember, like, one of HRE's advantages here in the late game is going to be mobility. Their infantry are faster. The other thing that is a disadvantage for the dragons is mobility, because they have less troops to mobilize across the map. It means if you turn this into kind of like a spread wide type game, that's where we've seen all of the dragon losing a lot, because they just don't have the raw military count to mirror those moves. Yeah. I would actually love to see Wham go to the shorefish. I've been watching his his fishing ships. They are just so inefficient right now on the deep fish. Also, I, I think he's going to have to go to the shorefish soon. Like, wait, can we, also, Winston, can, can Aether even build robots? No. <laughs> wait, I, uh, you know, I, I don't, don't talk to me. <laughs> I'm not real. I'm not real. I'm not a human. <laughs> It's okay, guys. Um, Winston not a real AI, person. You, you know how this is. They, they, they're real. learning. We'll get them there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not real. Don't ask me. Blessing. Don't ask me questions. So, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Volker. Don't Volk, ask me. I, I'm, we're moving on. <laughs> we're moving on. Chat, you can roast me. I, I permit the roasting. That was dumb. That was dumb. Um, just you move know what on. It was. Everybody you, you, should just you, move no, on. No, no, no. You know what it is. Winston, you're used to seeing these HRE cannon placements kill armies so quick. You're like, wow, no, better than Rebolta. That wasn't even it. That wasn't even it. <laughs> I I didn't think that was the problem. The thing is, I, never mind. A lot of my games against the Civ were with Jean. Never mind. Moving on. Just move on. Everybody. Okay. Move so faster, let, let's move know? on to about the fact that like, Louis, not too bad on the economy level. You have to remember he's 28% more efficient with everything. Wham's not going to be matching that, but this is where the relics really start to make the difference. Like, this is where you have to fight tooth and nail to access gold. One thing that's rough for me right now is Wham's having all his attention drawn to the left side, while Louis is now secured a much later phase of the game with this 8k gold in the center. It means that although Wham is first in the hand cannon is, it doesn't mean that Louis can't follow. In fact, it's kind of curious. I'm wondering what Louis is planning here. So far, he's massing spears. I've got a weird feeling we're looking at like a siege spearman push, almost like a, a weird premium Chinese build. 
Yeah. I guess. I mean, Wham's really recovered his pop nicely here. This fight might be kind of tricky for Louis. Like, the land stick mass is just gone. There's only three left. What? Can we take on his farms? Because I'm also getting worried about his food state. This is. That's fine. <laughs> I, I, oh, no, like, it's not enough. It's not enough. It's kind of yeah. depressing when you realize that he's got all three eco techs, and that's that's his food income right there. Like, <laughs> the numbers don't really yeah. support this. Mango is going to be defended. Um, un unfortunately, Ooh. everyone had to die to do it. Big shots, though. Mm. Not really. Big enough. Uh, no. Not big enough. Not big enough. And this wall is just going to get torched down with only a little bit of HP in it. Wait, or, or or it could go up. That's also an option here, Winston. Apparently, Wham. Um, I don't I don't think you can see him. <laughs> uh, he's just going to ram it down. The rams have been working. This is a wild play. I love it. Okay, hear me out. Like, playing Siege actually makes a lot of sense on this map because of how short the route is to your opponent's base. So, like, I actually don't mind the idea Lou's coming up with. And it also fixes the other problem, which is he has terrible food income. So, like, if you're playing Siege in QE mode, you don't really need much food, right? You just need, like, a, a cheap front line. Wow, that outpost <laughs> just got <laughs> torched. I mean, like, talk about sending a message. When you have that many bills on it, that is a big deal. That is a big deal. That's what a message. Some of these walls. <laughs> I'm loving it. Uh, it's like I think something it's really cool. Seeing, right? Because like, I think uh... he needs to buy time so he can actually make units, right? Yes. I, I think he doesn't know what to build, which is a lot of my issue when I play Order of the Dragon. I never know what to make. Like, look at his production queue. He's got one bombarded queue. He's got some res. He's just generically doing some upgrades at the moment. What what unit does he train here? Like, what works? I think it's really tricky to figure that out. You know, you would have thought after that Numidon series where he played Order of the Dragon, he would know all the answers by now, considering he was like the nutty professor in that game. I think he built every single unit at least twice in different comps. I think um, he's just going to play Siege. Like, he's I just mean, queuing up... Sure. Well, Mangano, Siege Spear, just try and That's hold with the do. AoE damage and hope it works. So so this this is like extra level of, of value on the walls, right? It's like the walls, Mangano's can shoot over them. Colruns get blocked by walls. So if you choose your location right, like we've already seen recently how Screamers get countered by Mangos. Same thing can happen here. Maybe. If he uses the wall. <laughs> yeah, may ma maybe. <laughs> it's not guaranteed here. The Culverins are very good against them. Although Louis is just now finishing Siege Works, so I think it's no longer one shot from the Culves, right? No. Um, so it's it should be pretty healthy now for Louis, but it's still tricky to take this fight. This is an expensive dive by Wham. Like, <laughs> he's, he's choosing no, the, the hardest way to try and do this, right? Like, this is a cannon line. He's got double outpost with cannons, he's got keep as well. I don't think there was like a worse direction you could have chose to go here. I get what Wham's trying to aim for, but it does mean Louis is more easily getting that gold on the right side to stay on this game. He is trebbing at the same time and ramming, so Wham's plan here, I think, is just to push through and use his eco advantage. Meanwhile, some of these keeps going to get the pressure on both sides of the map. I mean, Louis can't be feeling too comfortable at this stage, right? He's just trying to get Siege out. This is tricky. Realized how confusing Don't let this happen again. Wait, no. This can't happen again. He can't Luke? keep getting away with this. Louis, defend your siege. No, Louis, L please. Louis, Louis. But he has please. siege works, Winston. It's fine. It's just, it, just shoot it. Just, just shoot. And these are swabby avils. It's like 12 food. It, it, look, Wham doesn't care about these avils. Has he deleted many of the fishing boats for pop space? He should have, right? Yeah, most mm, of yeah, them. Yeah, you should get he rid deleted, of most of it, right? There were yeah. like... 20 in there so yeah he definitely deleted a bunch farms are definitely better at the stage um what's impressive is actually louis after all those food conundrums it turns out you know you go for several years without food you learn how to appreciate food, it more because he's got better food income now at the stage so mm -hmm. not too bad but that's gonna be temporary right like hre arkham will usually win out mm -hmm. um the difference here is it looks like wham forgot about his food techs yeah it's it's nice when you have all the upgrades on Order of the Dragon, but it feels like it's going to fall a little short here unless he figures something out with his army comp, right? I think I think that's what's the most alarming to me here, is that it doesn't seem like he still knows what to train. Now he's popped on 10 archers and 17 spears. That should actually deal pretty well with the hand cannons. They shoot really, really fast, so if he does get that fair fight he's looking for, it should be okay, but... I think by the time he takes that fight, he's going to lose most wait, of his defensive wait, buildings, right? Wait, why is he getting vodka arrows? The bolts. 
Because he wants to then make crossbows. Uh, uh, to are you sure we're just not lost in translation? He's like, oh yeah, bodkin arrows, arrows, like gilded archers. I, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to check the localization. He might be thinking, too. yeah, he might be thinking that works on the arrow, the archers, but I'd be really surprised. That's a, like, it, I mean, he's attacking the siege with archers right now. So like, <laughs> I would Yeah, maybe he thinks, I mean, but we'll see. Maybe he'll queue up some crossbows. That's um, the buff we need on the dragon. Let's just let archers get the plus. It could be that it's just one of the last few upgrades at the mine work as well. Well, actually, no, he's still got a whole bunch of upgrades left. Huh. Yeah, he's well, he, he could consider melee techs, which might not be a bad idea for guys spamming spears. So, Archer Mask will do well. Um, not, nice thing up against the hand cannon is you can get the extra scale armor, right? So, plus three ranged mm -hmm. armor means you're actually quite tanky. He's gonna stand his ground here. So Mangoes are just gonna run away. Culver and Count favoring Wham at the stage. And you know what would be really nice at this point in the game that would help a lot, Winston? Bodkin arrows. Those would be great right about now. But you'd need. Oh, I get it. I get it. I get it. Yeah. The relic gonna get heisted away. This is very relevant, actually. That relic being taken to safety is a big deal. Um, because <laughs> there's a prelate right there for Wham. He wanted that. That's a big swing in these HRE mirrors. It also just means more keeps with added range, especially with those bombard emplacements. It, it just matters quite a lot. So good for Louis that he's able to recover that. His That's resource okay. float is looking really healthy. It it's is. Some... But, I think he's found the comp. I think it's but, Spear Archer. But Winston, there is an element of gold in here, and we have to be conscious of the fact, like gold-wise, the thing that Wham is at least doing on the side, he's munching those 8Ks close to yeah. Louis' base. So that is going to be a problem if this game drags out too long. So better that Louis now, having found the solution, finds a way of breaking fast. And unfortunately, Wham says, if you're going to find a solution, I'm going to change the script. We're switching now into men at arms that handle these Gilded Archers a lot better. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, th they also just might be too weak to all the defenses here. We'll see. There's also a lot of Mangonels still. So, like, a couple good hits there could be really bad. But we'll see. I think I think Wim should be okay with this tech switch. It should at least be a decent surprise. On paper, it works really well against Spear Archer. So, we'll see. But there's Lanchnex getting added in by Louis, oh. and that's going to not feel good. Not feel good at all. No, and this is, by the way, like he's been defending like this without the army tactics. That's now coming. So these spearmen, this front line just got a lot more tanky. And now there's Lanchnex mixed into there. So if they start getting good hits, actually, they're oh, yeah. not there yet, I think. No, they are, right? I think he's got one. It's hard to there. spot yeah, them. You, you can see the golden poker. Yeah. Mm, I think there was maybe one, but he died. It looks like it's just spearmen now. So he's going to chase the goblins away. Gilded Archers are the, the true victors in this fight, slowly but surely just whittling down those men arms. and. Now Wham says, oh wait, Elite Army Tactics is a thing in this game. So still a minute out for him, which is just kind of rough considering you went for a men at arm spam before it was the most efficient play. Yeah, but at the same time, Wham's economy is set up to spam men at arms infinitely, right? Like, this isn't going to be something that comes at the cost of his gameplay later, right? It's not like it's a huge siege switch or it's not like all of his hand cannons died like they just did, um, which is actually like <laughs> That's meaningful the gold bosses, right? Yep. Some men at arms dying before. Also, we have all the upgrades by, by the way, I, I just realized yeah. someone we Marching never checked. Drills. Yeah, because we just assumed, right? <laughs> it's like they're doing all this running. I'm sure they have it already. Apparently, uh -huh. Wham is only now getting marching drills after building, I want to say, over, like, it's like, like 150 plus units that would have benefited from this. Mm -hmm. Zornhau coming in as well for Louis because he does have that mine work, so. Oh my god. Um, It's also worse because. Like, now that I'm looking at his text, notice that Wham is fully neglecting melee. Doesn't yeah. even have the, the melee defense, melee attack. Like, all these things would be really nice, especially considering, like, the melee mosh pit is now becoming more and more important. And Louis, it's a complete switch up here. Horseman oh, getting added this in. This fight could be what? so good. <laughs> that fight could have been so good for Louis if that was open right now and he just went in. I actually He's really been... like Louis' switch here, by the way. Like, the spearmen are tanky, but nowhere near as comparative as the horsemen, right? So, like, this is now just about creating a damage soaker for your Zornhau lance neck to clear up. Uh oh. I smell a lot of dead man at arms on the horizon. Like, That's a fine. lot that, of dead that, man at arms. It's just Ram. Ram's got all oh, those guys. Yeah, those guys are a oh. problem. Oh, wait, wait. No, he's just attacking the Rams! <laughs> oh, no. Using oh, the Rams as bait? Away. Wait, wait, but hear me out, Winston. This is the master strategy. It's the it's the uh, Zornhau clown car. You just put your lance neck inside, and then when they come to melee it, you jump out. Instead, he's going to run in under the keep. 
Surprisingly enough, even with all those guys dying, he actually got quite a good few swipes in there. Mido won that strategy against me so many times, I got really mad. It's oh, Nornhell Clown the, Car. The land, it's really good. Car, yeah. yeah, it's really, it's it's surprisingly good. In this matchup, especially, right? It's like, oh no, you yeah, sent in yeah, 50 yeah. men at arms. Surprise! Well, it, it helps solve the problem that the the Zorn, the the Lance Neck have, right? Which is like ranged fire can just kill them before they deal damage, right? The Rams don't have as much of an issue with that, right? You know what it um, is? It's it's the Order of the Dragon's very own shield wall. Because you move slower, right? But you take no range damage. There you go. I think Louis needs to think about trade soon, potentially. He has access to the left trade. I think he needs to wall that soon. Otherwise, I think the way that the compositions are produced and the cost, he's going to be forced into, like, Horseman Archer very soon. Like, I think it was wise for him to already invest in those. But, yeah, this... Hmm. Wow. Gonna lose two of the coverings here. And the interesting thing is I'm wondering, like, Louis, is he trying to find a way to get back towards Mangoes? Like, this horseman just hopes firing on the back line. It kind of feels like that's the way he's leaning. It's a decent solution against these hand cannoneers as well. And to be fair, I, I did Gilded Archers at the end of this are the thing that always walks away. I'm not gonna say that's an outright positive considering that's food and wood, but it does mean it's like at least one less thing to worry about replacing in that. Well, that, that's 20 Gilded Crossbowmen, which are absolutely an answer to these Man-at-Arms. They, like, four-shot them. I think it's, like, really, really, really fast that they die. Um, and Wham's army is kaput. Where is it? It's it's on uh, it's on hold. He's yeah, training back Spearmen to fight the Archer Crossbow. <laughs> like, it's not, not a bueno situation for Wham at this stage. He's going to have to find a solution. This choke oh. point has mattered a lot. But in the meantime, Louis has also been doing raids with yep. the... Uh, the elite horseman. Not just that. Check the gold just south of this. Right? He can go back to land next. It. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's got an 8k here. He's munching down on. If you're going to go mass spearman now is the golden solution. Louis only needs like four lance neck to kill you off. Like this is actually very scary. Keep is going to go down. That's going to open a floodgate. It's going to be another 8k gold access. And behind this, sure, he's got a few TCs to get the repairs over. There's not much of a strong standard defense investment, right? Like, wham. All these cannon placements, all these keeps have been in the center of the map. What happens when you lose this area? I feel like in the first day of this tournament in the group stage, we saw Louis play this sim against Nimadon, and he looked kind of lost as to how to handle it and what his like late game plan is. I feel like this game is the total opposite of that. I feel like a lot of his transitions have just made sense with the pace of the game. And it feels like he's really sorted it out, maybe, yep. in this period of time. In these last few weeks, it feels like he's really come together with a strat here for how to actually play this late game. He has a really solid match, a really solid composition at this stage. And it's not using the Gilded Knight <laughs> late game, right? <laughs> it's not over-investing in the hand cannons, right? It's, it's range units. It's making it's... use of these cheaper units. Yeah. And I think it just makes sense. I legit think it's all about ranged units. It's someone, like I said when this game came out, I was like, I actually think Gilded Arch is like the secret OP unit in the comp. Guild of Crossbowmen, I got convinced when I saw what Dumu was doing against like Jean Dark pickers of that unit. You're yeah. seeing it here. Like it, it's such a weird taboo feeling when you're an HRE spammer and you try to play Dragon. You're like, yeah, melee units are great. No, 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 no. Despite what we've seen from the Lance deck, the true MVPs have been the back line of Louis comp. And now is in a very strong position. He only just got military academy. He's been pushing this back without production advantage. Imagine what he can do with the extra spam. Yeah, it's really crazy. A lot of it comes down to, I guess, how the, the the Order of the Dragon units, like, function. Like, having extra HP on a melee unit doesn't always matter as much when in Age of Empires 4, oftentimes overkill is just a fact of the game. Like, when you have a massive hand cannons, they deal, like, a thousand damage to a knight, right? It's like, it just dies, right? Yeah. And that's just the same for the Gilded Knight or or the original knight or the OG knights, right? Like, it's just, it's just the same thing, right? Whereas here with the range team, it's getting more DPS actually matters. So yeah, I think you're onto something here. I think, well, I think Louis is onto something here realistically, right? You have ways whenever no, your no, opponent I'll, I'll has big credit. masses. <laughs> yeah, take credit. Whenever your opponent has big masses, you have Manganels and Lanchneck to deal with it. And then whenever it's these most more smaller, like strung up fights, your ranged mass is just so solid and so hard to deal with in low numbers for the opponent. It just really seems to come together. And it looks like Louis found that combination this game. And I'm struggling to see what Wham could even do with his units or composition or strategy that would fix it. This is like, Louis just has the answer here. 
Well, um, this is the thing with the ranged backline as well. Like, once it became about hand cannons, like, for ages he was trying to counter it with Siege. But just think about the ranges on these units, right? Like, both Gilded Archers and Gilded Crossbowmen outrange hand cannons. Sure, you can gap close quickly on them, but as you mentioned, a lot more tanky. That's another interesting thing about Dragon in the late game. No other Civ can inflate the health pool of their ranged units well. Like, you can argue Atabegs, but dude, please, when is anyone building those, right? Everything else gets inflated. Biology gives you extra health. Elite Army Tactics gives you extra health. But for the all the Dragon, your backline is already so insanely tanky. So, like, just cheaply sniping it out isn't really a great option. Like, typically, when you see someone do what Louis done, given Wham's siege position here, the play would have been four Mangonels, GG, right? But... It takes so long to smush a single one of these targets, even with Siege. Yeah, oh, I feel like the only way Wham can really win this is by starving Louis out of gold, right? Like, I think, I think once the gold runs out, I think the, I think Wham will have a better game, right? I think he'll just have more options once gold is fully out. But uh -huh. we're still a ways away from that, and oh, <laughs> uh, just where are you guys like going? there. <laughs> Uh, uh oh, Wait, what? Oh, what? oh, oh. Wolves. <laughs> oh, they all live. He's trying to quick wall them in so they can't go to the gold and build an outpost, but that didn't work. I think it's maybe more about like stopping a keep drop, but it doesn't matter, right? That gold's now gone. He's like, okay, now we finish off the wall. You have what you have, I have what we have. And now this is where it gets interesting, right? Like, yeah, Wham's got a little bit extra gold trickle, but they're about to be out, right? Only the difference is Louis is going to be able to float an extra. 3k before that's the case, right? He's about to tap this yeah. one dry, and I think he's still got about a thousand left close to his base. Yeah, that's that's gonna be a big difference maker here. If you look at the destroyed value, usually, usually when you look at it, it's inverted here. Usually yeah. opponents can kill a lot more. Um, just because it, it's like you've said this before, but mistakes are really punishing with Order of the Dragon. Like if you take a bad fight, it's just you lose so much so fast. If Whereas here, it looks right. like Louis just played this late game so masterfully. It's been really impressive. And, and that's the interesting thing to think about. Like, if you get counted, right, it, it's a big wallet. Speaking of big wallet, Mango gets a hit in here. <laughs> it's just the ranged formation here, right? Just stand your ground, pepper him out. It's going to be a little bit of a start step back. Needs to be careful here as the men at arms are gaining a little bit of traction. But after you lose this arm on each side, right, like, who lost more, right? It's mostly archers with some Guild of Crossbowmen versus Mass Hanker in here. So Wham needs to break through here. Unfortunately, he's now diving a castle. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, a lot of that gold Ooh. thing just got spent by Louis. Oh. He's able to maintain it. He has double the gold income at this stage. And the horsemen don't cost gold, right? So he can keep making them, but I think their effectiveness is a bit limited in this matchup right now due to Wham's army, so it, it's yeah, this ranged strength. mass is just yeah. staying alive. No answer to the keep as well as the relic inside, so it was just raining hellfire down as well on these spearmen. A little bit of a miss micro there. Like, uh, there was moments where the land snake were going in blind without the horseman support, right? So, like, you need to be careful. Louis losing one of those units is insanely expensive, right? Like, these land snakes are doubly as powerful as the HREs, but they are double the price. And we just mentioned that gold is a limiting factor. Like, Louis has now drained himself to the bone. He's got no reserve. If you remember, we were talking about a minute ago about the fact that he should have three or 4K surface. He's down to right. 250 gold. Yeah, he still has a thousand gold per minute, but that number is going down. It looks like maybe one of the gold mines just ran out, um, which could be really bad for him, but it, it's starting to be a competition for the wood on the right side of the map. It looks like some villagers are creeping forward for Louis, maybe with some siege there as well. Wow. As we have a big back and forth in the center. Uh, the problem I'm seeing right now is Wham is getting worse and worse. Look at his hand candy account. It's deceptive. Yeah. His army is actually trash. The land snake, they're going to get better and better because Wham can't afford to keep pumping hand cannoneers anymore and he knows it. Yeah. He does have an extra relic, but yeah, it's still going <laughs> to be mean, tricky. Yeah, that's going to be With like what, an extra hand cannoneer and a half a minute. It's, it's not crazy. It adds, it's, it adds up if you're not losing them. <laughs> It adds up. Every bit of gold adds up, man. I don't know. Well, there you go. Um, he queued up seven more. Unfortunately, those have to run into 15 Well, it would be arches. six. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it matters. I hope Louis, so. what, using his cauldrons like backgrounds? An interesting choice, but, you know, he's like, I, he's so cold. He's like, I don't even need these anymore. I've got the one range unit I need right here. Well, to kill the crossbows and archers, still just stand their ground. Yeah, Louis is able to keep his mass up. The population for both players has dropped a lot as these armies just continue to trade against each other. Just 
constant death and destruction. Although I will say, the kill destroyed value has been eking <laughs> up higher and higher for Wham. He yeah. has been taking better engagements for the last five five minutes or so. It used to be about a 20k lead, now it's only 10k, and there's proportionality there as well at play. So it hasn't been ideal for Louis. This push has been extremely expensive for him, and now he's forced into the trash combo. And that's where I wonder if his comp is going to be as dominant as it was when he could afford all the gold units. But we'll see. I mean, it, he still has some gold in the bank, still has decent income. So we're not just out of gold yet. I'd say, like, actually, Gilded Arch is going to do a lot here now. Uh, this this is kind of problematic at this stage for Wham. It's, you know, we mentioned the range difference already. Marching Drills is nice on hand cannon is, but it still makes you as slow as archers, right? Like, that's the kind of weird thing with that unit, is it, it doesn't allow you to gap close, per se. So, yep. I, I agree, Louis kind of been taking a very A-click approach to some of these fights. And um, one thing that's deceptive with destroyed value, you have to remember, now that he's been spamming a lot of horsemen, that's an expensive loss, right? But yeah. most of that loss is it's a an affordable loss. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Permanent resource. Well, they're fighting over the wood here on the right. Now, the the shift, the focus has shifted. <laughs> it's just insane how quickly Spimmin died to this. Yeah. I feel like this small group of archers could actually take on all those spears. Maybe not with the hand cannon supporting. But also, like, one Meganel in Q would be really nice for Wham to see, but not quite getting it. The trade, they're thinking about trade. Wham has markets in the north, and it looks like Louis going to deny that. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he was moving around for outposts. The funny thing is, Louis isn't going for himself. I mean, it makes sense, right? Like, I think of these two players, the one that actually needs gold, at this stage, weirdly enough in this matchup anyway, is the HRE. He can't really afford those hand cannons we talked about, and even going men at arms against mass gilded archers doesn't sound great to me. Yeah, but it's it's not too expensive. He can afford that. And the spearman getting this around. Okay, I don't know who's sick. surrounded who. You're not trapped in here with me. <laughs> I'm trapped in here with you. It's the full fight position, dude. Like, he's literally using the berries like they're wolves. <laughs> <laughs> Hold, man. These shrubberies will defend us. Could you just imagine that? You're the spearman. You're like, ah, oh, now we attack. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Fawns on the bushes, guys. <laughs> it's just a flesh wound. Oh, man. This is... Hmm. God damn it, now you've got my brain fully on Monty Python mode. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 as soon as I said shrubbery, <laughs> as soon as I said shrubbery, I was like, oh no, what have I done? What have I done? It's in my head now. Uh... Now the question is, who is, uh, who's actually winning this fight and who at this point has a flesh wound of two arms and two legs gone? Because they're back to even on each side. But... I, I still just struggle to bang against the Gilded Archers. Like, I, I think Louis maybe being a bit overkill with the Horsemen. I imagine that's because he wants to start hitting the economy, though. Louis found gold again. He, he went up back to 1,000 gold per minute. He had he had a gold somewhere. It, it was the one he, now, he, it, but... was, it was his secondary tree line. There was a gold there that had, like, 1,500. It was the one where yeah. Bam was ramming earlier, um, like, very early in the game. Like, so now... I say earlier as if that has context. 35 minutes ago, guys. Well, now we need to see how this trash comp goes, because this is what we were talking about. This is now Louis, like, playing without gold. Essentially, he has gold in the bank, so it's not the final gold push of him for his game. But, like, we'll see how this goes, right? Like, I have no idea. <laughs> I just don't want him to I fight I feel like his army is more concentrated, right? Yeah, I, I, but I just don't want him to fight with his horsemen. Like, I, I think that's what's cool is, like, because of the fact there are horsemen, Wham's spreading himself thin. So, you know, instead of just running him these horsemen, this is much better. He's just running them around. So the spearmen are like, oi, 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 just chasing across and getting peppered by arrows as they go. They're not attacking. And if you think about that, at that stage, no bonus damage is coming through. It's a raw HP game. You're not winning a raw HP game against Gilded Horsemen with Violet. There's no freaking way. Yeah. Now, will this keep going down? I think this is starting to, to arrive at the breakthrough point, right? Where Wham doesn't really Where have that repairs? premium. Does I he mean, not have repair? It's on cooldown. Oh. <laughs> Maybe if we go back a few years when it used to have a lower cooldown, but this stage, 20 seconds out. A few years. Yeah. That's yeah, it looks like Wham had a lot of his units on the left side trying to secure that trade line. And Louis just pushed. He centralized in the middle and just pushed before Wham was ready. And, like, a lot of pop was over there. And, man, Louis just took such a good fight. That was an incredible late game decision. And I feel like it... It's really easy to overlook just how cleanly that was executed. Like a little bait and switch. He saw his opportunity and he took it. We talked about this during the draft. Like Louis' late game decision making just seems so good. And it's one of those things where the, 
like they were both max pop like theoretically that should be pretty even but he just out positioned his opponent there and wham maybe yep. baiting himself into over committing to that corner um but i mean louis saw the opportunity and took it and in the meantime like you're saying the raids are just gonna keep piling up i mean oh the, this, is, this is this is great point bad. like wham wham is funnily enough now going into horseman too late. Like, I think it's way too late for this. It might have been a good idea earlier on when you saw this many archers, but now, like, the way you're going to trickle in, even this many archers, they can easily just snipe you down as they start a step away. He's going to commit anyway. The other awkward thing is you have to remember you get more health, you don't get more damage, right? <laughs> like, we mentioned this, these are not your typical backline glass cannons. Gilded archers have so much health as it is. They'll annihilate the entire army, and I think that, that should be the moment where Wham accepts this for what it is. If this comp can't break it and push it back, what the hell does he hasn't noticed this raid this raid with these same four horsemen on the right th that's the the worker kills just went up like 30 <laughs> with this raid that's really rough <laughs> for when it's, it's stalking like i'm watching one of those like active little um, rotating number things you know where it flickers like yeah. one to nine uh, the the tough part though is like wham it's weird because you don't really feel the impact of the raid if you're mashing reduce on pass swabi right but realistically, uh, this game, I think Wham is now just kind of processing the he's... loss. He's essentially in limbo, right? Like, he's not even getting an army together anymore. He's just sending meat to the grinder. And that those is going to be archers? We, do, we don't talk about it. GG <laughs> gets what? called. Those are that... unupgraded archers from Wham, I'm pretty sure. That is essentially I mean, the maybe... equivalent of a McLaren uh, racing up against a free will mini. Uh, it's not going to be pretty, but it <laughs> is going to be pretty good for Louis. That's two points on the board now. Somehow finding a way to still dominate the HRE an hour into a game. That was a really, I feel like my takeaway here is, I mean, you talked about it at the start, Louis's late game. It's just on point. You even said Beastie called it out as being really solid. And I think... That was a really good showcase there. Like, Wham is no slash when it comes to late game. He is an extremely solid late game player. Um, so seeing him kind of struggle there against Order of the Dragon, where a lot of players, like, Order of the Dragon has its moments, but I think a lot of players agree that, like, the transitions are still kind of unknown for Order of the Dragon, even though the Civ has been out for so long. Like, it's kind of hard to play Order of the Dragon late game, right? Whereas HRE has been pretty consistent for years now, right? Um, so interesting to see that the Order of the Dragon late game was enough there against HRE. Um, I'm personally a little surprised by that, um, but I think that's a testament to Louis, really. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's just a lot to learn on Order of the Dragon still, at least for me. <laughs> I've got to learn, to learn some. <laughs> I think it's just, it's the focus on melee. Like, if you think about the Order of the Dragon, essentially that comp is, is it's almost taboo, right? Like, when do you ever feel good when someone says your comp in Imperial Age should be Archers? You're like, ah! Am I playing English? Do I have volley? No? Okay, what are we talking about here? But this is the Civ that actually can do it. Gilded Archers are insanely powerful. I always say they should have a, a whirring up noise, like a minigun, because they attack that quickly, right? <laughs> um, yeah. the, the other funny thing is like they feel a lot better in the late game than the early game. Um, not because they're worse, but because of the way that you use them. If you think about it, Archer Mass in early game is start a step, shoot, start a step, shoot. In fact, because of the way that like the game is coded, um, there's there's kind of an animation skip there where like if you're very good at the timing, you can get a few extra archer shots out per minute with normal archers. But it doesn't work with gilded archers because their attack speed is too low, right? So like if you think about it, gilded archers has another element that puts people off them, which is that you have to stand still, which you don't really want to do, right? You want to kite. But when you get to this late game and it's just a non-stop meat grinder it becomes the premium backbone of your army. I, I still think Order of the Dragon has some issues in the late game, but what I want to give Louis here, he reached his comfy stage, right? He reached his meat grinder. He loves to play that late game, and this was a lot cleaner in that Numidon game. If he played this game like he played that Numidon game in the group stage, I think Wham would have won, but yeah. that's not the way it's playing out. And now Wham back up against the wall has to go for the most powerful pick. I mentioned this in the draft. I think Jean Dark is the unsolved issue here. That's the one where Louis isn't going to get a golden matchup. Marlins versus Jean, I think, is kind of okay. There are ways you can contest Jean, but it's still a really annoying, uncomfortable thing because the thing that a lot of Jean players have realized now is instead of trying to all-in your opponent, Marlins are very difficult for that, right? They're very sticky. They've got a very good defensive comp. You mm -hmm. force them to invest in that defensive comp, and then you just build a second TC at home, right? And you just outscale their economy so that by the time they get to Castle Age, you've got like a 20 villager lead. Yeah, like you're saying, I think Malians are probably Louis' best bet against um, Jean that he has in his draft. Like, I don't think you pick French here. I don't think you pick Biz here. Um, 
you could try with English, but it feels bad. <laughs> so I think Malians, you have the most options. And I think an interesting note about Malians, at least the way that I see it, is that I really like that Malians have like unique counters to both of the forms of Jean in the Feudal Age, right? If you go Archer and you have a group of um, uh, Javelin throwers, right? You just, you can deal with the Archer form. And if they go melee, you have a couple of answers to the melee that feel a bit unique compared to most civs. So I think we'll see Malians maybe have a chance here. Like, that's always an interesting like choice. I feel like Wham has to pick wisely and play around John very well this game because Malians can be threatening. Um, and Malians also have really solid eco timings that can compete with John's power spikes, right? Like if the cattle boom and you have, if Louis gets two pit mines and a cattle boom and is uncontested economically, I think that can be an issue for Sean in some games if her XP falls behind, right? And she's not level three in time, then suddenly Louis' timing is going to be really solid. So I feel like that's kind of the cat and mouse we're going to see here. Um, it's going to come down, I think, a lot to the Feudal Age play with Sean and the counterplay to Jean. Um, So I'm really looking forward to how Louis is going to do here because he's such an excellent Jean player, seeing him counter Jean, he should have some insights maybe and some ideas on how to deal with it. Um, Wham, though, is such a good player as well, so it's... Ooh, I'm excited! Uh, and Late the, in the tournament, man. This yeah. is it. I mean, I, I want I want to see some turnaround. I want to see at least one point in the board for Wham. I think this is going to be too. that game. And, you know, here's the interesting thing, right? Wham took that away at the first opening phase of the draft, because what, what does Louis do wrong here, Winston? He goes on the ladder on EL.LouisMT. He plays these games publicly on Jean Dark, everyone can see it. They're like, damn, this guy really knows how to use Jean. They know exactly who he is because A, he shows up as in China, and B, he literally doesn't change his name, unlike CSO, who has a different name every day. What would have helped him? What could have helped him maybe keep that secret? Something that we can all relate to is, are you an English Lombo spammer? Are you someone who always picks the French, the Ottomans? You're just predictable, right? I guarantee you that when you get into lobby, there's a small window where someone can quickly just glance at your AO4 world profile and see what sieve you pick the most. And then the sweaty bum lord goes ahead and counterpicks you. Disgusting, vile. You know how you solve for that? VPN. Get yourself some Surfshark. Just all of a sudden, you know, you're not like this, this guy from China who loves Chinese because some of us are, are patriots like that. You're from South Africa. Your name reads like a Chinese name, but as far as your profile says an for world, you're from somewhere completely different. All of a sudden, you get to get your Chinese pick, no one's banning you out. Louis could have done the same thing. He could have pretended that he was uh, from, I don't know, the North Pole. He's, he's a polar bear, for all you know, courtesy of the, the Surfshark VPNs. Didn't do it. And that's why Wham took it away at the start of the draft. And now, Wham is going to show you just how powerful it is. It's time for the third game in the series, Louis, two on the board. He's looked flawless so far. Let's see if Jean can dunk back in return. If we can actually see Wham finally get on the board. Because remind the people, the draft resets after the fourth game. So although it may look a bit shaky right now draft-wise, we're only halfway through the series. We've got a whole reset ahead of us. But before that, let's get into the third game. Oh boy. And here we have it, Arabia. The classic map. With some not so classic sieves, it's interesting to see this. Uh, the Malians, though, so solid on Arabia. They've just been so solid on Arabia for so long now. I, it feels it feels so cool to play them. And look at his map. Look at Louis's map. Look at those gold mines. <laughs> that is so good. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> He's got three back gold mines with Malians. That is a dream. Holy. Okay, uh -huh. keep note of this. That's going to be relevant. Uh, the fact that those pit mines are going to be uncontested largely. Um, like, because it's so hard. Like, you'd say, oh, just wrap around and fight it. With Jean, you, you really can't. You can't send Jean around the back of the enemy's base unless you're in an absolute position of power because you just risk, you're just at way too much risk, right? If you take a bad fight or your reinforcements get cut off, you just lose Jean and you probably lose the game with that mistake. So Jean has to play a bit safer. Generally, she can't take those big risks behind the base at, in, especially in early feudal. So yeah. th the fact that these are back there is, is actually really impactful for how Bam has to play this matchup now. Did, did um, we ever figure out what like MT stands for in Louis's name? Is it like maybe Marine Lord Turbo or something? Cause like I've seen these type of spawns somewhere before. Uh, <laughs> I think Marine Lord has some uh, influence on this map spawn. Is that what you're saying? 
I, I don't know, man. Like, I, I, maybe maybe Louis's secret pad one. Like, that's an interesting thought, right? We always call it the, the M Lord spawn uh, when you get a desirable one. What happens if Louis? I'm getting ahead of us. What if Louis does go through to that uh, that semi final? <sighs> Who's gonna get graced? I don't know. All I know is why I'm still. If you get these maps, I feel like you can beat anybody, <laughs> right? I feel like Louis can win against any player with this map, right? I mean, we'll see. I mean, who knows? Maybe Wham has some tricks up his sleeve. It just feels like. If the odds were against him, momentum is on Louis' side, and you get this map spawn, things are going to feel a little bad. But I'm, we'll see. I'm, There's still I'm a lot at, to be played, right? Yeah, I'm looking at the ball locations here. One thing I will say is, like, usually when I, I... I talked about this idea of a 2TC build that I think is really nice. Like, what you do is you go in with Jean, you bait the Marlins to start adding in production buildings, and then you just greed, right? The problem is, although these balls are really far off to the outskirts, they're also very hard to reach with a second TC drop initially, right? Extra idle time and also not extra resources nearby. It's not like you've got a berry patch next to them. So that might be a bit cumbersome for Wham. The other reason I think that's very important is something you're going to see out of Jean players that's going to be really important as the meta develops further is optimizing your rotation to kill the balls so that you get back to buff the TC build speed. It's a very big difference. Saves you like 30 or 40 seconds if you have Jean in range when you're building up a town center. But yeah, this like type mils, of spawn, right? exactly. And this type of spawn makes that difficult. Like, think about the, the timing and the rotation. You're going to have all your resources, and you're still not going to be able to get there quick enough to help the TC. Yeah, those boars are about as far away as they could possibly be. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll see uh, if he's even able to find them. <laughs> he's scouting those is going to be tricky, right? Um, also, remember know, that, uh, that Louis can know when you're doing them, right? Because the guy units do die through the fog. So that's always mm -hmm. someone that's very useful uh, when you're playing up, up against Jon. Uh, I've seen players like Beast use this phenomenally well, where he'll maybe be playing a sieve that can counter Jon, and he'll literally wait for the boar to die, and then cut her off on the retreat back to base. Because at that stage, she's like, what, half HP? If you get, let's say you went for a sofa here. A sofa is a really good way of dealing with Jon, because you get bonus damage against infantry, and you're tanky enough and fast enough that you can chase her down. That's a good sheep haul for Louis. That's a really good sheep haul for Louis. Um, okay, so <laughs> it's not enough to get this spawn. Apparently, he's also the sheep whisperer. Yeah, and ugh. what? That okay. is crazy. <laughs> okay. Remember right. when I said this was like Wham's best, like best shot to get a game in? Like, I think this is the the matchup where it's like, damn, Jean really good for this draft. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I mean, this is Louis' best best sieve against it, and I think this is just an incredible map start. I think it's going to come down to what Louis commits to early. I feel like with this map, maybe just the tried and true, Donso Jav defense into castle, right, timing? Like, I, I feel like with this map, that's how he can afford to play. Um, I'd be surprised if he does a sofa transition early. I don't think it's very wise against knights, right? I, I think in this game, with the lack of food, it, it could work. Um, the, it's interesting because I've seen a few Marlin players adding it in in Feudal Age. It's really effective if you force your opponent to like, add in archers or even just the genre itself. One thing to keep in mind is like I remember, I distinctly, Winston, recall a, a game like this with Jean Dark in where they got, I think it was four or five sheep. This is just one bet of six. And the player had to come out on the map too quickly. He got flanked everywhere by Cav and died and GG'd out at 11 minutes. Funnily enough, that Jean player was, I'm pretty sure that was Wham. So... <laughs> We, I hope we don't get repeated that. It looks like he's got a more secure plan. He is going for that 2TC build we talked about. And this now gives Louis a bit of agency to either try to play aggro or now just double down on the Fulani spam. Yeah, I guess we'll see. Um, walling off the north, uh, super wise to do that. The first Donso might go down. No, he's able to get away. So just a bit of chip damage here and there. The Ville had to back away, but we'll be fine and this wall going up on the north is going to cut off all those rotations um and just mean that those gold mines are really safe and also the wood line kind of by extension you just have to protect kind of the north part of your tc and then the rest of your economy being safe is going to be such a huge boon for louis going into this feudal age wham has chosen the uh, melee on dark no real surprise against malians i think that's generally the safer option especially for feudal age because javelins are such a given um with Malians that you just don't want to risk losing Jean for free. And Donzo's is quite nice against either one, right? Like you can poke and prod at the archer form. They have no range resistance. Um, even mm -hmm. the melee form struggles because the, the cleaves that are usually very effective, you have to remember oh. that Donzo's are a premium spearman unit. So they're a little bit more tanky. They can take an extra swipe. 
What an escape. Yeah, the extra the extra little HP there does go a long way. It, well, Sofa, you were right. He is going to yep. go Don so Sofa. Makes sense, I guess, without Jean being um, ranged. Well, he, he's scouted the second the DC chance. as well. Like, that's the other right. thing. Right. So he's like, yeah. okay, that means you don't have knights. So I can have, like, two Sofas to your one knight. And when you chase it down, like, if you check the Sofa, you'll see they have good base damage. They're very tanky. But they also have this nice little bonus damage, specifically against infantry. And that's something that level two Zhong cannot get away from, no matter the choice. Yeah, really solid play here Wait, from Louis. Uh, wham. <laughs> he's like, oh, no, the wall. <laughs> So when you pinch this, yeah, it's, it's an impossible pinch, but now you can get chased away. Like, the knight is too low to help you, and I wouldn't be surprised if we got up to, like, four or five sofas here. It's a really smart choice by Louis. This is Jean's great escape. <laughs> They're going to write stories about this. She uh, walks through the door, both arms and legs missing. I live! Yeah. <laughs> I live! Well, she still has uh, inspiration, but you don't want to use the heal. It is a really long cooldown. Using it just to keep your hero alive feels really, really, really bad. I'm um, speaking from experience, so it looks like she's going to have to even pop it if she doesn't get to the oh, TC in time. This, this next attack... Is... No, it, it's yeah, not okay. going to be quick enough. He used it! Oh, for God's sake. What? No. She heals. <laughs> she just heals passively. Oh, no. And now I mean, Wham... Like, what? It's Dude. TC play. Yeah, but look at what Wham's building. He's building archers. Now he's panic acting, adding in spears. So he's going for the 1-1-1, one, 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 which is usually good, but like, but the way this is aligned, it's bad, right? Like, Louis just got a full step ahead of you. This sofa play works great against John. It's going to work great against the archers. And now, because you went to DC, you don't really have the capability to go into night spam. I wouldn't be surprised if Louis now just kind of patrols the map with a small group and rushes towards that Fulani. It's crazy. This this is crazy. So basically, Wham consecrated the barracks over a TC or over the stable. Well, That's you a would really do, interesting you, choice. Yeah, you, just, you, don't, you don't want to do stable, right? Because like, like the stable you were against. You can't Tonzo's. afford it. Exactly. Yeah, but, but the TC, I agree. The TC is a weird one to me, but it tells you his intent. Like this is one interesting thing for people. A tip if they want to deal with like good Johns. Look at what they consecrate. It tells you a lot about what their composition is meant meant to be. Ideally, for the next four or five minutes. And that's a really big revelation and an ugly one. I don't like people having to build mass spears against Donzos. It's a bad engagement, right? Like, yeah, they how get many the extra melee. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, it's just so solid for the Donzos, right? And honestly, Louis hasn't made more military. He's he's gonna go castle behind this, right? He's just booming and chilling. He is bing chilling. Triple mil. Look at this. <laughs> it's the same two sofa, and there's like, he, I think he's lost like one or two Donzo, maybe. I don't even know if he has. He's got a um, sofa here. No, he hasn't. Uh, he hasn't lost anything. No, no. Villagers are in a little bit of a pickle. They'll be able to run away quick enough. The surfers need to come home. Jean, this is dangerous, right? The cleaves are going to come in. That's nice. But this is an overextension now. Like, this many sofas? <laughs> Only two? I know. Is that sound this many? Like, when you're in this type of position, that's enough to kill you off. So Wham needs to be very, very careful about his approach here. We're 10 minutes in, and that was the first. And now I think a scout just died as well. So now only two things have died from Louis. Like, he... Up until that point, he hadn't lost a single unit or vill to early knights. Full That's Mulani crazy. Going to be on the way in the next two minutes as well. But this is this is scary. Wham doesn't really have that same potency. Yeah, the cows are lining up for their Airbnbs. <laughs> They're looking for a nice stay. They're like, hey, we're we're having a uh, housing crisis in Malian Town. There's not enough homes. Oh, are we man. sure that those aren't just British cows? I mean, they're so politely queued up. <laughs> They're not queued up. They're in a, they're milling about. Oh, you're right. That, that's 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 British. Uh, the race. It's a game. race. It's a race. <laughs> that was a hey, foot man, race. Housing crisis. Those houses. They, they get eaten up real quick. You got to make sure you get your down payment straight away. There yeah. we go. Fulani on the way. Oh, I, I mean, what <laughs> could Wham have done? He's going up. He, he, he has a nice vill lead, but like the economic difference here is. It's not big I, enough. I think Louis just. No, Louis has better income pretty soon, right? Yeah, as soon as it's exactly. Done. Because he's got the back pit mine that he can now secure. He got that wall up, so he's got his third there that's safe, right? The issue yeah. in this game is like th this play, you expect Fulani to come out. It's natural, right? House. But. Uh, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. XP. <laughs> Calm down. There's enough houses for everyone. Don't rush in. <laughs> oh, man. And Jean gets experience for that. That's funny. I've ne I never see. <laughs> I don't think I've seen that before. <laughs> So what you're saying is why I can recover this game. We just need to burn oh, the Oh, it night for free? Just carting a mill. Oh, lamb, no. Not like this. This is a very You were the chosen one. one. Like, it's quite an interesting the way that Louis He's split his He's building with five villas. It's not yeah. 
quick at all. It, it feels like he's just like he's just flaunting. He's like spitting in the face. Like, yes, please dive me. Look, I, I mean, still haven't teched up yet. Fight me. I mean, this is playing with fire though. His veils are exposed on the north, but he does have the wraparound gate. So it's like if you even get in here, he just runs through the next gate. The wood line a little exposed here. Wouldn't be surprised to see Wham try and get a couple veil picks. One veil should. Escape. I like how he's literally pausing the tech up right now to do this, by the way. <laughs> it's such a wild approach. Like right now, Louis, he's sitting on so much extra gold. The food is the problem right now. Oh my god. Lucifer he just doesn't want to feed, right? He doesn't want to yep. give Jean experience, right? If Jean stays tier two and Louis has 40 units, what a win, right? Like that's such a huge fight advantage in the next big engagement, but Jean's passive XP should catch up. Did he ever kill the boars? I don't know if I don't he, did. he did. Can we no, check the two boars? No, he, he yeah, didn't. Wow. So this is going to be a really late tier. Remember tier that sofa? The denied 50 XP? That guy That guy was a Chad. Uh, I don't think we ever named him. Can you think of a good name for a, a Malian sofa? Um, Futon? Futon. Futon sounds like a good name. We're talking about sofas, right? Oh, we yeah, yeah, need the, yeah. the, 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 the units. No, no, no. Okay. That, is, that is his name. Futon, the uh, the denier of XP there. Was actually I thought really we were talking deal. about sofas. I, I thought we were talking about furniture. I love how Vodka found the exact one. I like to imagine you just control grouped it when we weren't looking. So sofas now, she's going to wrap into the economy. Wham has teched up, sure. But like this is the surge point now, right? This is where the sofa mask can kind of undo you. Even though you want to go nights, the issue that you now have is Wham is realistically, you don't have the permanent food to keep scaling it. Hmm. Wow. I'm, I'm wondering like what Bam can do here. He's got Sacred Strike caps coming in, but without the ball, he's speed. still, well, yeah, but he's still like what? I'd say about two to three minutes away from level three, because remember he didn't kill the boars. I mean, Wham's economy is pretty big. Like he, he has had two TC behind this. Mm -hmm. Can we check his consecrations? Just see what he's done at this point. Should be several more now. Stable, double barracks. Yeah, but he does Very the stables as well. Which I find especially interesting here, right? Like, if, if you actually want to use the stables, it's very efficient, right? Like, it's one of the biggest, like, cost savers. Uh, but if, if you, you can run it full time. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And that's the problem right now. It's like, I think he wants to keep knights pumping. I'm always a fan of archery ranges. Archery ranges are great because at this stage in the game, you can get the um, ordnance company. You can discount the gold as well. And that's when the arbitrary becomes a very cost efficient comp for John. Unfortunately, in this matchup, Outside the sofas, there's no great value in Arbor Trier spam. Yeah, the Arbalist is going to have less value here, for sure. Um, it's interesting. I, I'm really curious about how Wham's fight is going to go. He still has a military lead. His economy is solid. It's not that much worse than Louis. Louis' main advantage right now is his food income is insane, right? But on the other resources, Wham is kind of doing okay. So he should be able to mount a decent enough force here. Just has to keep on top of his blacksmith upgrades. Maybe last game he's kind of hitting himself because he ended that game with still like not even some of the level one blacksmith upgrades, right? Um, so this game he's he needs to stay on top of them. We're now getting into a relic race. Louis is actually being him in that regard. Like the thing that I like is like, wow, I, I think he has a very strong timing in like six or seven minutes, right? But you have to be careful not to give up too much of the map. I'd love to see Wham kind of maybe the next three or four minutes collecting stone and prepping for a keep drop on like the left side. Because I think these 8k golds are going to be critical. Like you do get big discounts on Arbor Trey massing. It's very strong. But it, it's a slow process because of the Consecrate cooldown, right? Mm -hmm. um, once you have got like five or six Archer Rangers, it's insane how much longer Jean d'Arc can last in Imp Plus than the French. I'm finding this very interesting though, KP. Is like, usually when I think of Malians, I think of... Like, this is their timing, right? Like, mm -hmm. with the way that Louis has played this game, he played for now, right? Oh, like, uh, no, uh, you say right? that, but this is Louis. So, <laughs> I think, you think he's I, just playing for late game right now? He's always playing for late game. Well, like, yeah, but... Hmm. Yeah, he's getting upgrades. I, I guess I'm just a little confused by the play right now. I, maybe I just need to learn something, <laughs> right? He is... He is massing now. He has more military now. I could just I could just see a world where the fight doesn't go as one-sided as he's hoping, right? Um, 
but maybe that's okay for him still. Yeah. I, I'm trying to think like, okay, no, dude. I I think I know where Louis is going with this. I've seen him do this before. This is going to be Musa Fadi done a late game versus um, Arbitrier. He's actually, he, I think it was Louis versus Poppy Paul. He destroyed Poppy Paul in the late game of this. It took a long time, but he done it. The issue in, in this situation though, is like the trade posts compared to that game were not, like th these ones are not great. Like the game where he done it well, it was corner posts. So he could just trade behind the front line. Look mm -hmm. at where the trade posts are in here. Like Dry Arabia sometimes spawns like this. It's a more recent addition I've noticed. You're exposed. So like if Louis' goal is to go imp plus and basically spam scouts plus gunners, this game is going to hit less impressively for him. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting point. Both players just massing up and booming behind this. It looks like Wham. Oh, whoa. Moving out with a lot of warrior scouts. Attack on Titan time. Has Wham got what? Gambersons yet? Why are they really in important. such a conga line? What is this? Did because, he right click Because something? I told you they're British people. We love queuing. Look at them go. He um, just they're... clicked the wall. Control, shift C, right click. <laughs> uh... Well, the wall's coming up. Might be a little bit late for Wham here. Wham. Whoa, boy. Yeah, They're the in. scouts are going to go for the burn. And Mr. Louis in with the warrior I, scouts. Is he looking for the farms? Because right now, Wham, he doesn't have that many farms, right? Like, it's just a, a small handful. So, Louis it's is going to find rain. that maximum impact there. Yeah, and the army for Louis is really, really solid. So, the timing worked. Like, he's here. A lot of the units for Wham were on the right, just defending. And now they have to make their way across. Wham has to wait, and that's going to be a painful time while he waits for his army to come in. Scouts rotating the wrong way, though. They're going around the left side of the tree line. If they went right, they would have actually scouted all the workers on the gold. So they'll be able to help the food. Is he actually going to scout the veins as well, though? Because that's actually going to be very important. Wham still needs a lot of gold to get this all online. Still some upgrades to come out. Whoa. But this is a heavy hit, man. <laughs> They've spread out. Da -da 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 and meanwhile, Wham isn't even reacting to it. He's too busy, too busy losing the front line. Yeah, so he just took a, a disjointed fight. Half of his army wasn't there. What? John was on the front. Oh, no. Are you no. kidding me? Are you kidding me? Look at the Vils intro. melted. John dead, disaster strikes for Wham. Everything goes down. Everything dies. He might win this fight on the front with good positioning and good manganel shots. Looks like He's the crossbows else. and <laughs> the archers are in position, but everything else is dead. I am, KP, I... what is happening? When was the last time you saw a warrior scout spam hit this hard? It hit so fast. He had nothing. He had like he had like 20 less units than Wham. And then suddenly he had like 30 more. And I guess like 30 of them were warrior scouts. He just spammed them out really, really quickly with that food eco and went for the timing attack. He said, you're not ready for this. And boy, was he right. Wham, look at the vil count. Completely neutralized. And Jumping behind that is the Mayan eco. <laughs> He's like, you can get level four if you want. John Ass Blast is not going to do anything for you here because Louis, look at what he's doing. He's getting ready for attack up. He is going to be moving into that imp time we talked about. And I can't blame him. He's, as you said, completely neutralized any lead that Wham had. And it's insane as well, because if you think back to that rotation, I'd say Louis missed at first, right? Like he went for that wood line, assuming that Wham was taking risky resources. He spent the first 20 seconds of that rotation finding nothing. Wham got Even so tunnel vision though. He saw nothing. Yeah, I think it was just completely overwhelming. I, th I think that uh, that attack was so alarming and surprising. Most of those units were behind Louis' walls at his town center for like 10 minutes. He was just slowly massing this army and he just ran them across. And behind this, Louis has even stolen two of the relics that were adjacent to Wham's walls. So really good pickups for him. And, <laughs> and Louis just wants to do it again. He's like, let's put it back. That was pretty fun, right, guys? It's I like, had a good oh. time. Did you? Did you? Have, did you enjoy that way? I think we should try this again sometime. Wait, he's going down the center. Uh, Louis, maybe being a bit too greedy with his fort, the Huntress. It looks like it's been scouted. Wham's actually moving out to contest it, so he is going to see this going up. However, if you do attack this, like, what's more worth, killing thirteen Malian villagers or losing another twenty French? Cancel and it's the a cancellation up. that will buy him some time, but this massive Ooh. army is about to walk into his base. Classic, a distracting really? Wololo even gets vodka. Our observer gets gets gotten by the by the good stuff, and oh boy. He's going. Here comes the army. Scouts are on the move in. Wham. I mean, he needs to break in and do some permanent damage here. Louis 
Keep in mind that he's still going for that tech up. It's so more defensive for the Huntress on the tree line. It'll give him some defense. It'll give oh, him some the time. Gold. The gold. It's the gold. Again. Not again. Wham, wake up. Wham. Look, look, look. Okay, Wham sees it this time. Yeah, but he's now, like, not again, not again. But his <laughs> army to defend with is so small there, Winston. I think he's got like 20 units back to defend. And funnily enough, he's just going to take down the guild hall. You have to claim Wham. it before it goes down, right? But if Wham doesn't, he's stuck. He doesn't have a tech up. Otherwise, it's going to take him over two minutes to get the food together. And that's without producing units. Dive comes in, but it's not going to stop it. Wham, not able to deny the tech up. And he forgets to get the food out. No. No way. Run! John is trapped! John, she's trapped! Wait, what? She's trapped! She, she goes down! She's, no. not, she's not trapped now, The Winston. Fortress of the she's, Huntress. She thought she was the Huntress, anymore. but she was the hunted. She's not suffering anymore. Oh, but this could be a really big Manganel hit on the Musafati. Oh, the splits come in, though. Louis just pays attention. And the now... Scouts go after it. Freebie. And the meanwhile, in the base, wow. like, you're being idled up underneath your TC. I can't believe this. Louis is fighting him. And I say he's holding on fine in three different locations. Make it four. Surround comes in oh. with the Musavadi. They're done with the appetizer. They want the main meal. He's got the melee armor, I think, on the Zerbalitria. So they're they're quite tanky. But I think the term that, you're looking for is die slower. Die slower. Yeah, they they are quite die slower. Um, <laughs> another gold mine being slurped up by uh, Wham. Hopefully, another band of scouts doesn't come by for him. As Louis' Imperial Age technologies come in, Wham's yeah, that's, that's the hopes of winning this game just like disintegrated, right? He, he, yeah. he's, wait, his wait. landmark John, has given him no John, value. John, 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 Hey, guys, there you go. That's the Companion's equipment making the difference. Boom. I mean, legit, that's the difference between life and death there. The, the scary mm. thing, by the way, is Louis just repelled you, aggroed you, without any upgrades. Like, that was a tech up, and that was him fighting with a, a Castle Age army. What happens now when you're in equal military numbers, but now, now it's elite status, right? Scouts, Mass Musafadi coming. It's kind of interesting to me, actually, that Louis hasn't gone into Javelins, despite the fact he's up against Arb the Trier. Yeah. Man, this is rough. Did he repair the guild hall, or does he just stack that food naturally? Uh, ah, he, yeah, he yeah, got yeah. it. He pulled it. He's still he not had, ready for the jump, though. Right. He had to. Yeah, I mean, that delayed him so much. That's like a lot of gold that he could have been mining, and instead he was using his wood to repair. Keep in mind, though, he still has gold issues, right? Like, he got denied off the right side now, and we saw that that vein in the back of his base was getting pretty low, and, and that's worrisome, right? Because at this rate, you're going to get a fake Imperial Age in uh -oh, that you check up, but you won't have any resources. <laughs> Sean had a few too many shots. He's like, yeah, yeah, I've had a few too many shots of JD. I can take on the entire Imperial Malian <laughs> army. <laughs> it, yeah, she retreated, so she's okay. But yeah, these Palisade walls just have not been good enough for Wham. He needs to get a more solid defensive strategy going. He's recouped some of his old villager lead, but it should be like 50 vills now, right? Somehow Louis has just been chilling at 60 vills. I guess he lost quite a few in the counterattack. Um, he lost 10, but I, I feel like Louis almost even stopped training Vils at a certain point, right? Like, he's just quite, chilling. Quite possibly. Um, the interesting thing, though, is, like, he's got the tech free on his food gathering, right? So, like, actually, <laughs> the, the Mulani makes up for a lot more now. And these walls, yep. this is the other scary thing. Like, if there's one thing you get advantage of straight away, and imp, even if you don't get elite statuses, it's torch damage, right? It increases with age. So, like, to your point, these palace walls, the moment your opponent is going up to an imp, you already feel like you're in trouble, right? Because you just don't have these efficient walls that are going to stand the test of time. Now you're just seeing these breakthroughs in like three different locations. And Wham is getting spread thin trying to defend. But what worries me is you're so busy defending. But when are you getting that gold? It looks like he's making a play for it now on the left side. He's gotta. He's gotta. Wait, the red palace is being built with only one bill. Wait. Okay, it's gonna please, be okay. No, no, please. It'll be okay. No. It'll be okay. It, it, I don't know if it will. No. <laughs> oh, a landmark itself will not get... Oh, uh, 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 that's a Nobody lot panic. of villagers. Everything is fine. This is fine. This is fine. Are you sure? Because there's a second wave coming. I, I don't know if this is going to be okay. When what are those Bobby? scouts doing? The scouts are dancing. Wait, they coming. <laughs> Waiting for reinforcements? Disco party in the back line. I'm still not sure this is even going up. It goes up. No, I, I don't think it does. Why not? 
because there's about to be 10 villagers and less because the scouts are now attacking. The second wave's coming. Jean is gone. All hope is gone. Wait, Jean died. Why should Jean <laughs> die again? Funny. I think it, I think it goes up. It goes up. Hey, like I will <laughs> bet. I will bet my 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 top my... dollar. <laughs> Uh, this is no. the slowest <laughs> red palace much. ever. He's got seven villages. It feels like it's taking a lifetime to even get there. Oh yeah, and, and bombards are coming across the map. He lost his eco, like he basically lost the eco lead again. Yeah, the flood uh, is just here. Well, I mean, he never really had an eco lead. Even with twenty more vills, he didn't have upgrades, and okay, he didn't he, have them. He lost the peasant lead. Winston. <laughs> the peasant I think this lead, is over. Yes. He's not even reacting anymore. I mean, wow. The, the problem here is like now the floodgates open, right? Like your food income's not that great. Your arbitrary is slow. They are quite tanky up against the, the scouts, but the scouts aren't looking to fight arbitrary with Gambersons. They're looking to fight poor unarmed villages. Yeah, the arbitrary also don't really counter much here. So their damage output is also kind of low. That's why these fights take so long to resolve is nobody does any damage in these situations, right? Um, except scouts to bills will be good. That will be good. Musafadi to villagers, also good. Louis um, literally just looking at his comms like, what do I build? What goes fast in this game? Yeah. It's I mean, he's so getting the tech, the uh, Farimba. Oh, tech. Farimba leadership. Yep, yep. No, Farima, Farima. Farima, leadership. yeah, Farima There's leadership. There's not a B, and the, the landmark has the B. That's how I remember it. Um, if, if it did, that would be the closest we'd ever get to seeing Farimba in games these days. But yeah. It, <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, it's a solid tech. It'll mean that the... Uh, so if he has Sof on the field, the nearby Musafari will be so fast. And it will really help him run down enemy units like Jean d'Arc, but That's it's not going to matter. Wow. Louis is bloody surgical. Three games in, three points on the board for the Chinese officiata. And I, I'm starting to wonder after that, that was meant to be the strongest point we were seeing in this draft for Wan. He's got one more game to go until a reset. And I've got to say, the remaining picks don't look that spicy for him. And if he's not able to beat Louis with maybe a slight edge, what happens when it's more of a 50-50 draft? Yeah, is he going to be able to beat Biz in English for Louis? I, I feel like if Louis just picks English and Wham doesn't play a perfect game, then I feel like it's just going to come down to execution. Um, and regardless of map, I think Louis's just playing better right now. Um, just saw, like Just up front he's just playing better but on top of that he has gotten some good maps like last game he had a really good map and better sheep luck which that does matter that matters yes. quite a lot it enabled his strategy to be super greedy he, we even you talked about it. he was almost toying with with wham in the feudal age right like i'm not even aging up with urgency because my map and position is so good and i feel like part of that could probably be in wham's head right now um Seeing that map, seeing how like devastating that attack was in your whole economy, you just he just he kind of just got slapped in the face, right? Um, with that with that attack, right? That was just like a backhand, a strong backhand. And it's like it's tough to recover from that mentally, right? It's it can be really hard. Um, so I'm curious to see how Louis handles this matchup, which <laughs> I'm sure you have lots to talk about here. I see you uh doing oh. a, one of these, you know. All right, it's time for, for a KP ramble. This is a very interesting matchup. I wasn't anticipating this to be to be the pick. I thought Louis might lean to Byzantines because I've got to say French versus Japanese, really good matchup for the Japanese. The fast castle build is very difficult to counter just because naturally you get arrow slits in, right? By gathering gold. Nothing really takes you off the path as the Japanese. Those farms make your food eco scale quite nicely in transition. You don't even have to worry about transition though. On a map like this, the amount of sheep, on a bad sheep haul day, you get 15 sheep, it feels like, right? That's plenty for what comes. And got to say, you know, let's say both players rush Castle Age here. You'd think French Knights would be better. Eh. Funnily enough, Mount Samurai feel better because the strongest element of a knight on knight fight is the charge. If you're charging each other, one side has deflective armor. So you're offsetting a, like almost 40 damage hit. Actually, I think it's 40 in Castle Age. Five seconds of the bonus damage buff will give you like an extra five damage every two seconds is not going to negate that difference. So really powerful. And the follow-up play is even more lethal. You give him a heavy dosage of Onomusha with Uma Banamum. It's so bloody difficult actually for the French to overcome that. So wow, you know, a credit to him. I didn't really think about this because I forgot we got like Frizzy Marshes. I thought it might get saved later. Makes a lot of sense. 
I still think Byzantines would have been maybe a more practical choice for Louis. But we have to understand, French has historically been one of the best sieves on Frisian marshes, up there with the likes of Rus and uh, I'd say Mongols in HRE, typically are all the go-to ones. But of the newer sieves, Japan has definitely been looking strong here. And from my discipline, KP, if, if Wham wins this game, they do another draft, correct? That, that, yeah, that we confirmed that. That is how it works. It's like if you go yes. four games in, you then do the draft over again. So Ottoman... Yeah players beware you might still see that come out for some bewildering reason in the series Rus players uh, give it up honestly i think like ottomans for some reason has a chance of getting through the draft but the Rus in particular have been banned um almost like every game it feels like right i think like yeah in fact if i'm not mistaken there are only a few sieves that uh, were not picked or banned yesterday and mm. ottomans was like the only one that I think made it through a ban phase of like the OP ones. So we might still get that coming out. Um, it might be an experimental element that Louis could take. I think the game where Ottomans was allowed through was B, let Louis have it. So I'm not expecting it. What I want to see on a draft reset, if Wham could get us there, some people are like, whoa, don't jump the gun, KP. But I think genuinely this, this like, you know, outside of something wild, this should be a win for the Japanese. On a draft reset, I like that he got Jean. I would love to see him kind of pivot into a Japanese focus again. Like, I think Jean Japan, like, if you do these drafts back to back, Jean Japan should be like the strongest one two punch for Wham. And it would be the way that he gets to a game number seven. Because right now, folks, like, we're looking at a full road of recovery, right? If Louis wins yeah. this, that's it. It's a best of seven. He will be through to the semi finals up against Marine Lord. Yeah. And he's playing like he deserves to be there for sure. But gotta see how Wham is going to pull this back. And I think the redraft is going to be it, right? I think. Like, I bet if Wham could replay Golden Heights with a different Civ or just do something different, uh, I feel like it would go better for him um, because the way that Louis played that was kind of odd. And I think that just caught him by surprise. But, you know, if he could play that matchup again or see some of these games again, maybe he'd think differently about the draft now that he's seen how Louis is playing. For example, how he played Malians there. Like, I think Wham could maybe play differently on JD next time, maybe to try again. Uh, but yeah, this is... Yeah, this is looking rough. Uh, but like you're saying, Japanese against French uh, deflective armor is so solid. It, we've seen Japan played kind of two different ways, right? One is they try to spend as little as time possible in feudal and just get to the castle age. And the other way is they kind of do this really odd play that you're a huge fan of, right? They just get a bunch of units out in feudal and do this big spam with the Kuro storehouse. Um, do you think we'll see that style here? I, I think you just go fast castle Kura storehouse. And the issue is like I've if seen, this was yeah. a Jean pick, you could pressure a bit better and then force them to hang around. It's more difficult for French, and that's bad because like the best thing you can do is force a Japanese player to build spears, right? Every Japanese game or most that I've seen being a loss in this tournament has involved spears. It's just not something they want to go towards. If this was a civil on horseman, you go Onabagisha, easy clap, right? Like you can just beat that bat. But Onabagisha against knights is a, a losing fight. Um, I'm noticing a bunch of people. They remember the cast, Winston. They want a bunch of talk about cock. I don't think we're going to get any any Chamber of Commerce play here. That is definitely the quickest way for Louis to win because this is a cavalry, cavalry matchup. This needs to be a very just strong sock into fishing, into a very fast ramp timing here. Louis, I'm wondering if he has something creative in mind, like a fast castle build after 2TC himself. That might be the, the way I could see this working because if this is just a night spam, it's almost doomed to fail against the Japanese Fast Castle build. But for WAM fans, that's music to their ear. This man could do no wrongs if he wants to make it through to the uh, semifinals and grand finals, potentially. Back up against the wall, we head to Frizzy Marshes, and WAM may have the best draft matchup of the entire series so far. Mm -hmm. One of the advantages of French on this map is that you know where the opponent spawns based on the position of the trade posts right um and that lets you get an advantage with the sheep but wham this time not getting caught he just kind of got lucky he just went the right way wait can we and... can we double, double check rotation as well because i think louis did he do did he circle the back tree line i don't no. know what he did <laughs> I, oh, this it looks like he just that. scouted less yeah i um, think i think he went a little bit deeper if you go back to louis vision you can probably see it he went i think a little bit deeper no, dude, he actually rotated sooner, so that is actually quite wild that Wham somehow 
he just got this? lucky and he's getting lucky still look at the sheep oh it's so tilting when you're watching your opponent collect sheep in front of you in vision and you're sitting there your scout has one or two i have a friend i play against a lot and it's just always the same thing I, it always happens to me and i'm always like come on man just gift me one just give me a sheep i need this oh, i he's, need this it's the other like wild thing i'm yeah. gonna have to I, I i need someone who doesn't have a life uh volunteers please to check this I swear, <laughs> recently, Frisian Marshes, when I've been watching spawns, that South Sacred site in this spawn format always has sheep on the left side. I don't know if I'm imagining it, but like every tournament game I've cast You so are far, going insane. Are you sure? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I have no <laughs> idea. I, I, I have no idea, but this is the here. ramblings of a madman. Like, I swear, <laughs> man, it's always there. It's always happening. I'll it's check gotta in, be happening. I'll check in with my volunteer in their basement where they haven't shaved for three weeks after they've given me like the rundown, but... I legit feel like there we is. We know that you're gonna bias. check right after this cast. We all know that you're talking about you. God no. <laughs> we all know that we're talking about how you're going to spend your afternoon once this is over. Winston, if I want to sit down for an eight-hour gaming session and have six hours of it being loading screens, I'll play GTA. Thanks. Um, I would <laughs> rather see gameplay, and this is gonna be a, a pretty standard kind of gameplay for the Japanese. The other nice thing about this wide rotation. You can be out as long as you want, right? It doesn't punish you because you can just get into Tawada and go on the berries, and it's a great gathering rate. That's another scary thing is look where those berries spawned. For an initial French knight to get around the back here, it's going to take a lot more time. So I love that Wham has rushed those berries first. Yeah, getting getting making use of them early. Some players like to wait for the tech to come through because it's just really meaningful. It makes them actually faster than sheep if you have two techs in castle age and i think even if you have one it's still a really solid resource although there's walk time involved so it's not as solid um yeah m making good use of it like you're saying just he can go to the sheep later once there's knights on the field um so that definitely indicates an fc right um three on gold right now yeah this is probably fc right yeah it, it just has to be uh, i love the, the curse house on the tree line like it, it just makes so much sense there's there's no real imminence for you to be forced to play this age because like if you think about where the gold spawned it's a jackpot for the japanese the best case scenario when you're against these like aggro sieves like mongols french that hit your gold is getting a gold that spawns next to a tree line all he has to do is drop an outpost on the south side of his gold and the entire area for wham is protected yeah, and there was some chatter in the chat about potentially seeing the Chamber of Commerce from Louis, but no, we will not be seeing that landmark. Instead, just the School of Cav. Just keeping it simple with French. Gonna yeah. try and apply pressure. Did, uh... Feel... Is this Wham scouting it for the first time? I think he's about to spot it. That's really good for him if he does see it. Oh, no, he saw it on the front already. Okay. It, it, it's obvious. So like, it's yeah, if, yeah. if Louis went for the... Or trying to, if he went for the Chamber of Commerce, I mean... The only thing commercial about that is the extra ads would be able to play because the series is longer, right? Like, it's it's pretty bad here because you know you're going to be up against Mounted Samurai at, like, nine minutes and you have no contest there, right? Like, you've actually... If you go in this matchup, you go to Chamber of Commerce, you literally just lose Night Warfare because your opponent has over double what you have by, like, 30 minutes. It's, it's really bad. <laughs> the question yep. now, does Louis try to play fishing while he can? It's risky, uh, but, like, what's your alternative? I think you just chill. You have plenty of sheep for now. I think no need to risk it. I think you can go to you can go to fish later once you have a second TC with French, right? Yeah. You can just build it out there, and then and then you're more confident, and then your vills are protected more. Um, I think for now you just stick with the sheep, right? If you go two TC though, right? Like like you'll play as night spam two He's TC. Going forward with vills. Where's he going? Is he going for an out. Post rush? He is. He's going for the outpost rush. Look at the position here. Wants to deny the gold, but there's already <laughs> an outpost. Ah, uh, yeah, that's gonna work. Well, no, hold on. Aerosmith is coming through. That's not gonna go up there, is it? Oh, dude. Like any other sieve, right? Any other sieve this could work against. But we have to remember the Japanese gathering get gold gets stone. stone. Yeah. <laughs> He's gonna build another one. He sees it coming. So he just really doesn't want to let this happen. Oh, he just doesn't want the vills to come through. I'm not sure what oh, he's interesting doing. Interesting short wall there. I. Uh, I guess like, he could wall to the gold, right? And he just didn't. Our slits won't reach the villagers here. Like, I, I'm a bit reach. weirded out by this. I genuinely, like, yeah, there we go. Outpost is coming. He just wanted to guarantee the knight couldn't dive in. He's going to win this race. <laughs> oh, no. This is oh. really bad for Louis. Louis has to dive, and he knows that like, he's going to lead in with a scout to absorb the fire. Scout blocking, though. Dude, that's sick by Wham. Buying a little bit of time. Uh, Villagers going to rush out, and that's going to kill the knight. Surely? No, that was the scout's HP. <laughs> 
Oh, oh my, my gosh, God. the knights get in, and this is disaster. All of a sudden, from rags to riches, Louis just takes a bad situation and makes it great. That dive was really well calculated. Maybe maybe Louis needed to wall the other side, but this outpost is going to go up for Louis. And suddenly, the position for Wham, uh, his gold, excuse me, what FC is he going to do? Oh, my This game God. is going to be over very quickly, unless he just mines through the pain. He has to go for this air slits comes in. For his sake, it was a little bit short. Yeah, he needs uh, 150 whoa, whoa, whoa. gold, but no, then he... there's no knights. Oh my god, no, yeah, but he could go into. No, I'm not, I don't want to say it. <laughs> Spearman and Castellate? No, please. He's gonna a have to Spearman build... comes out. So he's gonna have to build like eight, eight, nine Spearman to clear the outpost. That's his, his only option now. You know what would be sick here? You know what would be the true Sacra Bluey moment? Is if Louis Sacra. now gathers enough stone to fortify the outpost. He's going to. The The gold is going to get shut down. The question is, the question is, how quickly can Wham get Castle? And does he even need Castle at this point? Like, is Castle maybe a mistake? Castle's never a mistake. With the we need to check the arrow slit is done. Are the Vils going down? Four Vils have died. Yeah, a Vil went oh. down. Maybe even another. I'm not sure if we lost three earlier. Uh, remember, it's French, right? So it escalates. He's lost four so far. So yeah, well, yeah, well more that's what because, I mean. I'm just trying yeah. to. Okay, we see the number on the bottom left, right? It's just like. No, I'm just how that many smart, just died. Then I, I calculate all of them across. I don't just look at the UI. Oh, you math it out. <laughs> yeah, beep, I beep, boop, I'm, I'm watching robot. the mini map like with a uh, microscope. <laughs> oh man. Knight's count is kind of scary. Like, wow, yeah. dude, he doesn't want to give up this timing, right? Like, he's got the gold, sure. But here's the thing: this is about <laughs> as naked of a, of a castle age play as, as you could imagine. Like, you get there, but. What do you do with it? You go Zen. Please shut you up. You mass Buddhist monks. <laughs> you build a market and you buy gold and you get Zen Buddhist monks and they slowly trickle in gold and then you shut down the knight play because the knights will deal half damage when they dive. This is that's the no play. <laughs> I'm saying it's big brain. It's big. Bra I'm just saying. I'm just this, saying. This is why no one talks to you in the office. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> It's like, Floating gate. Have, have you guys knew? ever heard Winston's like hour-long um, <laughs> little, little presentations on why Floating Gate is trash and you should be building Zen? I think Floating Gate is way better. The question is, could Zen make have been useful here potentially? Right? Yeah, he just doesn't you know, have it, enough gold for a single monk, so he'd have to build a market to buy it. I, I mean, but it it's going to be an issue with whatever he does. He can't afford anything, so it's sort of like, yeah. what what's his game plan going to be here? He could get to the stone. The stone would enable some gold income. How how the hell do you get to the stone when you can't get to the gold? Well, the spearmen just did it. <laughs> <laughs> they just walked there. They're going to they die if they got spotted, but they it's did like it. It's like they just touched the stone. It's like, woohoo, milestone reached and walked back to base. <laughs> yeah, that's what they did. They're like, okay, guys, it's safe out there. Can guarantee we did not die. Oh, man. The, the knights are threatening to loop <laughs> around the back. I actually can't believe Louis making one of the hardest like counters look trivial right now. I mean, that outpost was godly, right? Like that yeah. was just a really, 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 really heads up play. I didn't think it was going to work initially, but Wham, Wham's response wasn't like picture perfect. It was only slightly perfect. And because of that, it, it just all fell apart. And oh, he could love. put he could put he could put a floating in thing in a forge, right? Yeah, yeah but, Shiro. Yeah, but like that, then you don't have the production, right? And then like then you miss your timing because with one rax, right? Like yes, you want the gold, but now you don't have the production. You'd still get screwed over. You wouldn't get mass together. So I agree with the rax choice here. I he hate that he has market. to do this. This is like yeah, he bought a market in the, the north side. This is like the most depressing yeah. thing you can do with a Japanese castle age build. There. I can't think... Actually, no, sorry. There is one worst thing you can do, and that's building a Temple of Equality. But outside that, Winston, this is the single <laughs> worst thing you can do. Yeah, this is rough. I mean, the archers are coming in now. Ten archers. This relic is certainly going to get spotted. It's a lot of spearmen. Has to wrap yeah, but there's a lot of archers. Oh, he's going to have to dive. threaten the conversion. I, 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 I'm not even sure that's going to work here, though. The, the spearman, spearman would get, get more damage during wait, it. Wait, what? He, he spread wide. Okay. He's going to get through here. I mean, one relic's not too bad, right? That's going to start churning the, the machine. Funnily enough, the knights could still snipe this if they just ran him right now. And I think he realizes that Louis says, that's enough space. See you later. Well, lol. That is Conversion not going comes off. out. 
and fails. I thought for a second there. I thought, I thought that little, you, did you hear me? That was my yeah, heart yeah, leaping yeah, out of my chest. You know what that was? Conversions like, are too stressful. You were looking to just fat shame the center knight, right? Because he body blocked the other two from charging. Like it actually legitimately was absurdly close there. <laughs> that was really close. It was really, really, really close. So now he has to wait, what, another, I think, 40 seconds until he's got another Eurasheer drop, and then he can get that relic home. In the um, forge. Right in the I think it has yeah. to go in the forge. He it just needs to. gold. He has what's to build a forge me, safe, though. But what's scaring me right now, Winston, is like, if this archer mass, it's the thing scaling up, right? And the archers count yeah. all this. So there's a risk that by the time you pick up that relic, the archers are just stuck there. They're, they're displaceable. You can't move them. You bought gold to get the ranged armor. Oh, my God. Yeah, but look at Louis. He's got steel steeled oh, on the way. He's moving out on the move. We're all, we are, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are on the move. This is a game deciding moment. Okay, no, uh, false alarm, false alarm. Everybody back home, back home. We are no longer on the move. I repeat, we are no longer on the move. That could have just been the end of the game right there. This okay. is like when you live in a rundown settlement. You know, that kind of story is like, we need to go out and explore the world, Winston. There's something waiting outside for us. It turns out it's a pack of wolves. The pack of wolves is waiting outside for us. We'll go back to eating sheep every day of our life. He, thankfully, he has a lot of sheep still, right? Mm -hmm. um, Unthankfully, uh, there's a lot of knights. <laughs> oh my god! There's 40 yeah. knights right now. This is this is getting no. a bit worrisome, even for Spears. Keep him alive! Get down, Mr. President. Uh, gets a spear. Gets a knight. Archers are just cutting him out, though. Like, this is the awkward issue, right? Is he, he needs to try and gap close that, but he keeps getting baited to, to brace here. Now, Wham is buying a little bit of time, a little bit of space. Uh -oh. He's too far out. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got big plans. He moved the Vils out. They have moved out. I repeat, oh. they have snuck out. Wait, no. 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 no way. Dude, how does Louis do this? That's called being built different. I think he's just the, like the God Emperor's child at this point. I think is, is the fair way. That's got to be so tilting if you're mad. This is GG. <laughs> That's GG, right? I he mean, can't he afford good, yeah. eight bills. I, I, I don't think that the doesn't go up. goes up. No, no that that's not go even going to work. Archers in the meantime are baiting the entire spear battalion. Wham hasn't oh, even no. noticed. Oh my God. And now he's, I think he's he just knows. reinforcements. He just can't do anything else about it. Like retreating isn't an option in the bills, right? So it's yeah. sort of like... I mean, he has to it. stick the landing. It doesn't go up. The gold is gone. Oh boy, he got his second, another Yoroshiro now. Looks like it just spawned. Um, well, he put it in the TC. Oh no, he's holding one. So okay. one in the TC. He's building a forge, in the, I think, in the north. Yeah, but That'll look, Louis, with thirteen knights, is building. No, gold another too. another barracks. Wait, what? Does he not know that if he put it in the forge, <laughs> he could get gold? Maybe he's just thinking. Maybe it's he, he's too think, deep. He's thinking spear stuff. He's literally just like, yeah, just yeah. Think about like what what really do you get from seventy five gold a minute? Let's be totally real here. Let's not be delusional. You'd get you'd get one more upgrade. He just bought. You can't a bunch even of gold. spam melee tech upgrades because here's another thing: if you don't have gold access, you don't have stone, right? So you get Tatara, and then that's literally it. He can't get Bannerman, right? This is the insanity of blocking that gold. It is. It's really ruined. added up. It's completely destroyed him. He just has to make Spearman to hold. I mean, it's going to be do or die. Then like, that tech up comes out. Like, I, I wish we had a camera on Wham just to see the deflation to, to show you how impactful this is going to be. That arch account already too scary to deal with. I think, like, maybe the one play for Louis actually, now that I think about it, would have been, like, the Nightly So Wham would have been Horseman, but that is it. Tech up through. GG. Turns out the MT stands for most triumphant. That was disgusting and what i mean by disgusting is like what a cap to that series like it felt like in the first three games wham had something to work with like especially in the hre order the dragon game it was like okay like wham wham's getting somewhere here it's game two game one didn't go his way because the matchup looked really rough and his strategy didn't pan out mm -hmm. game two it looks like wham had some momentum going into that it looks like he really had a chance there in the mid and late game to potentially even win that game right then game three and four have to just be so deflating, right? Like game three, he just got slapped. And then in game four, like this was barely even competitive. Wham didn't have any opportunities to do anything. He just, the gold got denied and his game just completely fell apart. That was really, really rough for Wham. But honestly, he played so well in the groups. That's got to feel so bad. But I think that's a testament to what you've been saying. Louis. He's on top of his game. He's got to be feeling on top of the world. This this is a peak player. This is a dominant player. I think this is someone who looks like they are going to 
win tournaments in the future. This is someone who could win this tournament. This is someone who will be contesting our top three. And I think that is a really, really exciting to see. Um, and I, I can't wait to see him play next weekend. So I actually made a bold statement at the start of the day. I even tweeted out proof is there. I said, like, I think if he can do this series all the way to the grand finals, and that's not to discredit Marine Lord. I've just seen him match up against Marine Lord. I've seen him. We saw in the group stage, right? 2-1 victory for him. I've seen him scrum Beastie. Louis MT mm -hmm. is on fire right now. This is, is pristine opportunity for him to make it all the way through to the grand finals. Like, I think... This, this is the best Louis we've seen. And he is actually at level. The only question mark I have is like on a longer series, is he able to compete the draft philosophy? What I've seen here suggests he can, right? It's not a best of nine like the grand finals would be, but best of seven is what he has up next against Marine Lord. Um, another kind of crazy one, like you know, a, mo a moment of recovery for, for the WAM fans. It is commiserations for him. Um, there is no lower bracket. This is it. He's eliminated in this format. Louis continues through. Um, here's a thought though for those people that do support WAM. If you want Wham to look better, I have realized something here, Winston. Louis doesn't have LAN experience, right? Yeah. So what you need, if you're a Wham fan and you want Wham to win to beat Louis, you need a LAN for that to happen. It's a good thing then that if you go across uh, to the Kickstarter set up by EGC and, and Dono, if we reach, I think, 60K collectively, we could get a LAN. So NA fans, Reach in that pocket, throw in $10, $20, go for it, go ham. And we can get a LAN where Wham is the one with the experience advantage because he was at Walla, of course. Louis, he's just a kid fresh out of China. He's yet to experience that on LAN. So, you know, maybe that's the way we resolve this. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, what we're going to do now, guys, uh, a little bit quicker than expected. Kind of glad we had that hour long Order the Dragon HRE game, or this would have been a very quick day. Uh, we've got a little bit of intermission here. I've got someone in mind to talk to you more about the Kickstarter. Maybe let you guys know um, of a few different elements of the show that you can support. We're going to be going for the break time of Pesty. So we're going to get a little break, have some fun with Pesty, and we'll see you soon for the second series of the day. Guys, I have got a little bit of sad news. This is going to be the last halftime with Pesty. This is the last time I'm going to be able to join you guys at halftime. So let's make the best of this nine minutes together. I know, very, very sad. Put my phone on silent. Very sad. I know all the sadness in chat. Next week, I'm going to have a surprise for you guys. That's going to be even better than halftime with Pesty. But now let's bring the hype for Surfshark because it's the last time I'm going to be able to do this and tell you how much I love Surfshark. And it's not just like, it's love. This is what love is. I love Surfshark and I'm going to tell you why. Number one, it minimizes your risk using public Wi-Fi. Boom. Number two, you can access websites when you're traveling. Kaboom. Number three, you can escape price discrimination online. All amazing reasons to use this fantastic VPN, which is the VPN that I genuinely use. Guys, you can probably, um, people in chat will tell you that use Surfshark. It is genuinely an excellent product. Truly, it is the VPN that I use. If you're not using a VPN, you're probably the only one not using a VPN, but I specifically do recommend using Surfshark. This is one of the mo the biggest reasons why you have unlimited devices when you have a subscription with Surfshark. As far as I am aware, it's the only one that does this, the only top tier VPN that does this. I can't guarantee that, but I've looked around and I cannot find another top tier VPN that has unlimited devices. So you can have it on your router, your phone, your other phone, your wife's phone, your gaming laptop and everything. If you wanna get Surfshark, Click on this link in the panel below the screen or exclamation mark VPN and you're going to get an extra three months for free. This is the page that you're going to see. As you see there, three months free and a 30 day money back guarantee. Click on that get Surfshark button and there you're going to see the prices. And it is genuinely exceptionally good value as i'm sure you can all say in chat how shocked you are by these ridiculous prices as cheap as two euros and 19 cents 
a month or whatever your local currency is. And for that, you're getting your VPN, your cookie blocker and everything else as well. You can look at some of those better versions too, uh, if you like, or upgraded versions, still really, really affordable, under three euros a month. And on top of that, you're getting those three months free, a genuinely extremely good price. As you see, even chat saying ridiculously good value. I don't think a top tier VPN has got prices like this. Again, I can't promise you that, but you know, go and check it out for yourself. If you don't like it, they will give you a 30-day money-back guarantee. And they're really known for their excellent customer service. So if you're not really happy with it, you can literally just write to them and let them know that it's not for you. And they'll just instantly give you money back. But I think that's very, very unlikely because it is an extremely uh, good uh, service, a great VPN. I use it myself. Right, guys, we have just got five minutes and 40 seconds together. And then I'm not going to see you for months. I'm not going to see you for months. So I am going to second tell you about the uh, Kickstarter. But in fact, let's do that first. Let's talk about the Kickstarter for a little minute. As you see, we've raised over 6,000 euros. This is all going towards next season's AOE4 esports. Um, none of this goes towards our core costs. This goes towards extra events, extra prize money. Uh, and more production next season. So whatever our existing plans are, this is all going into more. None of it's going into our core operating expenses. Uh, you can take a look if you exclamation mark Kickstarter and you can see the kind of stuff that we're going to do. So we already passed that two and a half thousand euro goal. So we're going to be giving extra prize money for players outside the top 16 and a community map choice for every Esther event. That's really, really important, guys. It's going to help more players come up through the system as we give all that money to outside the top 16 players. If we can get to that 10,000 euro goal, which we're really close to now, we're going to invest all of that money in elevated production for every S tier tournament we do for a year, for a year. So you were talking split screens. We're going to include a host in our production, highlight packages, all that stuff for a year. That is going to cost us a lot more than we are raising. But if you guys can contribute that much uh we will make up the rest if you guys check out that screen on the right hand side you're also going to be able to see some of the things that we're giving away for people that participate so uh you're going to get uh so, you know for example if you're a player backer we're going to show your name on screen uh when your favorite player is paying you know we can't pretend that we're giving away so much in terms of rewards because really this is about asking the community if you want to invest in our next season of Age of Empires for uh, esports. That money is specifically going for that. It's going into stuff that we're going to do next year. So, uh, yeah, do check it out. You, of course, everything's appreciated. Nothing's taken for granted. If you cannot contribute, that's fine. We're still super, super happy to have you guys here. But that that's what it's for. It's just got really a few days left at this point, about a week left. Um, so let's do it. And like I said, we've not been greedy in terms of what we are pledging as our milestones here. Like this is stuff that that's realistically what it costs or even a bit more. And it's all stuff that we're going to do over the whole year. All right, guys, the last three minutes that we've got left. So I'm just going to say this because this I'm for those of you that don't know, because I've not, not really introduced myself. I am the founder of EGC. Um, I am, but there's a great team as well behind it. So you know, I can call them all out. If I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna. If I start listing people, I might miss someone out, which I'm really nervous to do. But I'm gonna say there's just an amazing team of everyone from admins, production, um, uh, dealing with our website, uh, vodka the observer. Everyone doing a fantastic job that we're so grateful for. And finally, I just want to say because I've just got these couple of minutes left, you know. You guys, um, the contributions that you make in stream, this is not me shilling or asking for it anymore, but I just want you to know that when you donate, when you sub, and the mods, thank you to the mods, but when you donate, when you sub, that that is huge for the viability of Age of Empires 4 esports, or at least EGC's viability. Um, you know, it's it's a very challenging ecosystem. We do our best, um, but just so you know, that is often the difference during these events. You guys gifting subs or, or making a donation. If you want to find out how to donate, you can see there's a support tab below. But those 
generally speaking, those gifted subs and donations are the difference between us losing money and breaking even on events. And it makes, I mean, I mean you know, totally straightforward with you guys here that they make a massive, massive difference to our ability to do these events. So I just want you guys to know that, that we are very, very grateful. Every one of you that donates subs. Look, leading by example, Winston's Waffles, who's actually broadcasting himself, is the guy giving out the subs. We no, appreciate not. you so much. But just so you guys know, in all seriousness, that I I'm being, you know, totally straightforward. It is a massive, massive difference maker. And every time I uh, see those uh, donations and gifted sums come through, very, very grateful for it. Thank you very much. ZZ put to bed as well, coming through with the tier one. All right, guys, 40 seconds left. We're about done. Liquid695, thank you very much for the five gifted subs supporting Age of Empires for Esports. Dare Sadin, thank you very much for the 10 gifted subs supporting EGC's AOE for Esports. Appreciate you all very much. You've got 25 seconds left if you want to be called out. Zertan coming in. Buddy, please coming in. Appreciate you all genuinely. Never taken for granted here. All right. We are just about done. Type error does come dubs coming in with a how many was that? Holy 50! 50 gifted subs. I've got five seconds left. That's me going, guys. Thank you very much for the 50 gifted subs. Type over dubs. Appreciate you. Bye. Did you hear that? We cut him off the end. He said, You buy, you buy Surfshock as well. Get in there. Use that code. You've only got a week and a bit left. Hurry up. Make sure you're supporting that. Appreciate all the support coming through. Amazing job, all of you getting those Prime subs in. Um, you know, like, he uh, doesn't want me to tell you this, but did you know, Winston, like, after the after the show on those segments, Pessy said to me, it's like, it like a curling your hair moment. It's like, I really like it when they just all, like, give the gifted subs when I'm on screen. So you definitely uh, make his day with I that. I mean, he's got the face that sells, right? You know, compared to us over here, we've got the face for radio, right? Um Pesty's Pesty's got <laughs> Pesty's got it working out over there, right? Is that um, why earlier you just had your forehead showing? <laughs> I didn't know. Sorry, I so my desk can go like up and down. Mm -hmm. And so I switch between standing and sitting, and sometimes I just don't go all the way down. So like watch. I could just slowly disappear. Bye. All right, now that Winston's not here, I need to tell you guys something about. I'm coming oh, back. Oh wait, he's I'm coming. Oh, yeah, yeah, back, he's back. We're coming back. We're coming back. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get back to focus on the games because we have one series down, and boy, was it a quick one. If you thought the the Louis B series was one sided, you just missed out on an absolute blitzer. Wham! Essentially, just getting out played and then out drafted as the series went on. Didn't even get to that reset. Remember these best of sevens. If you clear the fourth game, there will be a draft reset and we will run it again. But next up, we've got another Canadian. There's still NA pride on the line. We've got one Chinese person. We've got two Europeans. And now we've got a third trying to make it into the final four. Can NA keep their dream alive? That is what we're here to find out. Puppy Paw versus Vortex. An interesting matchup, actually. Because I think this is, if I'm not mistaken, this is one of the matchups where um, Vortex historically done quite well but in recent um times at least puppy has been able to start striking back and gotta say winston you know we talked up wham we talked about how amazing his build orders and execution has been his bro hasn't been far behind him in that regard and i think something i'd say about puppy paws it looks like he's a little bit more sharp in the late game shall we say i feel like we've, we've seen more late game examples where puppy paw has been able to get an edge against some of these best yeah, I can see that. I can see that. I think it's important to remember that Puppy Paw and Wham, they they were waiting at this stage of the bracket, right? Like, they they did so well in the groups that they are here waiting for these challengers to come through and try and beat them in the playoffs, right? So I think it's a really important thing that these players are the favorite. Um, we just saw an upset with Louis and, and Wham, but now Puppy Paw and Vortex, we'll see if Vortex can do it. I mean, Vortex historically probably considered a slightly better player than Puppy, but not by a lot, right? We're talking very close seedings in my like personal view of how these players rank against each other. Um, so I think this game could be fireworks. I'm hoping it's not another 4-0. I predict it won't be another 4-0 personally. Um, we have a similar map set, but not exactly. Look, you see Cliffside side sneaking into this draft, although a lot of players did not prefer it. Vortex, maybe he Ooh. practiced something over the past week on this map. Um, had, we're seeing the uh... usual bans, although Puppy risked so... Ottomans. 
I yeah, mean, Vortex, so, Vortex rests no, Ottomans. No, Vortex rests Ottomans. They do this all the time. Um, they, they're convinced they have the answer to it. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of an interesting one. Like, I like the dynamic of it, because if you bait your opponent to go for Ottomans, then you can get your hands on the Ayabids plus the Mongols. That makes sense. Think about Vortex as a player. Think about his playstyle. It's all about aggro. This doesn't surprise me what's seeing out Puppy Paul. This is a story of attack and defend. His entire draft, it has a few aggro sieves, but the backbone of it with things like China and Byzantines is more leaning on this idea that Vortex will attack me and I need to survive. And it really does fit, actually, for Puppy Paul. Um, He's the Chinese king. He has five wins, no losses. He's by far the most successful Chinese player in this entire tournament. On top of that, the Byzantines fit that turtle style. Only one person has uh, more games played and more wins than him with the Byzantines, and that's his bro that we just saw eliminated. So really fits this kind of philosophy of how they want to play the game. That said, Ram didn't draft Biz, and now Puppy Paw drafted it really late, alongside a last pick Malian. So yep. that's coming in late for those maybe... More hotly contested sieves, but but that's prioritizing the order the dragon too. Interesting. Yeah, order of the dragon is a little bit surprising. Um, but then again, like it makes sense. I think Vortex had pick first, right? HRE. We already seen it gets hard counted by OOTD. Makes a lot of sense. I am just gonna stick it out there because I've had enough of this crap. The amount of times where I was like, order the dragon aren't quite there yet, and then I just had people in my streams like, yeah, but Vortex made like a tier list, and he said OOTD are like S tier. Vortex still has yet to pick Order of the Dragon in this entire tournament. Just, just going to slide that one out there for you. The closest we saw was when his bro picked it uh, yesterday against him. So, you know, once again, someone else gets their hands on that pick. And he's not really coveting it like it's a high value one. Um, layer phase, though, mm -hmm. Abbas is coming out. I've said this before, set again. I think Abbas is, like, they, they kind of look underwhelming in a lot of ways. But in tournament play, they're not too bad. And I think a big part of why is that the Abbas is, they are a good flexi pick if you kind of flesh the draft out deep enough. I'm just going to say now, I don't think Abbasids are going to be a, a super hot pick in this tournament format because of that bracket reset. If you were talking yeah. about a full draft where you could go the distance and you're down to your three final sieves, that's where Abbasids make sense. But remember, folks, the way this works, best of sevens, when we get to game four, when game four completes, we do this entire draft again. Yeah. It's... That, that, and that's a very important thing to know, right? So, like, yeah. these later picks might not get used. I think, generally, we don't see them get used. Um, we just see the players probably to use their early picks. Oh, where have we seen this before? I, oh, yeah. Was, yeah Last I, series. I, the same map, the same matchup, but this time, the Canadian brother is on the other side of things with the Ubits, yeah. right? Which, which is good for NA. Like, I was about to say, I was, I was it's really I was trying to get in there in time to say, I really hope Vortex doesn't do it. Um, this is a tough match up like we already win for it we'll once see, i feel like there's just creative ways to play it and i know this is gonna sound crazy but i think you just don't make the dark age spearmen i think they just don't do yep. enough or if you do you try and fake it like you build the barracks but maybe you just don't do it and you just try and click up i, I don't know if it's a good idea <laughs> to do that <laughs> but like clearly we've seen this the opening for mongols just get so hard countered and get so little value that i just don't see how you can in good conscience, continually commit to it. Maybe we're going to see a different map, right? We saw before um, with Louis that his map was just too good. It had the golds on the side, and so he could just retreat to the other gold mine, and the rotation was too long. So maybe in this game, Puppy will have to deal with um, worse gold mines, in which case the Vortex's game plan could work. Um, so we'll see. So if you're not familiar, the plan is just Spearman and Tower Rush, right? It's the, yeah. the very common Mongol opening. Um, but Ubid seem to have an, a, a strong enough and solid enough opening that just can't really be hindered by the Mongol start. So we'll see if that happens this game. I'm not sure. Maybe Vortex has a plan. I don't know. So I, I still believe work, you know? like I still believe Deerstone could be the way out, especially if you're trying to go all in the timing. The only alternative right. is you spam Keshik straight away and you try to deny. Yeah. But actually, I think Keshik is kind of a bait. So people don't hunger like to hear this, but like. If it's Desert Raider, Horseman makes a lot more sense to begin with because Horsemen get bonus damage against the Desert Raider, right? So it's actually mm -hmm. more cost-efficient trading than relying solely on Keshix because some of the IB players have started doing when they see Keshix spam coming out, they add in a stable and then they start pumping out Desert Raiders. And Desert Raiders have phenomenal mm -hmm. flexibility in that comp because remember, you can produce them out of the archery range or the stables, right? So yeah. the other annoying thing about Desert Raiders opening up to counter Cav for the Mongols is unless you now go in and scout their base, which means you're not with the Keshiks often, you don't know whether it's archers or horsemen that can layer this in, right? That's really annoying because it means that you can usually find yourself a step behind the comp. 
One thing I do want to highlight about the rest of this draft, though, surprising the way that, that Delhi got prioritized while Japanese was still in. There's a very big deviation here between like Vortex and Lucifer often. Um, one thing to know is that usually when there's Holy Island in, they prioritize getting the Delhi and the Japanese by offering up something like Ottomans early. That's a big change. The fact that Vortex still banned the Ottomans in the second phase is something in the group stage that Lucifer and Vortex both didn't do. They kept allowing it so that they could get the Japanese Delhi combo. It's less desirable when you don't have the flexi of Holy Island because the idea is Delhi is countered by Japanese. So you pick it to have Japanese on Holy Island, but then you have Delhi for an earlier map. We don't have that situation here. I will still say, however, Japan can work quite well against some things like HRE. But one thing that is worrisome, I think, when anyone sees it in the draft right now, Winston, is that English pick. That is the lowest, worst performing Civ in the entire tournament. They have like a 27% win rate. But a moment of hope here. There is one player that has never, uh, sorry, two players that have never lost with the English in this entire tournament. Those are Beastie and Vortex. They both have three wins each. So if anyone can make this absolute pile of trash work, it's Vortex. Yeah, Vortex has had a really solid English for years at this point, right? He's just had a really consistent game plan. Um, he just macros really solid and and really, really good positioning um, and really solid defense against Cav um, with good use of like Spearman Archer, right? Or Spearman Long, sorry. So I think if he does pick English, he doesn't have to, but he might. Like, I don't think he wants to pick, like, a Bassett over English on any map, right? Maybe. Um, maybe Zushi, five. maybe. I could see maps where Zushi would be prefer preferred. But yeah. I think English are probably pretty solid mm. against a lot of these Sivs from Puppy. It's I think probably... there's just some risky matchups there, right? Like, yeah. probably it... don't want it against japan right maybe english for golden heights i feel like the draft for him is likely going to be mongols delhi english and then probably yeah. hre like it's kind of weird actually a lot of these players are just drafting the farms you picked like a whatever but poppy yeah, there's more flexi don't... there yeah. yeah so like i think the reason you pick english for golden heights is because there's mullions on the other side it's interesting the way that poppy Four banned that away and then left it to the very last this is a popular strategy if you basically ban something early and you don't pick it until the very end because then you can assess has my opponent addressed it like, you know, is right. it a free pick? And there was never a risk of them taking it along the way. I've seen some players do this where, like, the, the first proper ban, I say proper ban because recent Ottomans in every game, you literally just pick something that you're not going to take yourself until the bitter end of the draft because you have that flexibility of choice. Um, but I believe we are ready to go. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting draft. Yeah. I do think the Puppy Pool made a bit better use of the final phase there, getting the counter to the English, getting the Byzantines, but we aren't there yet. We're in the game one of this best of seven to decide who is going to meet up against Beastie Cutie in the semifinals. We kick it off with Puppy Paw on the Ibids and Vortex on his signature Mongols. Oh, that gold is really safe. <laughs> it's next to the berries as well, though. But so, like... it is easier to get to. Like, you, yeah, you yeah. could... A tower there is possible. And the, the gold on the north is really far away, whereas the gold in the south is also kind of tricky. Uh, not that gold, the, the gold south of uh, Puppy's base. Like, it's going to be hard to... Yeah, that one. It's going to be hard to move oh, out onto those compared that... to what we saw earlier. So it's there's potential here for the, the early aggression to work. I that backside is juicy, though. Like, like can, can you just have a look at that backside quickly? Because you've got the cool. berries, deer, gold. And think about how easily you can wall this because you've got both your tree lanes on the east side. There's some weird dynamics here where, like, I, I agree there's a way that the Mongols can hit the outpost but they then need to keep the pressure up to keep Puppy Paw underneath the TC. Otherwise, this is still quite a free Ayabit game. Barracks forward, yeah. So Vortex is going to commit. I mean, I th it's it's what you'd expect, right? I was kind of memeing, memeing before when I said, like, maybe you don't do it, but it's just such... It's so bread and butter, right? I just don't even know. Is that gold mine in range of the TC? I don't even think you could torch that. No, it, it's, it's out of range. Are right? you sure you can uh, torch? Yeah, I guess you can yeah. torch that, yeah. His, if he didn't put the House of Wisdom there, he could have staggered it closer, but then that makes yeah. him kind of inefficient on the God Gathering, right? Um, yeah, but then you'd completely deny any risk to getting torched, which means you don't even have to, like, risk a repair bill. Remember what we saw yeah. last the, time? The interesting thing about this, by the way, is, like, if this wasn't Mongols, if this was another Civ doing this type of play to deny the Ibids, you might just GG the game at, at like, seven minutes against Ibids, right? Because you've just plopped the play. They don't expect it. When they discover the outpost, they now have to waste time reacting. I think the unfortunate reality of like Mongols in this matchup as well is the required play, that critical hit in the early game, is going to happen, right? Like you just said it there. 
I was memeing, you have to do a Rax Rush, right? So it's like, if you're on the other side and you're the Ibi player, you know this is coming. You can anticipate it and react accordingly. Yeah, I think that's kind of the weakness. And he just pre-deletes it. Yeah, that's super smart. Man, Puppy's... Puppy's got some go. plans here, man. <laughs> this is this is hot. I think I think this is interesting. Yeah, because like, now what are you tower rushing? He says, look, my strategy doesn't even need gold. That is ballsy to say, but I, I really like it. He can go back to the gold later, right? It's just 50 wood um, to rebuild, and it just denies any threat of the pressure. And now this vill's just been idle, and I guess the... The risk here is that he's able to build the outpost on the berries, right? Yeah, but he's not um, going for it, which is worrisome to me. He doesn't uh, have the con here. The con's at home. He's going to see that what? it's denied. He might move. I think he's going to move it forward up, right? He's Surely. got time. If he cancels it right now, but if he waits any longer, like, it's it's just done, right? Like, you can still late. actually block out two berries here. You might actually be able to skirt that backline berries, right, when they're running on the south side. But because of the mill's location, they shouldn't be having that behavior often. So, yeah, kind yeah. of a bit unfortunate. Um, and I guess you're happy if you're Vortex, right? Just the threat of your Civ at this point, it has, he deleted a mining camp and he's off of gold entirely. Mm -hmm. That means you know that if you play correctly behind this, if you're Vortex, then you could potentially be in a good spot, right? Yeah. And you know what kind of worries me is like right now, this matchup is already very Iobid favored, heavily Iobid favored. There's a patch coming soon, right? Where the Mongols timing on their initial spearman is going to get nerfed. <laughs> if they already struggle to do enough damage with this... What happens then? Like, I'm curious. I got this funny feeling that Mongols right now are a first or second pick priority, right? For most players. I actually think in some cases they're going to be rele uh, relegated to third pick after that change. And this is the big part of why. Like, as I said, this build already struggles. So what happens yeah. when you have to delay it by an extra 20 seconds, 30 seconds? I feel like the problem for Mongols right now, at least against in, in a tournament draft, right? Like where you know what's going on and people are playing optimal builds only, right? They're not memeing like i said like they're not doing cheesy weird stuff because they don't want to take unnecessary risks right um here they're not yumi onlying what yeah they're not doing like crazy builds just to like try stuff here they're doing the tried and true and that's where like this mongol build is just so predictable that i think it's a problem for them right like i think you could maybe look at it and say is it good is it a really high draft pick when their only strategy is this predictable you could maybe question it, but I think there's a reason it's predictable and there's a reason it's still valued is because it's effective. Um, so even here, like, Vort, like Puppy has had to adapt, right? Like, he isn't able to play the game that he wants to play just because. He, like, he doesn't have a mining camp. He deleted a mining. Like, that's not, like, great for Puppy right now. He's he's not going to be getting wheelbarrow. He's not going to be getting, like, early food, horticulture, or, like, wood chopping, right? Like, it's it's a little painful. So what you're saying is we need to auto-invite Donai to the playoffs for some wild builds. I mean, it could be cool, but I, <laughs> I don't know if innovation is going to come, though, with... I don't think it's a player thing. I think it's just, like, the nature of the way the Mongols are played right now, right? Like, yeah, it's like... The, the weird thing about the map pool is it makes Mongols seem desirable, but the fact that Iobids are just, like, such a good tempo sieve, generically, and a perfect counter Mongols makes it very difficult when you see Mongols ending this tournament, at least the playoffs phase, with a, a high degree of success. And this is why, this opening right here, right? You start the Desert Raider, you add in the horse, you add in the archers. Vortex, if he opens with Keshik now, his life is already hard because of that Desert Raider effect. That aura is going to mitigate a lot of his impact when he has to fight. And it's going to yeah. stable. And Vortex's main goal is just a little out of the range of the TC. <laughs> Sometimes building your... He's not noticed. Wait, Vortex? Oh, no. No, dude. no, not like this. I've seen games like this from, from Vortex Winston. The, the ones that just make you tilt, and this this has to be one of those games when he realizes that he Three just lost bells. four villages to a free unit. He is going to be livid. Four vills, man. What? Wait, what? Three, <laughs> wait, what? Attack! That was okay, the most three unnecessary bills. ranged mode activation ever. <laughs> and meanwhile, on the front, the spearmen are getting pushed back. It looks like that's what Vortex's focus was on, but look at that. Three Vils Town Mongols already starting a Vil down because they have to move the town center so they idle the TC. So a four Vil lead for Puppy Paw. Nothing could be more comfortable than this. That is the most value I've ever seen out of that starting unit <laughs> for the reinforcement. Like, I've never seen a kill three Vils for free like that. Um, man, Vortex has got to be mad about that one. And as we should be all. Like, that just feels so bad. Just think about the add on effect here as well, Winston. The timings now screw him because the caches have come out, but 
guess what? Replacement Desert Raider coming with the main army. So now you've got this cash because you can't fight yet. You have to delay yourself further. You just got idled on the gold after losing almost all your gold workers. So your scalability in the Keshix has been kind of hampered. And I love this pivot by Poppy Poi. He's like, okay, that went better than expected. Let me get so a few he's pokey sticks. Units. Yeah, yeah he's, <laughs> he's just making units now. So now it's a 1-1-1 one, one, one build for him. And the value camels are just so good against the Keshix, right? You just deny, you reduce their damage by 20% just by having one in your army, which is like, that's a huge, you're just up like an upgrade and a half, basically. It's, it's just massive. This is a really good position for Puppy. It's up to him to figure out how to close this, though, without accidentally throwing. The Mongols can turtle in a really sm small area. So he's going to have to figure this out. But I don't think they, the Silver Tree is ever going to get value. That's the thing, right? They can turtle in a small area. They don't use the Silver Tree. At which point, you've built a landmark, but you wonder why, right? Like, it has no presence, no value. Puppy Paul just has full agency here. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if he does try some crazy kind of 10-minute feudal aggro. Because of the lead he's now a ram. He's, he's adding yeah. a ram. <laughs> it's really smart. He's actually smuggling it to the back side, right? Yeah, it's to deal with the back uh, side of his base. So outpost mm -hmm. can be taken out so you can reclaim the gold. This is now Poppy Paw saying, I don't want to go for the all-in. I actually just want to play for my castle. The thought I'm having, though, Winston, is when Vortex sees that outpost being taken out, surely his thought process is going to be, I need to rush this. He's going castle. What if this is just a bait? By getting rid of that outpost, you're looking like you're being greedy. I think he is being greedy. He stopped making units. He doesn't right? have gold right now. Oh, yeah. no, no, no. He, he, queued, he queued him. No, no, like, I mean, he, yeah, it'd be a bit gold. early to idle, but you don't know. He could just put every vill on gold and then click, click, click up. But that'd be crazy. Well, here's he the could thing. maybe do the cheaper age up too. Yeah, but here's the thing, though. You have options, right? Like, you think it's yeah. the tech up when you see someone take that gold back. But it's You not need something else. Risk. Yeah, yeah like, but, but you need something else if you play long feudal wisdom. You need gold for blacksmith upgrades. It's like, this doesn't fully reveal to Vortex what Puppy Paw is doing yet. This ram taking out the outpost could be either a prolonged feudal still is or that gradual castle. That's five spearmen. Before we saw four and they weren't upgraded and it was close. This is uh, five vet spears. Yeah, you, like, like a little bit cumbersome. Puppy Paw just throwing away spearmen kind of unnecessary here. Oh. Uh, it's going to get a Whoa. reasonable fight here, though. Desert Raid is not being targeted. What? Uh, what? The, no, this is the worst way to fight the Desert Raider. Is not being targeted at all. So actually, this is a decent trade for Puppy Pool. Finally, archers do arrive, and that's going to turn it around in favor of Vortex now. But a lot of Keshik's going down there. And the tower gets taken out as well. Still with a 5 ill lead. And there's horsemen on the silver tree. So that's never going to make a trader, right? Like, that just won't make a trader for... It's unlikely. ...several minutes, right? It's just the threat, which is kind of nice. It forces, like... What, what is good for Vortex here is it's going to force units to be near the different trade posts. It's going to force maybe a couple units to camp it, right? Because the threat of a couple traders is there, right? Yeah. Just a few could swing the game so, if so they get good trade us off. Here's trade the thing, off. though, Winston. Like, that, that fight in the center, I think it really screwed Vortex's timing because he rushed with the Kashyyyks, right? Like, if he waited for those archers, he has two extra Kashyyyks. He's at a point where he can start diving the base. Poppy Poor is now going for that tech timing. He's rushing on the gold. He's got full access. And you may notice he's got long-term food access because he walled that backside. So now if you're Vortex, like what is your thought process? Do you now try to match a tech timing where you know you'll be discounted? Or do you now have to go all in? Because you sure as hell aren't going to be scaling trade, right? Right. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you do. <laughs> I don't know what you do when you're down three bills from the start. Like, I... I feel like all bets are off. All of your calculations about timings are wrong. You have to feel this out just intuitively, right? Because at this point, that those three villas would have gathered what, like a thousand more red. Like, like maybe not a thousand, but like close to at this point, right? Like all of your assumptions about the timings are off when you make a mistake that big in the early game, right? So it's sort of like as a player, what Vortex needs to do is feel a lot more rather than rely on his intuition. And I think that's scary to be in a tournament right game one yeah. a lot's on the line here he does have a larger army and it he's looks like puppy's gonna go for the click right now yeah but what's worrying me is like vortex isn't using that army right like it it feels like you have to wait yeah. for the tech up and the moment that comes you need to pounce what i'm curious about like puppy pool vortex doesn't have that many keshiks right if puppy pool drops like double racks on top of his current one and spams gulams he will have the necessary troops to defend this 
Yeah, we'll see. It's going to be tight. So what landmarks coming through? It's villagers growth. Yeah, it looks it's like growth. Probably growth. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. No reason We've to go. We've seen this build a lot. It's kind of insane. Um, he yeah. has clicked some of the berries already, so I hope he leaves them around. That's a lot of extra safe food. Then again, he's got the full corner worth of food, so it probably doesn't feel like that's the the biggest oh, detail. Oh, he doesn't on. even kill that, Phil. No, no, come on. <laughs> 2 HP to dream, baby. <laughs> what, I love, like, what I love from Papa Boy is like, the guy's like, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not feeling well. Can I go home? No, you work he does. until you die. He gets sent home. <laughs> they, they, they're they getting the, the retirement treatment. Look, they, they just got le they left. Look, they're walking we, across the TC now. They're he was sent south. back onto the factory. There is, a yeah. <laughs> to the wood like, line with you. <laughs> to the for Go forward to the enemy. <laughs> when you're so close to death, if you get a splinter, you'll die, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, probably not good to be working around people flailing axes, but that's his life now. Or falling trees. All right, so here's the push. The age up isn't in yet. No, but the army is scaling, right? Like, Puppet is investing actively a little bit. Not that much. Quite greedy. Horseman. I'm going to go for exchange. Uh, where is the desert raider right now? It's right Just... in the middle. Okay, right oh middle. yeah, he's in there. There we go. I need to squint a little. So that aura is not being sniped out. Like, this is very problematic. The archers are targeting the horsemen. Vortex actually attacking the unit that is hardest to kill here. We got a ram dance. <laughs> don't, we got don't a ram dance. Don't Attention, please. 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 Attention, please. <laughs> Everybody wiggle. Yeah. Hey, sorry, focusing on the game, though. <laughs> the, I, I mean, uh, this, this is not enough, this though. Is the game. Yeah, this, this is isn't really enough, enough to deal permanent damage. The tower might go down, but the Egypt here, the villagers are running forward. Ooh. Wait, what? He had the rally point forward because that's where Desert Raiders go as well. So he had the Desert Raider spawning out into the front of the fight. Now the villagers have to eco lead though. Like this is actually absurd just how far ahead he is. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge lead. It could have been a little bit bigger because he did just lose four villagers in this attack. And that he's going to help neutralize some of that earlier advantage. But now that the growth wing is in, now that we see some upgrades or seeing some Lancers being added. Yeah. It's... Well, no, that's Desert Raiders, right? More no, he's got Camel Lancers. Camel Lancers oh, those are coming. Camel Lancers. Yeah, this okay, yeah, the icons are similar. Imagine like going cast stage like, yeah, oh, there's the Desert Raider. Raiders. Okay, yeah, the yeah, three yeah. Desert Raiders going to come out. Camel Lancers are coming. Oh, um, the Khan and a Keshek are going to spot this rotation. The Vil on the gold. This Keshek won't be just enough. There's no wheelbarrow. He'll get one or two kills. Camel what? Lancers are on the way, though. Wait, what, He's what, getting raided everywhere. Four? He's not paying attention. Four oh, more Vils are going to go down. Karma, a five and all things. <laughs> Oh balance God. in all things still with a six villager lead but it's dwindling quickly with these raids vortex has been positioning really nicely here and maybe he rode off this attack a little too soon puppy did not train a ton of units during his time going up and now he's maybe paying the price for that a bit he, he will doesn't... finally get the cleanup here though yeah but he doesn't even have veterancy on the way so like actually vortex is still going to trade okay -ish here it's still going to be a loss right due to the camel answers eh. but because there's yeah. no archer upgrades coming in, that's at least a soft underbelly you can target. The crazy part about this, though, is, you know, like, thinking back that's to that fight where Vortex kept some troops alive at the tail end, what? imagine how different this game would look if he hit the horse. What? what? 13 vil kills? Are you kidding me? This game is flipping. This this is turning on its head. Now, now, now hold on, Winston. He needs another Vortex two raids like that. Yeah, he, Another he's raid or two. Yeah, but he's building traders, makes though. enough... He's actually building traders now. So th this is the good news. Like, Vortex like, whew, deep breaths, woosah, woosah. But this is also the part where most Mongol players trip up. Because by building traders, you now give a target for camel lances. So it's not just that you're losing your ego, you're investing in an extra unit. So instead of building more cash to contest this or spearmen, you're just throwing more into eco that's going to die. So the next two minutes are critical. If Vortex can find a way to mirror and block these lancer raids, after that chip damage, he's back in it. But these next two minutes are critical. Yeah, it's really important for Vortex to find a strategy here that will work long term against the Castle Age opponent. And that's probably going to be try and split the map, play wide and try and get raids in here. Taking big fights in the center when you're down in tech is just not going to work. These Lancers are way too strong that the Keshiks oh, find their way onto the back line, trying to reciprocate some of that damage. But they're going to get chased away by the numbers here. Puppy Paws army is just so large now. Dervish is on the map as well, so the relics are going to start coming in for him. Puppy's position is looking really, really solid, even though the Vill advantage has been completely neutralized. 
By it's Vortex. the detail though. Like it's the detail of the uh, of the army quality now, right? Like yeah, the only upside Vortex has is he built a blacksmith. Poppy Poor is missing that. That should be coming through in the next minute or two. He's already gone into dervishes, and yeah, there it is. Under mesh now on the way. This is incredibly difficult. But this is always the downfall of Mongol oh. players. It's like the moment you have to retreat is the moment you've lost in this matchup. And that's what yeah. Vortex done. He shied away, right? Like he got great raids. But then he tried to turn it into a macro game over delay. This is where Camel Lancers tend to win 9 out of 10 games. Yeah, especially when you're strung for trade like this, where he has to defend so many spots on the map, and he's just exposed everywhere, right? It's generally why this early game trade can be so risky against mobile opponents, right? And yeah, this the trade's completely shut down, right? There will be no more value from that. Yeah, it's getting no a little raid on the backside. Um, four villagers can be chipped, Puffy? but... I Okay, he notices this time. He'll move away. Yeah. Uh, Only luckily for down. him, though, this is actually better because they're chasing the, the two remaining instead of going after all the berry gathering right now. Which would make That's a lot of bills. <laughs> <Yep>. Yeah. <laughs> Counterattack, though. Another traitor goes down. So, tit for tat, as they say. And Lance is going to clear this up now. It's so annoying when a Lancer arrives because, like, your, your timing on killing a villager with Keshik gets skewed, right? Slower, yeah. Damage reduction. Less damage. So it's going to be a pushback for the time being, but this is natural flow, right? Like, Puppet Bull's goal now is to raid, 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 pick relics. And the first relic is already on the way home. The Ram has given up his pursuit in art and dancing, and he's committed back to war. He's like got a real father, job. Like his father always wanted. <laughs> and to the Ubu he goes. That could be really annoying if he doesn't deal with it. Oh, no, he does. He does deal with it. He's okay. like, Dad, I'm taking up Impressionist art. It's like, you got to pay your bills, son. All right, back to soldiering. Lance, in the meantime, just able to keep those catch essentially just kind of invalidated. Um, Archer count is still favoring Vortex. Like, that's the upside. Puppy Paul, he's got a bunch of archers count, like camping the gold right now. So it means, like, Vortex maybe could take a matter. fight, but it's irrelevant details it's here. Vet, Finally, that archers upgrades yeah. are in. Yeah, he gives it, it over. That's too much. Too much. Man, that looked like if so those messy. three Vils hadn't died at the start of the game. Mm -hmm. I feel like we would have maybe had a different opinion about this matchup based on how Vortex was playing that few but, but it's But it has to be an outplay. Like, I think that's the reality of what we're seeing. Like, the fact True. that Vortex made it look that close, like, he was outplaying raids, which it, it fits. Vortex's style is aggression, aggression, aggression. It's why he always prioritizes Mongols. Like, out of all the players, I think he, like, prioritizes Mongols more than anyone else because the essence of Mongols is in attack. Like, it, it's, it's kind of funny. Like, you know when you've got that situation where you have no choice but to go forward? It's that type of sieve, right? Like, if you have yeah. to defend, you've already lost. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to keep that aggro up. And that mm -hmm. Ibid Mongol win right now is just rocketing in favor of the camels. Yeah, it's been looking really, really solid. I, I'm a believer now. I, that matchup is hard. <laughs> I You're... feel like you have to draft around it now that I think about it. And you can see Puppy, I think... I think that was just a solid draft, draft choice. Like, he just, he had the plan and he executed on it, right? Vortex banned Mongols and Puppy let Mongols through and Vortex prioritized it, right? Puppy got the matchup he wanted, it looks like, and he's going to be happy with that. And Vortex immediately going for English against Japan. Okay. That is spicy. This, I actually think, is, like, not a bad matchup for the English. Well, it depends uh, on the map. It definitely depends. We still on the map. don't know which map it is. Like, wait, I, I thought the maps draft first. No, <laughs> we should know the map. Well, heads there. Okay. <laughs> oh, All right, fuck. I take back. Like, 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 you know what? Yeah, definitely a good matchup for the English then, right? Like, Golden Heights yeah. is a really good map. The Japanese don't actually have a play until they're feudal, but Shinobi time. Do you really ever, ever in the history of ninjuring want to build Shinobi against Lombos? No. Correct answer, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, still, is it Shinobi time? I really hope it's not. Am I the one that finds it weird? Like, longbows are more effective against Shinobi than archers. Like, you'd think someone shooting from a further distance, a ninja would have more time to, like, dodge. Oh, like, dodge. Like, get yeah. out of the way real quick. Yeah, nah. You'd think so, but that's not how game logic works. No. Nah. And uh, unfortunately, this matchup on water hybrids usually do favor Japanese, but you have to remember it got a lot harder. There was a, an interesting change made, right? Where now the Shinobi don't come out Slower. quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if this is like, this might just be a feudal rush from both players, right? Like, because if you do, there is one play actually for the English that works really well here. If you do find that the Shinobi rush is coming in, and okay, I've just remembered the game. What you do 
is you run out as Vortex, you build a dock, and then you hold wood for an outpost. And you wait until the Japanese player tacks. And as soon as he tacks, you build the outpost. Mm -hmm. Because then, like, if he's built, he's got Shinobi, he can't get away from Shinobi. And if you have one outpost, Shinobi can't, like, dive you, right? They come in, they sabotage. Mm -hmm. You garrison, hit them, then you come out, repair again, right? And then you just rinse and repeat. I can't remember who it was I saw Vortex do this exact build against, but it completely destroyed them. Like, it ruined their game because at that stage, they just looked and they're like, if I could go back and choose a Kurus house, I would because now I literally have the most wasted landmark in the game. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to be Kurus house. People, I think the, the nerf to the Shinobi landmark kind of killed the, the, uh, the viability in competitive play, at least, on a lot of the hybrid maps um for sure um so we'll see we'll see minute left to go hmm. so, do you think do you send a lot of vills forward as english you, here you send, just to control send three it's three or four three it's three yeah, yeah that's what three, i figured three is the optimal um you don't build a racks like building men at arms is the quickest way to lose this matchup like is the worst choice you can make because your opponent will just get shinobi and shinobi win um this mm -hmm. I think you can do the free villager pool though. Like there's not much Puppy Paul can do to contest that. And the worst part still for Puppy Paul is like his only choice is fast feudal, right? Because a prolonged dark age means spearmen against a sieve that builds longbows. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Man, Puppy Paul coming out strong in game one. Do you think he has much momentum going into game two here? Like, do you think Vortex is a little angry about that game mentally? I, I wouldn't be surprised. Like Vortex, he's a very passionate player. He has like he'll admit himself sometimes like you know he can be thrown off tilt. Mm -hmm. Those those losses, especially with how close that series started to look with the turnaround raids, losing three villages that early has to be stuck on his mind. But don't worry, he's gonna have a good story from this series about three villages. They make their way out for the pond. How do they go? And we shall see what Puppy Paw's plan is this game. Probably very standard. Interesting. Going for an early forge. Yes, I find that's very good for Gavin Girl. Because <laughs> we are going through a fast doodle. Yeah. There's no way that he's going to play this. It, it's like, you know, I, I even know someone's like, you do get Dark Age Samurai. And I'm like, no, those are called Sadmurai. They are so depressingly bad to build. I f they're as bad as building um, Feudal Age Palace Guard, right? Like, I'd actually argue Feudal Age Palace Guard feels better. So he's going to stay at home. Vortex. The interesting thing about the way he does this play, he doesn't build the outpost until the tech up. So at that point, he's either got like a defense against your Shinobi play, or he's just got like a good vision in the area. But of course, he is going to open up the dock. And with the tech timing, he should get enough time to pump out like two fishing boats before he has to add an outpost. Mm. Man, look at the Look at this map spawn. Um, it's pretty interesting. The gold is really weird from... For vortex right like against the yeah. japanese player on a short rush it's all so there's the one north but like the rest of it is all really far away like if he doesn't get control of that like high ground dish area by the stones it's going to be rough then all the the eight k's are like really on top of each other yeah that does happen sometimes like it does um, happen but like we yeah. have seen the spawns where you get an 8k on the left side of the sacred site but like i find more often than not you get this this kind of clump like, we've even seen Golden Height games mid-game where someone drops a keep and it's basically a GG, right? Because it's, like, 32k yeah. gold secured. Yeah, it starts playing, like, regions, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um. here's an interesting thing, right? Like, usually the play here is to sneak a dock in the corner next to the tree lines. So oh, even if it's not a tree line, you sneak it there so you can wall it off. It shows you how confident of a pick the English is in this game because English are probably the sieve that most consistently have all the ones in the game walks straight to the center and drops it um excuse me you told me the ninjas were bad they are bad they are really bad watch this timing from vortex he's gathering wood when the tech up comes through he's gonna build an outpost saying. at the dock i'm just saying we're seeing it yeah we're, we're seeing history repeat itself if, no. if he invests into Mass we're seeing Kenobi, puppy paw write history Oh yes, belief, belief in the Shinobi. How can Come I on, forget man. about that very popular piece of history when the uh, the Hanzo Hotori clan repelled the English Lombos <laughs> that fought Agincourt? A classic yes. uh, uh, history. Yeah, 
we we yeah. just whitewashed it because we wanted to be all about European power, right? We couldn't have the Japanese being our, our Agincourt Lombos. <laughs> well, I think it's going to be cool because the Coco Township is coming in. The Shinobi is going to be a little bit delayed to what we used to see, but I mean, I'm sure everyone's pretty used to that now. And across they will come. It's going to get immediately spotted by Vortex here, I think. Um, well, he's going to have to go a little deep into here. He might not. He has to find the landmark, though. So he's going to loop around. He should, yeah, he should full rotate. Because like, even if yeah. you didn't see it directly, if you don't see a crystal house next to the TC or on the tree line, it's dead obvious what's happened here, right? So mm -hmm. look at this. What, what a great nerf. Thank you. Thank you, devs, for making Shinobi poop on a stick. The and outpost. there's that outpost. No. I, you know, I, I'm, can I just take a bow right now? Like, <laughs> Shinobi can dream. I want to take a bow for Vortex's big brain play. He intentionally leaves it like this because he knows he's being scoured. He wants the tech up because once the tech up is done, Could he there's no the reversing bolt? it. No, too late. No, yeah, it, I don't know. So yeah, sorry, you say press the gold. No, there's no way. Like the Lombos are gonna be there now. This is yeah, the Lombos are gonna be up. Oof. And this is this oh, is the thing big that, brain. That you know, Lombos are coming, so you get out some horsemen. Hey, okay. look at that. This is a but, game plan. We're yeah. gaming. But Winston, hear me out. Wolf rush. I have boats. Wolf rush. He's bringing uh, them in. Uh, 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 yeah, of course. You just like start blowing your dog whistle, right? And they follow you all the way across. Oh my yeah. god, he got scouts straight away. Wait, no vortex. The bills. They're going to leave dangerous. the safety of the the tower. Vortex. And here comes the shinobi. No, 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 no. Back we and go. And away he goes. Yeah, three, the, the shinobi like three shot bells, right? Yeah, so it's really scary. Mm -hmm. Can he, can he, he might body block this. Puppy no. He's going to have to train. Uh, He doesn't have the resources to train. No, oh, it's on the way he already. He immediately it's just already on the way. Yeah, but, I was like, I looked as he aged. I didn't realize he was faster than humanly allowed. Like fast but, but than the keep game. in mind, like this is now really annoying. No longbows. Yeah, because you have to do water. You don't care about longbows, right? Like, would you rather have a longbow or a galley that almost has longbow range? The annoying thing, like both these you have players to play now it. suffer. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. both these players now suffer, Winston, because like for the Japanese, you're not getting your biggest advantage of water. You can't really build those cheap fishing boats, right? You need to deal with aggro. Yeah, but on he could just build. Uh, he has emplacement in like, what? Just a little bit of stone. Mm, it's not going to reach the fishing though, so it's kind of a redundant. Oh, play, the right? galley gets delayed. Um, yep. Yeah, yeah, but the shinobi died. The shinobi died. That's a bigger deal there. He died for this. Yeah. So now he's like, live on, dodge. my brothers. <laughs> so this oh, is a really man. good position for Vortex. Like I was waiting for it. The second dock is is crucial here because if you delay um, a minute worth of production, you can get a big enough edge even with Land Eco to win that as the Japanese. But now, like losing your free shinobi, this second one costs 120 resources. That's insanely expensive at this stage of the game. Mm -hmm. There's that galley. Has he stopped? Uh, maybe just waiting for emplacements. You'll you'll lose this gradually if it's emplacements though, right? Oh, my yeah, I mean, no, no, no. I think the point is to force investment, right? I think Vortex stops now though, right? Like you don't actually have to add in more until Puppy Pool does something. And I think Puppy Pool, like this is where this would turn into a meat grinder that doesn't favor you. I like what he's doing instead with the horseman. Goes for a raid on land. Vortex needs the garrison not inside. Kill. Not gonna nice kill. Nice body blocks. So are you just that guy that points out everyone he doesn't kill? Not gonna kill. Not gonna kill. You like that guy standing behind oh, someone yeah, the firing yeah. range? Yeah, yeah. I'm feeling bad. I'm feeling bad for puppy. Sorry, <laughs> it, this is just devastating my morale. I I was so excited for the ninjas. Yeah, so it will be the emplacement on the water, by the way. So he is gonna just build it, but I don't know what it does. Like you're saying, like I feel like it's just annoying. I don't know if it like wins I mean, the water. You, you just basically oh, like, shoot to back away. So the plan is run the demo. Uh, the plan is to lose After the one thing that could save you. Yep. Shh, shh. It, wait, you want demo. the demo spawn no. on that side. <laughs> the worst possible spot for that. Go next. Go next. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not how we think here. We think about how you can win. In game um, three. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it no, is no, pretty no, rough. No. Like he could maybe try for a two TC on land play, of, like, but th those builds are quite dead, right? Like you usually still go for the fast castles. Maybe fast castle could still save him. Playing long feudal is, is not great here because Vortex has an eco advantage now, right? And it's like he also has premium units of his own in the form of Lombos. So we're probably just yeah. gonna be looking at a standard Japanese fast castle and he's gonna pray he gets there before Vortex. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's I guess that's the plan. The gold potentially pressured here a little bit, but shouldn't be too much damage. You might be able to pinch. Maybe. Ooh, no, he nice micro. He got it. He got it. He got one, but he could have got two. That unfortunately, when he turned to attack, you saw it, right? He, he got pushed back yeah. behind the villagers. If he went for like half a second longer, he would have lost like an extra horseman, but he would have got two villies. Um, Is he hiding a range? Oh, dude, he's. <gasps> Let's go. It's the Yumi game. He's hiding ranges in the north. Yeah. Does he need to hide them? Like, there's no scout, right? No, um, like, it's still a nice. Wait, detail. what do you mean? There is there is a scout. But, oh, Focus it's on the front. Scouts. Yeah, yeah, it's on the front. But he's like, hiding so, ranges. Yeah, but this is really important. So actually, but I he's legit running think... the Yumi forward. Yeah, but yeah, but listen, listen up, listen up, listen. Okay, listen. Yumi, I'm listening. I'm listening. Yumi can actually Yumi Com can actually beat Lombo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speed them. You just run them down. If yeah, but enough. it's not just the outspeed, it's the fact that Yumi get overkilled, right? Because Lombos, right. they hit too hard, so like it's not efficient trading, so you just zerk him. Like, I, I genuinely believe Japanese is the pristine example of zergling Civ in AoE4 now. Think about it, Onobagisha, um, the Mass Samurai strats, Yumi, like most of the best options are about getting more units than their opponent. Right, it's, it's like it used to be Musafadi with that Zergling Civ, but I think really Japanese have taken that title. He just needs to buy time though. Like, it, it's funny because HRE has a similar effect against the Lombos because of the rundown you talked about. It's just Japanese get that by default, and they get a lot of scalability. Like that steel arrow right now is adding twenty five percent damage to this unit. Man, Vortex is looking for blood here. Man, he is just all in. This is interesting. He's added a lot of man at arms, which is going to slow down a lot of his eco growth. But he doesn't want an eco. He wants to kill his opponent, adding in the ram now. And the pressure's coming in. The third range is coming down for, for Puppy, so it's going to be Yumi all in. Mm -hmm. With Horseman, the Bannerman on the way as well. Going to be the ranged Bannerman, so the Yumi are going to have as much damage as a normal archer. And here comes Mr. Ram. All right, Vortex. Here's the issue. That ram, That's a lot of archers. That's a lot of archers. Yeah, and here's the problem. Like, attacking this gold, is it doesn't do anything, right? Like, that right now doesn't matter to Puppy Paul. He's got under mesh. He's got steeled arrow. So you need to find his wood. You need to go buy it. You have to bypass it here. Archer's going to dive in. There is an arrow slit in that tower as well. So this dive from Vortex may be a little bit premature. Maybe. Spin as the low. Lombos, oh, yeah, there's... no. That oh my. is going to be all Lombos going down. Look at that man at arms just getting <laughs> owned here. Holy. You mean, just, he can just be ignored. That's the stupid part about like Yumi here. You just you kite, run, by you run past. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, bye. You, okay. you kill that Lombos. What a great engagement for Puppy Paw. The, vil get, the Vils get pulled as well at the same time to deal with the Ram. And the Yumi count gets low, but this army for Vortex is largely cleaned up. The Ram lives. Huh? Um... I, He's I gonna shoot it. Tell the tale. Like, <laughs> I don't know what's happening now. There it goes. He shoots it. Rid of it. Yumi are gonna back away. He does keep the Bannerman alive. I love that detail. Remember, Bannerman are actually quite a bit more tanky than standard Yumi, so a little bit harder to snipe down in small numbers. It's it's kind of like like metas, right? Like when there's enough archers, metas die, but when there's a small hmm. number, they survive. See, but behind this, isn't Vortex's economy just way better? Or yes. Am I missing something? <laughs> like, yeah, yes. He he's drastically better off right now. Um, because the Japanese, like, where is the economical edge? It's in farms, right? With Daimyo. We've got Daimyo, but we don't have farms because a certain someone decided they really liked watching Naruto. I don't think it was that big of a mistake. It just didn't pan out. Oh, big counterattack! Several Yo. of those are going down here. Not paying attention yet. Vortex does get the Vill pull now, but it's still... No willpower. <laughs> this is like a few more going down. Dude, that is sick. Whoa. He actually gets free at the tail end. Whoa. Ladies and gentlemen, we have boom. A game. That was an impressive play from Puppy Paw. Eight Vil kills now. So Vortex is... got to be feeling a little rough there. Going to be repeating history. Trying, speaking of, going to be trying the ram play again. But now there's going to be a lot of Yumi on the field if the Bannermen come home. And, and this is exactly what I wanted Yumi to be used for. Like, this is the thing that I've been begging people to like, oh, no, Yumi suck. They need to be, like, buffed. They're not meant to just be this Lombo-type unit. They are very efficient raiders. The momentum is in their speed. If you're outnumbered, don't fight. <laughs> like, go after something that's slower, that's easier to kite, right? Like, Village is there. You saw it. No wheelbarrow. Vortex cannot run away quick enough in those engagements. I mean, 
Yeah, and Poppy Paul's going to play patient here and wait for his his raiding force to come back to take this engagement. But I don't even think he needed to. I think he has enough here to fight. The, there's only 10 longbows here. That's not enough for this many horsemen in Yumi. Also, and... Vortex didn't oh, have undermesh this entire time, right? Like, it was heavily uh -huh. delayed. Imagine how much better these fights, even the one we saw here earlier, would have been if he had undermesh. Way better. Time. Yeah, like, that would have made the man at arms way tankier. But now he's going to have it. And with seven man at arms on the field, that's pretty good. And Poppy got to play patiently here. Interesting. Just going to back up, wait for reinforcements, and try to take a better engagement than what's being offered right <laughs> now. so depressing because men at arms charge, right? So they move fast in the longbows. Yeah. It, it kind of just it separates your fight in a non-beneficial way and the problem is like that means poppy four is trading but well it's not really trading it's just one-sided engagement right like you're doing damage without taking any another thing that's scaring me is like vortex double ram now you lost one before this is outpost that's seeing idle incomplete that's a lot of wood that's just kind of dead right like it's just sitting there or unused and the horseman now runs straight past the men at arms yumi are going to move in to engage that line and this should just be an ignore. Move past the men at arms, chase them the Lombos, and just keep chasing them back. But unfortunately, that outpost behind means that the attack damage increase is being offset by that sweet attack speed for the English. Yeah, and the Bannerman's starting to get attacked a little bit, losing a bit of its health, but it's quite durable against these longbow shots. This is difficult. And that was a really good fight for Vortex. Like you're saying, he fought in the network of castles. And that made everything comfortable. And now he's going to be adding a second rim. The threat here is starting to grow. Puppy Pot does not have a food transition really available to him. I mean, he he's no almost out of hunt on the north. This. Oh. What? Wow. He's taking the deer from next to Vortex's base. That is wild. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a huh out of me, boss. But I mean, I'll take it. Take what you can get. I like it from Puppy. Right. But... I, uh, he, the, here's, the, the, here's the positive. We got a positive here, Winston. You have many more Yumi than normal archers, so they're better at killing the rams. I think the problem is though that Vortex has 24 longbows to 27 Yumi. Yumi are good, but not that good. <laughs> yeah, really I think cool. when you have this many, the vil pole comes out. This is so much. And once time. again, under network, and this is where the longbows are going to shine. I mean, they're just getting free eco kills here. Vortex, you know, it looked a bit shaky. Props to Puppy Paw for trying to find a recovery arc with that Yumi spam. But unfortunately, it's not really spam when you have the same number as Lombos, especially with the attack speed aura. This is ugly. He's out of men at arms. It, it doesn't matter. Like, the, the archer counts all that matters now, right? With the attack speed aura, you can't fight. And the Bannerman died. You did sound very deflated about that. Yeah, it's oh. art wall. I'm sad. It's like, yeah, I want to Puppy... Died. I, I thought there was a hope here, but yeah, this position is so tricky. Uh, the fishing ship lead is just massive now, too. If we still took has a look the at that. aura that deep. That's kind of crazy. Oh, no. No, no, don't walk it, in right? range. Don't walk in range. He's going to try and take the fight, but look at the losses as he approaches. The Yumi just getting shredded by these longbows. Oh. Remember, he has more here as well, right, Winston? Like, th this production count for Vortex, that's not all the longbows. So... Puppy Paw is using the entire Yumi battalion and still losing like, against, mm -hmm. like, what? I think it was, like, 14, 15 archers instead. Yeah. This is brutal. Can we take a look at the ocean real quick? Just check that. Okay. That's a that's a big eco lead. He's right. well off. That's that's pretty massive. Stop it. He's already dead. Like, he's got that feeling about he's it. He's running right? in again. This man at arm bravely running in, but he's going to tank a lot of arrows that you have to ignore. And now you can't just a move. You have to right click and the micro gets a lot more intensive. And now all of your Yumi's are dead. The Bannerman goes down again, but his flag lives on. Oh boy. And Vortex just cleans house this game. Holy crap. I am not convinced about the Yumi this game. Um, I'm not convinced. It about seems the solid at times. Okay. That's fair. I think the biggest question mark was definitely the early game, but Maybe just a matchup issue. Like, how do you stop English from going to the water if you're not going to invest in units, right? I, I think you don't. Like, I, I like think, honestly, you have to accept what it is. Like, the, the, the thing that's brutal is I've seen Vortex do this build before. And, you know, if Puppy Paul has done his research uh, and watched that series where Puppy Paul, uh, like, you know, where Vortex rather done this exact same build against a Japanese player, I think it might have even been Wham. I, I think it actually was one of the Canadians. So I'd have to double check. It was on Golden Heights. He literally waits intentionally until the tech up pings, and then he builds an outpost. Against the old Shinobi build, right, where you get the first one coming out, you might have, like, a thin veil of a chance of making it there in time to kill the, the outpost. Probably not still. But mm -hmm. with this new build, with a 23-second delay, it, the game has, like, already decided at that point. I think the, the one way 
that he maybe could have made this work as with the Caristo house because in fairness to him, he made that look close, right? Like imagine if this had instead been a Kuros Storehouse play and he spammed Yumi. I, I like it because I think, you know, it's similar to he A3 versus the, English where you just would have had a food transition. Exactly. Right? And that's like the he thing would he have been out. okay, <laughs> right? But without <laughs> it, he, he tried the coca. I mean, and, we literally uh, watched him gather deer from right next to Vortex's space. <laughs> he was, he was I mean, playing a gambling game. It, don't knock it if it works, you know? But now we get into this. We're going to be going towards Coastal Cliffs. Um, this is a okay. matchup we have not seen in a hot second, right? HRE versus Chinese. Feels like both of these civs kind of went to the side. I think like China was still very good for competitive. HRE has been a very big question mark for a lot of players. If I'm not mistaken, like historically, this matchup does slightly favor the, um, the HRE, right? It does a little bit. I mean... Yeah. I think we've seen this matchup a lot on Holy Island historically in tournament play, right? Um, where both of them were really good picks for, on Holy Island when Roos was banned, right? Um, here, Roos still banned. And this is kind of similar to Holy Island, just without the water component, obviously. Um, not sure what to expect. I guess HRE just tries to get relics, play for the middle. Yep. Um, but uh... can't China just win? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> how, I guess that's that my work? question. Do, do they just open the nuclear button and press the <laughs> press the launch pad? Like, just win? <laughs> Barbican um, on route. Maybe right. like okay, you could in theory like do a Barbican drop in the enemy base because like the wood lines tend to spawn forward, but they also then tend to like right. bog up the, the gold. But like it, it's quite the pun. I have seen some really cheesy plays out of Chinese on this map where they just they don't even go Barbican, they just rush outputs. Right. And yeah. you are up against the sieve that is allergic to building units, right? Like HRE hate having to drop production buildings before they're getting castles. So it mm -hmm. wouldn't surprise me. I think Poppy Poor actually is the most prolific Barbican rusher in the tournament right now. Um, we had a few games, the group stage, one where he literally just Barbican rushed his opponent out and had him pretty much dead to rights eight minutes in. Yeah, that sounds like a problem. But we'll see if Vortex falls for that kind of thing. I feel like not really. I feel like Vortex will have the right response here. Coastal Cliffs, though. It's a fun new map. I've really been enjoying Coastal Cliffs in this tournament. This is its first tournament, right? Yep, first tournament. Avali, he created it over the holidays. He also created bri yeah. uh, Bridges. Funny thing, there was a map tournament to decide some new maps used in competitive, and Avali basically got all the top slots. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and big shout out to Avali, by the way, because there was a prize pool attached to that, and he said, I don't feel right taking all the money disperse it amongst some of the other people who entered maps. It's the only fair thing to do. So big shout out, love that guy. Um, but let's explain the map a bit because Coastal Cliffs, I essentially just call it Dry Arabia on Slimfast, right? Because it, it, it is, for all intents and purposes, meant to play like Dry Arabia. You see fish in that water, but the only way you're accessing that is if you this is Sparta yourself off the side of the cliff. It's kind of like Arabia, but at the same time, not really, right? Um... I think only having two sacred sites kind of limits Delhi a bit. Um, the stones are really far away on this map, right? Much further than Arabia. Um, you have a close gold, but not a close stone. And I think that also kind of makes two TC sieves, like French, even weaker against like aggressive sieves because your stone is just so exposed. Um, so you there's definitely like, some like, differences. You mean two TC sieves like Chinese? Yeah, but HRE isn't aggressive, like, super early, right? Like, they're not yes. going to, like, like unless there's... Oh, I say that. I was about to say, unless you do something crazy, like, do Dark Age Spearman. <laughs> and there's literally Dark Age Spearman on the map. I well, I am... I'm clinically blind. Okay, guys. Just okay. let me go past. Never it's mind. okay. Take, take a good look, folks. Next uh, week, this is going to be every HRE game you ever queue into. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe that March and Drills buff is coming. Like, this is before that, by the way. This is not new patch. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of like your classic HRE still. Th this player is going to get buffed, though. March and Drills is going to be there by default in the future, but this is really smart because it denies the opportunity for that Barbican Rush you talked about. And this is yeah. also a map that's pretty food sparse, well, the, right? There's I think not it's also much to the get. Gold. The gold isn't under the TC on this map, right? Yeah. Another difference with Arabia, um, which... Ugh. Well, well, like, keep in mind that the gold isn't the biggest deal because, like, you're not going to stop the Chinese from gathering enough gold for Imperial Academy in time, right? But, like, now what you do is he has limited food and he has to react to you in Fuel Age, right? right? So I wouldn't be surprised if Vortex now just goes greedy after this, especially Ow. considering he's got back gold mines. Oh, Vortex is sake. like, it didn't work with Mongols. 
It didn't work with Mongols against the Cubans, but I'm sure this strategy is good. So he's gonna do it again here. Do you remember when we said like, oh, the reason the Mongol outpost rush doesn't work is because everyone expects it? Yeah, no one expects the HRE Inquisition, right? Everyone thinks it'll be the Spanish, but this time around, it was a Spanish player. I try. See, I kind of got you guys there. It's like a pseudo getcha, you know. Never well, gonna give you the witch up. hunt begins, and uh, the Chinese may be at risk of being brought to their knees because like, we're probably going to see one of the most underwhelming Barbicans or a forced Chuganu spam. Which, if Vortex starts seeing that, that's where we'll likely see him just go, okay, Castle H. Because if you're going to build Chuganu, I'm just going to go rushing relics with knights. Yeah, this is really interesting. This this flips the whole script on its head. I love the way that Vortex is playing this. He's stopping the spear production at four, so it's just for this tower. Um, it like you're saying, it he would he would be able to prevent a really good Barbican position on the hunt and the gold, maybe on the south. It's gonna force a Barbican maybe on like the left if Puppy Paw is trying to get a really good Barbican spots, which he's gonna now have to do with tax gold. Interesting. It's so, going to be a really late barbican because he's queuing up officials, right? Yeah. Well, here's a thought, right? Like any good barbecue usually involves burgles, right? I see where you're getting at. I see where you're cooking. Continue. Because, I, I, you know, I'm going to just say, you know, when, when people give Vortex like an 11 out of 10 for aggression, they're actually talking about the way he cooks his burgers. You know, they're very, very blackened. They come out a little bit too hard to munch. And this... This is the perfect moment for that type of play, considering that Puppy Paw is being denied resources. He doesn't have some like second TC boom because the stone's too far out. And if we check Vortex's food count, I think he's got like what, maybe ten sheep left and a back spawn deer. I'm just saying, like you know, you could just the bring wood. these spears back, push those deer in. Nah. Why is he chopping so much wood? Does uh, he need one more house? I guess. Yeah, he's, he's going to run out of housing soon. So. I, I guess that's it. Like, chopping wood for the house and then going back to food and gold? I hmm. legit think, like, he's going to... You just bring the, the spears home and you push the deer out. In fact, Puppy Paw, I think he's going to snipe the deer now. Yo, check this, check this to the south. Please tell me he's going to do it. Like, you have to read this for what it is, right? Like, if you let him push these deer in, you're in big trouble. And wait, wait, no, 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 no. Don't push yourself in. Hmm. Okay, he gets away in time. The the spearmen are still tucked away in that outpost denying the gold, so it yeah. doesn't look like he's going to do that push play that you're talking about, although that is a very intelligent play. He has a lot of ills on wood, so I don't think we're seeing a burger. Um, hmm. He's getting the spearmen upgrade for his spearmen in the outpost. Is he just going to play is atypical? Is he going to do archers or something? Wait, wait, Puppy Paw's, Puppy Paw's outpost rushing him now. I think, I think Vortex <laughs> is going to go archers. <laughs> He needs to, because the spearmen coming towards his base right now. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. It also kind of denies the Zhugnu mass if you have enough archers already. Like, that, not denies, but, like, gives well, you, you something. Them. Yeah, you can yeah it gives you something else. other than nothing, right? But, I mean, Zhugnu are still a ways away if we're even going to get there in this game, right? Mm. Yeah, you need song, right? Like, and, and there's no way you're rushing towards that now you spent all that food. He has so many spears. He wants the what? outpost gone. They, they, yeah, this is just... He needs the outpost gone. Cause he like, needs the, gold. Yeah, and look at where <laughs> his second gold thing. is. Yeah. <laughs> like, if he loves the feel of it, the touch of it, the smell of it, he needs to get rid of that outpost because that one is not touchable. And here we go. Out into the stone. So Vortex. Is he going to play prolonged feudal 2TC? Yeah. I guess. <laughs> this game is wild, and I'm here but for it, man. I, I I'm I'm lost. I don't know. This that's, is outside dude, of the I box want, of theory. <laughs> that's right? what I want in my games, Winston. When you don't know what's going on, that's when the most fun comes out. I mean, not for Puppy Paw in this game, but yeah. How could Puppy Paw predict what Vortex is gonna do if Vortex himself has no idea what he's gonna do? <laughs> is this one of the he reads the future, so I can't think about the future type situations, like an anime yeah, arc where yeah, you have it... to do stupid chaotic things. But it's not stupid in this. It's actually quite big brain. It's going to allow him to, what, secure the deer on the backside? And essentially, Puppy Paul hasn't even moved the stone yet. So he's not looking for a 2TC rush himself. Yeah. 
the archers are out, so the spearmen mass <laughs> now has to run away, and now we're going to go the other way, but the barbican will go up in the good spot, right? Like, m my whole thought process behind the spearmen being good was it would deny this, but it, it did for a while, right? It forced Puppy to create a ton of spearmen to protect, kill the outpost, and then he gets this. Look at that second TC location. The <laughs> He's trying to snake it. So, like, it, it makes sense, right? Puppy Paul is going to be checking near your main base. He's trying to sneak his TC really off to the side. It's a bit of a gamble because if Master Chigi and do come in and they check that flank, like, that TC is gone, Barry's. right? He's got the deer and he's sending bills to berries. What in the world? Oh, he hasn't got the deer yet. He has to build the TC. And also, because he's sent his villages all the way out, he needs to get a mill because he's going to need wheelbarrow when oh. crap hits the fan, right? Right, Roy, Roy, Roy. That makes Roy, sense. Roy, Roy, I'm sorry. Are you, are you now like a, a British I'm plumbing? Contractor? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I just said Roy, oh, Roy, man. bro. It, it's absolutely fine. I'm just uh, saying. I'm just saying. Do you just want to switch roles for this cast? So you can be the British guy. Uh Roy. Um. Okay. Moving on. Jugnu are on the way now. That song is in. This is kind of expected, and this is why I was thinking Vortex would have a mass of archers at this point. But because he's gone for the TC, he doesn't actually have that many archers. I thought he might be on, like, two range. So he's playing a slow, long feudal without much army right now. And I think there's a big risk here that Puppy Paw gets a blacksmith up, adds rams, and just has way more army. And can just pressure either this TC or the main base. It's tough to pressure the HRE TCs because of emergency repairs. Also, it's tough to pressure that TC because I have a feeling, just a hunch... That Puppy Paw has no idea that that town center is there. Um, well, like, I think he's keep, looking for it, right? Let's keep in mind that that transition comes in really quickly for the uh, the Chinese, right? Because you can get into the blacksmith and you can supervise to get into the steel arrow and the, the quick siege oh, engineering, and then you can take that out. It's, it's really easy to do, man. So I, I'd be really concerned that that second TC might not reap the rewards that Vortex is hoping for. <laughs> hoping for. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll see. I, I think I think you're right. I, I, I'm not sure, though. I really don't know. Like, I think if Puppy invests in Rams too soon, it could be a problem. But if he gets up to, like, 20, 30 Jugnu and Vortex still isn't even threatening it, Castle Age, I think Vortex might be in some trouble. Well, because, like, the, the issue is you built a second TC, but the Barbican's kind of giving a, a, a pseudo yeah. second TC effect, right? And then yeah, you add 30%. in the, the IOs. Like, this is why loose second TC oh, feels no. rough for HRE. And, oh, my God, not the production. No, no, no. He doesn't have to kill it. He just has to camp it. Anything coming out is a free kill. Yeah, well, emergency repairs is going to help a little bit if these are in range. I think he snaked it correctly, right? Mm, Shuganu should get some freebies. Yeah, he could. Uh, uh, yeah, wait, there it is. Okay. I, I was like, huh? <laughs> is it me or is it kind of weird that, like, Puppet Paul's not a bit deeper? Right, like, because he could intercept those horsemen as they were spawning. I guess he's like a bit paranoid because the archery rangers could still be producing, right? Like, Chuganu can technically get kited here. Yeah, you, you also just don't want. Oh my gosh, Veil picks too. Oh god. Nice play from Puppy. The crazy part is that Puppy Paul's still on one TC, and look at the eco. Yeah, I think. Well, keep in mind, uh, there's four officials, so it's really 42. It's still right. a crazy lead for a guy who got delayed on his barbecue time, right? Who got denied yeah. on his gold. Like, th this is really impressive out of Poppy Paul. Uh, reminder, this guy has not dropped a single game with the Chinese. He has five wins, zero losses. He's by far the strongest Chinese player in this tournament right now. And we are seeing exactly why. I, I think uh, I was saying he would need rams to pressure the main base. But if Vortex builds his base like this, you just don't need rams. I... I'm not exactly sure what possessed him to build his base like this. Maybe he was thinking he had more time. I think um, he was but hiding. now we're up to 36 Jugnu. Like, that's a lot of units, and there's a big mess coming in. They're going to hit the Berry Bills, and will Puppy Paw, or sorry, will Vortex oh, no. notice? No, no, no. It's happening all over again. Villagers are going to run away, but three more going down. He's going to e repair on the archery range. But right now, he's heavily outnumbered 16 versus 51 military. And he's building men at arms. You know what the problem with men at arms is here, Winston? They end up role playing hedgehogs into Mass Chuginu. <laughs> I don't even understand what that what you mean by that. I know intuitively how it works in the game, but I don't know what you mean by role playing as hedgehogs. They are this covered point, in so I many ask, spikes. I they look like ask. hedgehogs, my friend. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Pinatas. Uh, let's see. 
Pink so the town center is now being turned on. So it looks like Puppy has spotted this. We have Siege Engineering finally coming in. But yeah, he, I mean, he was able to kill a lot without it. And I think we're going to see the addition of the ram right on the front there. And I don't see how Vortex keeps the TC alive in the north. He's kind of have to find a way to evacuate. Unless Puppy Paw just instead goes for the main base. Some of the is like going to get caught out. Wait, 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 calm down, lads. I, I feel like it's better to go for the main base here, right? Because the secondary TC, it's just, it's a generic Civ TC, right? Because he doesn't have the buff. But if you can start idling out the Arkan area, then you are just miles ahead of Vortex. And here's the Rams. All right, let's get rid of the easy target. The counterattack there for uh, Vortex was okay. I think he killed two Vels on the uh, the Barbican hunt. But we'll see. Is it, is it Clown Car time? I feel like it's Clown Car um, time. But it's such a big army. This is like exactly what you don't want to play into. This is why people tend not to want to play long feudals against China, right? Is this army right here with like it? That's just a lot of units, <laughs> right? But Winston, if we, if we play against China like this, we're bound to get Chugenu enough. <laughs> so the, you're, you're saying right now that Pup, that uh, Fortress's plan right now is to he's taking one for the team. <laughs> he's taking one for the team to try and change the balance of the game. Okay. Oh man, two rams. And this is the thing, Chuganu, like this many. They're so good. Yeah, they, against they, the buildings. They basically hit the same damage as the ram at this stage. Chuganu yeah. Now, the reinforcements. All right, here we go. Hedgehogs. Only they're not really sonic blue fast, so they're not even gap closing quick enough. Marching drills wasn't even in yet. Vortex. The fact that Puppy Paw is like, I feel safer underneath your TC right now. Yeah. Says everything it needs to here. Yeah. That's really rough, and the army from Vortex gets just evaporated, and like that, he taps out. GG is called, and we are on to game four with a series on our hands, might I add? Well, uh, the news that we have for people, if they were upset by early today, it means we're at least guaranteed a bracket reset, right? Because, like, we, we split the maps. But... A bracket reset? Huh? Hulk, uh, bracket, sorry, a draft reset. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a draft reset after game four. They'll do another draft. So the Civs Where China be, can get picked again. Where China can get picked again. But basically just another another draft there because they run out of Civs, right? Um, with this current format. Yeah, technically, like, the current format, you could argue they can go all the way up to, like, six games. But I like that they reset because I think the, the problem is mm -hmm. there's an elegance and art to outdrafting, but also it, it can get underwhelmingly obtuse if you get down to, like, the final pick. And you're like, well, this is a GG because he got Mongols versus Iobits. Luckily, we didn't get a chance to say that because A, we get the, the reset halfway through and B, everyone keeps picking Mongols Iobids first. Um, so, mm. looking on to the next game though, yeah, we're going to be heading this. into Ooh. Dry Arabia and this, I mean, this should be a strong point for Vortex actually. Delhi versus the Byzantines. Delhi's a very dominant sieve. They're very pressure oriented. Yeah. One thing I don't want to discredit though, I think Byzantines already got overbuffed, Winston. And I think the like the upcoming patch is going to make them even more absurd. Uh, right now, in the tournament, they're the most winningest Civ uh, full stop, right? It was Order of the Dragon before them, but Order of the Dragon only had like a few games played. Meanwhile, Byzantines have a 62.5% win rate with 24 games played. It's a lot of games. Yeah, it's it, it, and they're not really being banned at all. They're not taking that that highlight away even though they have that good win rate um so we'll see if that changes anything moving into the later stages of the tournament um but right now yeah the byzantine sir puppy pot gonna be pretty solid i feel like biz really fits his play style quite well um like you were saying like the boomy style where he's so good on china i feel like biz in some ways can mirror that or at least play similarly in feel and vibe and i feel like that's going to be really dominant however delhi has also felt really really solid in the last couple of tournaments i think their timing in mid feudal is the best in the game probably right yes. they just have this point where they have like two or three production buildings all just spamming out units they get the sacred sites and it's just like what do you do they force you to fight they force you to play their game and the question is is puppy pog going to be able to fight that i i don't really know i think it's going to depend a lot on the map layout i think it's going to depend on the mercenary choice so i'm looking forward to seeing it I actually think of uh, the Civs in the game, like the Byzantines, I'm not going to say they're favored, but they do better than most because the big problem with dealing with Delhi is the way they ramp. 
right? The double production, the way they extend. Byzantines haven't answered that, remember. The system gives the gathering rate to the entire economy. Beautiful. But on top of that, you get things like Conscriptio that gives you the increased production rate. Doesn't exactly match, but over time, it can kick in to be quite effective. We'll just have to see how effective it's going to be here. We hop into a fourth <laughs> game. Guaranteed a draft reset after this one. But can Puppy Paul give himself a competent position getting up to match point, or are we going to even up 2 2? We head into this game, Vortex with the dominant Delhi, Puppy Paul. With his impressive Byzantines, he has yet to lose a series with his Civ. He has two wins overall. Um, the only person who was left in the tournament who was doing better was his brother with four wins and no losses. Yeah, so clearly they figured something out with the Byzantines. Um, and they have a strat and they have a plan. And they've put a lot of work into the practice. But Delhi has been in the game for a long time. And Vortex is no stranger to how it plays. So we have to see if he's prepared for what Puppy Paw brings, because I feel like Puppy might surprise us with some of his choices, whereas with Delhi, like, Vortex isn't going to do anything alarming here, right? N nothing nothing is going to happen that we go, huh? You know, this is going to be a very standard Delhi game, I predict. And if that's the case, I'm, I'm just curious how Puppy's going to handle Biz, right? Biz, I feel like, has a lot of options, a lot of opportunity for surprises, but also mistakes. Um, so looking forward to seeing how he just like navigates this match, uh, especially with the early feudal age. Does he give map control entirely and just try and hold? Um, does he try and play the map somehow? <laughs> I like, don't know how, but maybe there's a way, right? What, uh, looking what forward if, to it. What if he does a solid in return? Like Vortex just tried to justify the HRE buff incoming. Poppy Paul can try to get something buffed for the Byzantines. Let's go Hippodrome. Okay, I, I, I don't even believe myself. I, I, no, I, I'm... <laughs> I mean, so, the, it has opportunities. It's just tricky. So the issue Probably of Hippodrome is like on paper, it sounds like one of the most broken feudal landmarks in the game. But in practice, it is so, so bad because of how easy it is to bait its use and then disengage, right? Like, I think that's the number one issue of Hippodrome. Um, in this matchup, it would make your horseman better. <laughs> there we go. He's going to be going for it. So Hippodrome play. I think it's got value. Um, I think the 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 Canadian bros, Puppy and Wham, they also have this strat, this style where they um they go the Keshex from the Mercs alongside the Hippodrome, and yes. you get a lot of in synergy instantly with that. The Keshex get a lot of value out of the healing. Um, because it, it does combos make with you their one dimensional healing. though, right? Like it literally puts you pulled into one unit comp entirely. True, but you can solve that later, right? The, the idea is that you you just have a lot of power with that combo right away. Um, and he goes on. Yeah, to he's bury going to bury, so he wants he wants some mercenaries, right? Like his game plan does revolve around that. This is a, a different build to what I've been seeing with the Hippodrome opener. Um, I think B especially and Louis have been doing this, where they will actually pull all the villagers across onto the berries very early. It's a slightly later feudal age timing, but it guarantees when you kick it, you immediately are able to pump the Keshex or whatever contract you want, right? Yeah. Um, it has to be Keshex here. Like, like there aren't many matchups where I'm like, Hippodrome Keshex feels great because Maybe Lombos, Lombos though. And, yeah, but Lombos is very slow and you're all about tempo, right? Like, you have to move around the map. Um, that's why Delhi usually just takes a crap all over English is when a map is wide, it's really annoying to try and shut them down because your Lombos don't move. Yeah, and, and that's what's going to be really tricky here. Even if you go Keshik, like, Delhi have great spearmen. Delhi have great horsemen, right? Like, I feel like Delhi just has a lot of answers to everything here, especially early feudal. Oh, the sheep clash, they bonk into each other. You see that one sheep? He was like, hey, <laughs> get out of my way. And the other sheep was like, meep, meep. You know, never mind. We need to give them, uh, they need to have collision. <laughs> collision? Oh, my gosh. Could you imagine running a scout through the middle of a fight to like keep the spearman back? And there's like blood. Never mind. What? Um, <laughs> Are you, I uh, was no, imagining I collision mean, like a crash, <laughs> like like they would crash into each other, and the sheep just like what, splatter. How about they ragdoll? They just go crashing yeah. into each other and fly over each other. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Now you're talking oh. my language. I need that. I just love the idea of one clumsily rolling over the side and then just getting up and just <laughs> skipping after the scout. Oh man. So, tech up complete. We've got the first horseman coming out. Um, one interesting thing about playing Hippodrome is if you can survive the first few minutes and be in good shape, Triumph isn't like the be-all-end-all. It's the fact you've now got horsemen that are going to raid a sieve that aren't staying underneath their TC, right? 
And yeah, that's going to be advantageous because Vortex, you need something that moves fast into his economy because he actually got a really good spawn. Berries and deer behind the base means a slow moving army wouldn't be able to starve him. Yeah, so Vortex just spotted the Hippodrome there, I think. I was like, oh crap, horseman. <laughs> right. <laughs> um. the, the other thing I like about the Hippodrome in this matchup is I always say if you want to try to have an edge over Delhi, you need to force them off of their Ghazi opening. This is the type of thing that would make you think twice about Ghazi. He's going to go for it anyway, because you can kind of kite triumph to a certain degree, right? But like, it doesn't feel great now because you do have an instance where big clash, if it occurs, if it's not raiding damage consistently, you're going to lose the fight, right? That's where triumph yeah. is best. Yeah, if you can force the fight and your opponent has to engage, triumph is just super strong. But it is limited, um, and those windows are rare, right? So it's going to be up to Puppy to finding and using those windows and so yeah gonna be gauzy with spearman support i love interesting it. delay on the archers move. Hmm. Hmm. i wonder if he would like kill a few there but like the fact he didn't kill any i think he was suspicious hmm. that vortex might come out onto the deer which would be kind of weird anyway um but he's at least wasting their time more horsemen coming and it is indeed going to be the keshik play <laughs> yep keshiks it is it makes a lot of sense they've been doing this for a long time um, I say they, just Puppy and Wham. I think both have been seeing the value of that. And I wonder if they've had some practice games where they're like, holy crap, this is really good on Arabia or something. Um, no. So we'll see that first wave of Keshex coming out now. So now, yeah, like you're saying, it is, they are trapped into a cavalry combo. But the idea is if you take one really, really good fight, you then buy yourself the space to build a more diverse composition later. Um, and you need that because the reality is yeah. like if you played infantry straight away, you have to remember that you're playing into a Delhi advantage there, right? Because if this turned into a full infantry blob, there's a 20% quicker attacking. So I, I like the idea. Um, I'm hoping we're not going to get the, the build that you see just south of the border of the Canadians, which is the, the fast castle cataphract follow-up with system the first deal. I'm not going to talk about that build. It did happen in some tournament qualifiers. Um, I won't. It's fun. It's fun. No, it's no, just stop. very hard. <laughs> it's just very hard to play, and it's not the strongest build. So I think that's kind of where it, it struggles a little bit. But yeah. it has potential at times. I do the wonder... elephant, the elephant with no, sister. Please. Have you ever seen it? It's really fun. It's really fun. I, I'm going to let me just put it you. Uh, I actually <laughs> okay. think like, Hippodrome looks best All when right. you play Merc Houses on the trade posts. I just don't think Poppy Paul can sadly do that in this type of game, right? Because, like, Ghazi will spot you going out on the flanks quite easily. Um, I think Puppy's going to try and contest this right now. I think we're about to have an explosive fight. Triumph is going to have to get popped at the right time. Oh, man, I just sat up more in my seat, and then now I'm sad. Okay, so he's not going to take the fight. He's going to give away the first sacred site. What if he's we waiting for villains? archers to deal with spears? It's too many spears, right? So he's gonna wait for archers to get. Well, he, he's um, trying to cut the trickle, right? Because like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I liked it from Puppy Paw. He was trying to panic Vortex into running the extra troops out and then intercept the reinforcements. But Vortex, great discipline here. Just camps at home. Puppy Paw, is he gonna activate it? No, no way. You don't want to waste it, right? Um, you need it, I think. If you're expecting to have a big fight in the center over a sacred site later. You're, you're going to have to plan for it. And man, these sacred sites kind of favor the south side of the map. But there is one way up in the north. That is a really split sacred site spawn. That might be really tricky for Vortex to get control over while maintaining the middle one, which kind of favors Puppy Paw's side I, of the map. I think in this matchup now, because you know it's Hippodrome, you don't really feel like you need all three sacred sites, right? Like two is a good eco advantage because <laughs> your opponent has got his eco advantage. Now instead, he's no. going to lose troops here. And he activates he's the triumph. triumph. Is there a fight in the middle? So I think he went on the sacred site, but I don't think there's much there. No, th this is... That's exactly what you Tragedy. can't do, right? Like, that is exactly the problem of Triumph. If you misuse it, that first charge lasts a long time, but you're up against Mass Ghazi. It's over. Uh, that was a really rough, really rough moment. I wonder if that was a misclick or just panic because he's like, oh, I need to kill these before they kill my Vils. Um... He sent uh, the whole army south to deal with a scholar. Like, he sniped a scholar, sure, but I don't think Triumph is usually needed for that. Uh, I don't even think he got the scholar. Did he? Did he not? I, there's a second one being produced. He's killed I think he one is. unit. I think it's a Ghazi, right? Uh, might be. I don't trust army value these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah 130. Yeah, he killed a scholar. Oh, <laughs> okay. 
Because remember, he has okay. two. He's reproducing now. Right, right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. So he didn't even kill Agazi with the triumph activation. So now he's going to have to wait. Yeah. <laughs> Just as you typed to him, it's like, okay, can we chill for another five minutes? I need to replenish. Mm -hmm. Replenish? <laughs> yeah. So the Good archers... Way. Oh, he has triumph again already. For three seconds. <laughs> then it's gone. High value. For one auto. Spear count's low, but honestly, that's a lot of horsemen and Kershik's yeah. being sacrificed. It's a lot of archers. He mops up the archers to make it worthwhile. Actually, a really good fight for Bobby Paul. The Kashyyyk's worth wow. their weight in gold there. Yeah, the... Oh, the second score? He... Oh, no, 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 no. The Kashyyyk goes in. This is such a big kill. Remember, Vortex, he doesn't have any gold trickle yet. Holy crap. By God, I, I am so, it. so impressed by this from Bobby Paul. So even with the accidental click on the Triumph, he was able to take the fight. The Kashyyyk edition really adds a lot of beef to the, to the Biz army, and there were enough archers here, and he just took the engagement against the Spearman, and Vortex is just gonna call it. What? Dude, that was insane. We need to really, what? like, dissect what happened there with Poppy Paul. That was incredible. So, like, the Keshik spam was high enough, as you mentioned. The, the short triumph looks ugly, but it's, like, it's still bonus damage while you're whittling away. It was that wave one of attack. Coming it was in. one attack. Like, I don't know if it was that No, 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 but it's, it's, like, so, no, it's three seconds, so it's six extra HP per unit. You're already into No, but he was them. microing. It's... He got one attack <laughs> with most of his cav. But, but um, let me finish. Like, chill. Okay, let, let, let get, Here's finished. the I'm important knock-on detail that makes it really good there. Because there's no capture of sacred sites, there's no escalation to the Delhi's production. Delhi can't get enough backline together, let alone Spearman together. You have to remember that he lost that scholar. He had to reproduce a second scholar to try and capture another sacred site. That means he's getting outproduced because with system mm -hmm. level two plus a stable archery range added in, you have a superior production rate than the Delhi. It's a rare instance where you can actually outmass them at 12 to 50 minutes. And I want to pour Poppy Paul because that was sick, exec uh, sick execution. That first triumph was ugly. It didn't really do much. But because he denied the Scholar, at least, it completely unraveled the game for Vortex. Well, I think there's a little bit more to it there, right? Um, typically, like historically, the way that Delhi plays on Arabia is not opening with the stable like that. Um, I think that may have slowed him down a bit, right? Uh, you you always open stables as, as Delhi. Like you, uh... you, always, you, only, no, no, you only open something other than stables if you're forced to, right? It was a little bit surprising. But a he... lot of people, but no, but against what I mean is against a knight's. Oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But like that's the thing, like, right? Like it's, that's what it's I mean, a discount against... knight. That's why he thinks it's good to in Vortex's mind, uh, like kind of get where he's coming from. He's like, it's hippodrome. I don't they know. turn into worse knights for a small instance, right? So I don't blame him for the Gazi opening. It's still your premium unit. The problem is like he got in, he denied that wall, but then he was kind of content with that, right? Like imagine if he tried to after the triumph ended go into the enemy base and continue to raid with the raiders, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's the sticky issue is it's almost like he gets confident when he sees that he's, like, killed the scholar. Uh, sorry, when he's, like, uh, forced to triumph rather, and he's like, oh, yeah, this is great. I can now go back and play a macro game as the Delhi, which is very deceptive. I think, like, the big trick for Vortex is Hippodrome is really underexplored still. It's very mm -hmm. difficult to execute, and Grand Winery is a safe bet. And if you think about it, if you had to draw the percentages of contracts... I feel like 65% of, of contracts are the Western. Then like 30%, maybe 35% of the remaining is, is the Malian contract with the, the Javs, right? There's not mm -hmm. many examples of Keshit games for you to kind of sink your teeth into. I kind of stopped listening because I was looking at the draft. All right, well, we'll move on from that one. I'm just saying, I'm just looking at it, because this is something a little alarming. Puppy let Ottomans through. Wait, what? But got China. Is that really? I, I feel mean, like it's... For a... him, that's an edge, but, like, it's still, you're giving over Ottomans. The irony is Vortex, Why? the guy who was like, Ottomans not that great, I let them through all the time, chose a robot. Them. Uh, reconnect. Vodka. All right, we are back. Apologies for that, folks. Oh, man, this is... <laughs> so, the draft is a little bit funky. I will give you that. But here's the interesting thing. Puppy Paw still actually got his Byzantines again. And legit, like, I will bat this guy on Byzantines. We already mentioned this. Like, he's <laughs> impressive on them. We just saw exactly why he has the, the, the flexibility. The interesting part to me is, like, 
the Mongo Malians at the end, it, it's my worry is like Vortex this this game. If you get Ottomans and your backs up against the wall, your first thought is pick Ottomans, right? Like you instinctually just go pick Ottomans. So what's Puppy Paul's mindset? Like what is his counter here? Is it English? Is it Byzantines? I, I feel like it has to be Byzantines, especially on a map like Lipany, right? You think he just does back to back biz? I think so. I actually, I think Lipany is a really good map for Byzantines. And they, surprisingly enough, I feel like the, the aggro timing hits better than the English. Like, the English have a better timing for the first six Lombos, but then Byzantines just feel better after that, right? Because they have a huge eco buff, right? They have 10%, then they just go up from there. Uh, whereas the English don't even get any sort of eco buff until they build farms first. I don't think you want to go biz against Ottoman. I don't think that works very well. You don't think Longbo Limitane is like a perfect counter to the late game autos? Late game? Yeah, I guess. I don't think it, I don't think biz work for the castle age timing. You just camp with Lombos, right? Okay, no, he's going to China. <laughs> so, confident surging. He's going up against the Oppermans with his yeah. unbeaten China. Reminder, he's now at six wins in the tournament, no losses with this Civ. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. I think trying to make sense. They both just picked their first pick, right? Because for Puppy Paw, I think he's looking to clinch it with this uh, draft reset. And I think Vortex has to just put strongest Civ first, right? Um, he's got Ottomans, Japan, Mongols, and Mali. Mm, I'm... And he did ban a Ubids so that he could play Mongols. I guess he's saving Maybe the that been a play. for like the Japanese matchup if it's predictable. And then you get like yeah. Jean Dark versus Marlins or Mongols. So I think the Jean Dark Mongol matchup is like it's kind of 50 50, right? Because Keshix can kill Jean, but you're trading against Jean, right? Is right. the case. So like it's separate. Maybe. Um, and then the English is just like we don't need to go that deep, right? Because like of these matchups, unless you can get like an English Japanese situation. But then, I, I feel like the English is not going to get picked here. I feel like that's a very risky pick for Puppy Paul. Everything else makes sense, though, right? For the remaining games, like, you could easily see Chinese, Jean d'Arc, and, and Byzantines doing well here. Hmm. This is interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, so much, it's so refreshing to actually kind of have the situation where you get into this point in the draft where there's a complete refresh, and he's like, okay, we've seen some hands. How are they going to play out? We have to go from, from the get-go again. I actually, like, love that implementation of the draft i mean it's a bit confusing <laughs> to be honest uh, i get a little lost but i think it makes a lot of sense right it, it's yeah. cool to just have to think about it again right we get some of the same matchups or different matchups um even though we get repeat saves it's it's interesting um that's for sure i think what i like I the most know. about it is that there are situations where draft runs its course to the point that it's I don't want to say underwhelming, but it's like, okay, the outcome is just foretold, right? Like, you, you look and like, oh, we've got English and Marlins left there. It's like, well, we know how that's going to go. I like the idea of a mid-series redraft because it gives a reset and there's comeback potential, right? In that it's not just about you drafting. The draft still matters, but it's not the be-all, end-all. I actually, like, I think this is the best drafting format we've probably had in AoE4 to date. Probably. I think it's also really helps that there's so many civs now that it's yeah. enabled. And it also really helps that there's a lot of good maps in this tournament. I think I think that to me is really exciting. Um it doesn't feel like there's a single map in this tournament that feels like a throwaway or a bad map. Yep. Um every single one just feels hype and cool and it they're all still unique while offering AoE for like classic experience. And I think that's really, really, really cool. Um I'm trying to think about how this matchup plays out um, in, in in late feudal. It's 2TC. Like, it's going to be very hard to dive. Uh, a boomy game. Yeah. Maybe. Like, maybe yeah. Fa like, I don't think you fast castle Chinese, right? Like that. Because mm -hmm. palace guards can get shredded quite easily by Janissaries when you tell, right? So, like, if it's, if it's castle castle sort of thing, China would get there quicker. But I don't think you'd feel stronger for it. And, like, this. You could argue with the the way the deers and berries spawn, you have a lot of food flexi. So maybe that's an option. But I find that yeah. that fast castle build for the Chinese works better against civs that have to come out under pocketed resources, right? Whereas Ottoman players, they just get a madrissa and they stay at home. 
I mean, it's Lippany though. There's a chance that you get a really wallable base, right? And I think if you get that like really cliffed in resources and you have like Barbican on the one main choke point in the center with the stealth forest, I feel like that could make it really hard for Ottoman to punish 2TC song boom mm. into just like the classic maybe Palace Guard B in early castle. Um, I feel like still Ottomans have a really threatening dive on that late feudal because they just there's just a point where they just have so much military right so it's sort of like i'm trying to think of like if you try and play defensive here as puppy you're gonna have to kind of put up a master class in defense because ottoman pressure like hits right when china i feel like is the weakest in most of their classic build orders i think there is obviously the option of just mash you new again um which i think would be how you deal with the ottoman play but i feel like there's a risk there yeah. that ottomans could turtle and get to, you know, one Manganel. And then suddenly they have free Manganels on the field. And it's like kind of yeah. a reset there. So I think there's a bit of a threat there. Um, I'm just trying to predict a bit what so, Puppy might do. I, I don't know. I feel like he has to set the tempo, right? So but here's the sure. thing. There's a lot of people that are dirty, prolific Ottoman spammers uh, on the lattice, right? And I imagine Puppy Paul has been secretly practicing the Chinese somewhere we can't see. He's probably had some scrims with Magic. I know that both of them love China, but Magic also loves mm. Ottomans a lot. So he's got some practice in there. But he's probably just been Tom, Dick, and Harry in the ladder, and we just didn't know it because he changed his location in the world and made a new account, right? I've seen this from Puppy Paul already. I know, I know, I think he's got like a, a South American account. I'm pretty sure he's got a European account. How did he do that, Winston? How did he create those accounts and pretend to mark himself somewhere else in the world? He. Invested in Surfshark by that must be it. Getting it through EGC TV's link, mm. and he supported the tournament that he's getting paid to play in. Um, and he got three months free, and it and cost him like he hid what? strategies. Yeah, for, for like three dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and it's not just good for tournament players; it's good for you people in pubs because I know, I know, like I come from a dirt background. I have way too many games on Hoodwink. You know what happens? I get in a game, they ban Hoodwink straight away. It's happening to you on the ladder as well. So save yourself from that. Use the code EGCTV over at Surfshark. Get three months. Only £2.50 a month. But now, it's time to see if Vortex is going to be dishing the pounding. Or if it's going to be receiving it here. We hop into Lippany. Game number five. Puppy Port or match point. Vortex. Ottomans are so overpowered and powerful, Winston, that they have crashed the game. That is just impeccable stuff. So this game crashed, ladies and gentlemen. So we will have a quick reset here. Same yep. sieves, same map, new map. Or, sorry, same sieves, same map, but new map draw, right? So just completely new game. Um, yeah, that's life sometimes. Sometimes you eat the bear, and sometimes the bear eats you. The trick is to not dislike that, because that's life. To, to not get eaten by the bear? No, sometimes you just get eaten by the bear. That's life, man. Like, so, but they say a bear only attacks if you move. So if I just, like, stay still, am I definitely getting eaten by the bear, or am I less likely to get eaten I by think, the bear? Isn't that, like, from Jurassic Park? I think bears can see, like, things. I, think they I mean, but they, they get angry move. when you move, right? You know what I'm hearing, Winston? I'm, like, I'm hearing that, we, that we're doing research on bears because bears are getting added to the game. Get huh? No. Um, all right. The stronghold player in me just wants to watch a, a bear walk a bear. into a, Ch a Chinese base and just maul 20 villagers before dying. <laughs> Chinese player just shrugs, goes, I'm 2TC Song. It doesn't even hurt. Um, but mm -hmm. like, it's, it's fun. This gives us a little bit more time to kind of dissect this matchup because I think there is some interesting timings in Feudal Age. Uh, one thing to notice is, though, is the Ottoman players. They're slightly less aggressive at the beginning of Feudal Age than they were before because most of them are going for the Anatolian Hills to get more food, right? So you're not seeing that ramp up immediately where they get an Imam heal in a melee mosh pit or they get a meta straight away. And that mm. means that I think like, most of the time you're seeing Chinese players actually get their Barbican mostly for free as long as they don't get overzealous with its placement. Yeah, I think what's actually lucky for Puppy Paw, and I'm going to say this, it's a bit lucky that he rerolled that map because his map spawn was not very good um, for Chinese defensive play early. Um, so I think, like, the fact that this is a crash, I, like, kind of benefits him a little bit. Vortex had a really interesting map where it was pretty tucked away in the north there, whereas, like, 
Puppet Paw had a very open front. Um, and I think if we get a reroll where it's they swap positions or something in a similar style map, that can be huge. This is why I'm not allowed to compete because, like, I would just keep rerolling. I get in and I just type "sorry trees" right and just go again. Now that's a reference. So you to you, you load. Tree. Like... You look at your map for two seconds. Alt F4. That's it's so like, BM KP. <laughs> Did you just blatantly admit that you would cheat if given the opportunity? No. Oh man. No. I, I, I said that's that, why. <laughs> I said that I conveniently just have trees falling on my power lines. Okay, that doesn't sound believable in the UK. That <laughs> did happen. Didn't that happen a that couple did years happen ago? To Puffy was it Ball. Genesis? Yeah. Like, no, was, it was one of no, the Red Bull tournaments. Genesis. I think it's Golden League. Golden League. Golden League. Right. Yeah, it's either I Golden League that. or Road to Red Bull Wallalo. They had. I remember a, a seeing rush. the picture. Yeah, I remember just seeing a picture of it. Like, huh? Because they were like, just so you guys know, we're being honest. Here's a picture of a tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, it is time. We have not crashed. Can confirm. We're at least going to get two minutes in this game. Game five. Puppy Paul, his signature Chinese, yet to be beaten on them. Vortex on the Opermans, the unstoppable sieve, the sieve that he has consistently let through. He oh, look at the map for feels... Puppy. Wait, what? I just, it, it feels, oh. it's so secure. The it's barbican so... drop is going to be disgusting. You think he's going to barbican drop? Like, you, you drop those three resources there, right? And then you wall off the north side with the deer. Oh, is. I thought you meant, like, a forward, no, 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 like, no, 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 in no. Vortex's no, we, town center to... barbican <laughs> drop. That's what that's called. You just mean, like, yeah, it's just, like, a very cozy barbican. Um, the, the food is a bit far, to be fair, on Puppy's map, but I think the rest of it, like, yeah, it's just so cozy. Yeah, the second deer is weird. <laughs> it's just... It's, it's in a safe place on the high ground, but it's so absurdly far forward, you'd probably yeah, never you go don't, for it. You don't, I mean, maybe you barbican, like, kind of on the south side of that, but I don't think so. I think you barbican your gold and your stone, right? If you're in a deli game, yeah, but, like, yeah, in a, in a game like this, you just play it safer. Um, yeah. Vortex on the other side does go for that standard opening with the military school. Interesting thing about this opening that makes it so openmans is that not only can you try to harass your opponent initially, but the spearmen have an added benefit afterwards, and that's the deer push. A lot of these Ottoman players have been getting up to three spears and then starting to tech up. And they move the three spears across and they can basically corral all these deer home. Yeah, but I don't think we've seen Vortex do that yet. Um, right? Not in the tournament, I believe. I think I saw Crackety talking about that earlier, right? Like that was not that was every HRE player where he outpost rushed, right? Like yeah, this... but not every player is doing the spear push. The spear deer. The spear deer it's, push? I, it's is that what it's become... called? Um SDB? I'm worried that's the, a bad acronym. Spear, I don't want to guess the spear, acronyms. The Spear Deer Steer? That sounds like a dance. Either way, it's going to become <laughs> what more What dances more are you doing? Ones where uh, I have to avoid spears while dancing with deers, clearly. No one wants a Bambi repeat. Um, the, the interesting <laughs> thing, though, is like as, as the meta keeps developing, I think actually like this year deer pushing is gonna become such a critical element as we move on. Like it, it's actually insane how valuable it is. Especially if you're in a meta where two TC is not as viable, right? Like it gets punished a lot more. Right. Yeah, because the second TC is just historically like the last like year and a half or so, even longer, the second TC just goes like directly on top of the deer, kind of regardless of what's around it. Um, just to keep the food safe and it secures your castle timing, right? And military production if you need it. Um Whereas now that the two TC is kind of fallen out of favor due to balance changes and just the meta as well shifting with those balance changes, we've seen a lot of players do some things to secure the deer or do different builds that are less reliant on them. And um, what makes this really powerful for the Ottomans is like if you have that deer, right, you could technically do a fast sim. I'm not saying he's going to do it, but like it gives you that option on the table with the extra food and Madrissa. The other interesting thing is the Spearman opener benefits most because um, the... There's different aggro ranges, funnily enough, for different, like, units. And I, I remember I was talking, I can't remember which pro it was, I was talking to him, like, over a year ago about it. And apparently Spearmen have the lowest aggro range, which means they can get as close as possible to the deer and keep shoving them, right? So you get more accurate push-ins, basically. Interesting. Who knows? Maybe Vortex will surprise me and do it this game. It's definitely an option for that right deer pack for him. Um... But, Especially against yeah, the, like the Chinese, like unless the scout goes over and denies them now, like this has usually been the downer. Is like when you make that play, people come back and snipe you. It looks like Vortex instead though. The spearman. The tax man. Kill. He got oh. stabbed once, twice. Okay, yeah, <laughs> and fine. 
I mean, you you say he's fine. Is he fine? Like, he <laughs> looks he like okay, but have you asked back? him, is he okay? He might not be mentally okay. <laughs> is it like one of those dramatic Taxman characters in a movie? He's like, oh, he hurt me so badly and just shows you like a really tiny bruise on his arm. Sure. To death. That's his punishment. Um, so Archer's coming from Puppy Paw. <laughs> all yeah. right. I guess he's going to go for... Like, he's not going for stone at all, right? Like, he needs to actually rescue this area. There is an Archer play coming out from Vortex, though. And this is the kind of thing that gets scary. Is like when you get drawn deeper and deeper into this feudal age as the Chinese, you feel more and more uncomfortable in the game. Especially if it's actively yeah. denying you getting to your Song Dynasty point. Well, especially against Ottomans, right? Because... As, as Ottomans start to approach late feudal, they're, that's when all of their timings just start to click in. That they get all their upgrades and their production rates are really high. If they need more production buildings, it's really cheap for them to tech into them. The military schools have just been consistently paying off. And then, bang, suddenly you have 60 units in your base, right? Like, it's, it's really scary how quickly Ottomans go from 25 units and you have, like, 20 or 30. And then suddenly Ottomans have 50 or 60 and you have, like, 35. Um... It's very, very quick um, how quickly that can spike. So it's it's up to Puppy Paw here to figure out how to defend this. Um, where is it's he going to put his like, Barbican, you think? It has to be right side, right? Like, maybe he goes left because it's closer to the enemy base, right? It's like a full position type thing. Um, but for now, like, I'm curious. Puppy Paw, does he actually just try to full aggro here? Because, like, Vortex, he, has, he doesn't have active reduction. He's done the greedy Ottoman build where he sets up the military schools first. And it looks like Puppy's just going to be spamming out Archer Spear, something you don't see often from China, <laughs> but it is really doable. And what's interesting about the strat is pre-Song, you can actually still get decent timings on certain upgrades, like economic upgrades, or even if he adds a Blacksmith in, you can get it really quickly because these units are still generating a ton of attacks back, oh. right? So the discount is big. The, this is genius for Puppy Paw. Vortex is going to TC. Yeah, like, he has no his... reason to gather more stone, right? He's got two military schools. Like, he's going 2TC because he assumes this is a typical Song Dynasty Chinese game, right? But well, Puppy not Paul... anymore. He sees eight archers. <laughs> yeah, but th this is the problem. By the time he sees it, he's already delayed, right? Like, I think, yeah, he's still actively gathering stone. I think he just pulled back. So it's still wasted time. He's having to set up outpost now and condense himself. And this is difficult because if you look at that blacksmith placement, there's no safe spot now to build additional production Barbican. This isn't. This is a Barbican coming up. Are you kidding me? He's gonna barbican. He's gonna build a barbican on. Oh, I was hoping it would be more on top of the military schools to camp them, but right in between the forests here is really spicy. Hear me out. You still have more production buildings here afterwards, so you, you aren't disadvantaged, right? Because like right now, yeah, you keep adding more troops. That. They run across the map. Vortex has a comeback, but and now Vortex, he's genuinely trying to go for a fast castle here. That's crazy. With no military buildings. <laughs> I mean, he'll have to add a stable and I guess try for Lancers? Mm. Or Man at Arms? It, Maybe a barracks for Man at Arms? Man -at -arms you have to do Man at Arms. Here. It's but, annoying because the Barbican, but you have But you to know, Zhugnu are on the way, right? Surely Zhugnu get trained now, right? And if you have like 15 Man at Arms, or sorry, if you have 15 Zhugnu. <laughs> this is so puppy poor. I remember when this guy started playing Age of Empires 4. He was a filthy, stinking outpost rusher, right? His average game time, Winston, was 12 minutes. He only played Chinese and Mongols. He perfected it. I think I even have a video on my channel somewhere called Agent Sheep, where he snuck sheep into the enemy wood line so he could outpost snipe them. He lived on it. He thrived in it. He bathed in it. And I love that all these years later, like all, all this evolution as a player, all the different things he can do. And on the deciding game, like <laughs> when he's on match point, He's basically going back to his traditional Barbican outpost rushing. I think the problem here for Vortex is he's playing on less than a screen of space. Mm -hmm. Like, he is so closed in here. He is so scared of the outside world. Everything everything he has is on your screen. That Where's one shot is literally everything he has. It what is. food? He's got yeah. the madressa and berries. But, and but that's why this outpost is important, right? That's why he needs to stop yeah. it. Because if yeah. this outpost goes up, you can't gather madressa. Tech He's going to have to wait for this first, this first Ram. Um, or sorry, this first Mangonel. Rebuche. <laughs> Could you imagine if he asked that? 
<laughs> trebuchet. I mean, it kind of makes sense. It'll deal with the Barbican and the, the thing, but it won't deal with the Jugnu mess because the Mangonel will help with that and also maybe help deal with the outposts. Um, I kind of would have preferred the Mangonel maybe. He's but actually I'm not saying sure. here now, he's like, I need more food. Uh, you don't mind if I borrow yours, right? Vortex just be completely like covered in gaffer tape. He's like, I can't answer. Undermesh is coming in. He's now queuing up the lances. He's moving very far away to gather his wood. So that's kind of a danger point. Luckily, you are against low moving units of the Chinese, right? So it should be able to threaten you. I'm wiggling around the south here. Not really going to be able to sneak by. That outpost is really clutch to preventing that rotation around the back. Um, Wow. This looks really threatening, but I'm starting to get a little worried for Puppy Paw. He's going to be adding rams. Oh, so he's just full sending it. Okay. Okay, you, you have to. If, if you wait, like, he's already worried about that mango play, right? When he comes out as, as Treb, he's going to be like, oh, thank God, I've got two more minutes. But it's all about getting, like, three or four rams and going. Um, because the other issue is Vortex, because he chose Lancers, he's not really accruing many melee units quickly, right? It's not like when you do men at arm spam. I don't know if this works. I think what, what Vortex is doing is really smart. So he's investing in a few Lancers, and I think he's sending them north, right? I think there's one right now a little north of his base. Okay, no, that's that the email. <laughs> That's not the. It is what it is. No, Winston. If they get up there and they roll low. But if these lancers are gonna apply a lot of like mental pressure to Puppy, right? Like he's gonna have to find a way to deal with them. He's gonna have to keep spearmen around his eco. He's gonna have to keep track of his economy, rather than just focusing on the front, right? Whereas where he wants to put his attention. And now his next army is gonna be a little delayed to supporting this. Okay, this this might be a bit of an overinvestment. I think from the, Puppy the potentially. Problem, yeah, this it, is it, a lot. He's quite committed, but like, look, he's starting to actually macro up a bit, right? That's a lot of food and gold now in reserve. And you have to remember over time, Song is adding more villagers in. The interesting detail to me, though, is like, you see all these outposts and you go Treb. We have to remember Trebs, they're not exactly what I'd call a sniper elite boy, right? They, they have a tendency to whiff on some shots. So these outposts might take longer than um, is ideal oh, to take out. Line. No. The wood line. Your vision, Vortex. He's going to see this and shift away. Puppy Paw, he went a little bit too deep. He doesn't know yet. Remember, he hasn't got a scout here. Puppy Paw never rebuilt that. He's going straight for the mosque. Oh, this is just so terrifying. Oh, this outpost, like, he needs to dive this outpost. It's double hand cannon, though, and he's scared. Spears are being targeted right now. A little bit of freebie coming over. And that's basically Puppy Paw's way of actually blitzing this down. So he's going to run back towards this. Uh, Vortex, he's moving up onto the high ground there with the relic gathering him up. Spear count's just going to deplete here. I, I think Poppy Paw, he needs to get up the cast late day stab. Now it's going to come in with the backstab, but wait, wait. wait. Wallalo? Wallalo? Okay. <laughs> Couldn't let yeah, him get the away. Lancers, the Lancers are a really good play here. I, I really like that addition from Vortex. Um, I think it just really helped shut this down. This FC, I kind of questioned it at first. I was like, FC with what? You have nothing, but he had enough sheep. He probably sent more sheep. He had the berries, at least for a while. Um, this is the never-ending <laughs> battle. <laughs> this, this outpost is, and this treb are depressing me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Look away, children. This is what sadness seems to be. <laughs> um, the, the raids. are going to be coming the other way. And keep in mind, like the, one, one thing I'd like to highlight back, like when Vortex brought that first lance around and attacked the Chuganu, you thought it was good, but like remember what it gave up? If he didn't reveal that until he reached the deal on the backside, I think Puppy Paul would have struggled to get the food for this tech up play. But now you can see, like, after that raid came in, he immediately started walling on the north side. And it means these Lancers have less clean targets now. Yep. Puppy's up. And uh, the, yeah, the raids didn't really come in for either player, even though Vortex, like, his, I still think it's crazy lucky for Vortex that his, uh, his woodline didn't get just murdered. I just love how he's killing landmarks quicker than, than Vortex here, who has the trap. The Barbican hasn't been touched yet. The outpost is still standing. Raid's going to come in, but Spimmin are there. This is always the awkward thing with Lancer opening, right? It's like, there is a unit your opponent could have built in Feudal Age that counters you. Um, the problem is the men at arms, like with all these outposts, just didn't feel like a, an efficient way for Vortex to break out. Yeah, the knights, the knights were good. I think it also just was a threat, right? It forced Puppy to play differently than he was, right? It, it, it actively changed the state through which Puppy had to, like, view the map. And I think that's a really good thing for Vortex, right? Is he... He, he didn't just react, react, react. He, he forced Puppy to react to something with the with even just a few, um, which is really solid. 
now I think Vortex needs to look into how can he secure his own base because now Puppy is adding his own knights and he has a pretty big eco lead. So if he's able to get like a, a solid position, it could get to it could start to get really scary. You're also predictable if you're Vortex now, right? Like these outposts are telling you Vortex has not moved east. If he's still in this game, where is all his eco? You already scouted a little bit on the left side. He already knows where to go with these lances. And we can see that deer stack location. Vortex hasn't walled himself in at all. It's a very exposed area of the map for both his wood and his food. Mm -hmm. But down goes the forward. The rams are here. The treb finally <laughs> finishes that outpost. The guys are like, we're done. We're done. And then there's another outpost. Um, we're free. We're but free. This raid could be big on the left. That is exposed economy. You know what I love is all that effort for a treb and it turns out rams for what he needed all along there. Like, it's going to be so demoralizing. Well, but that the Mangonel as well would have been just fine, right? It would have dealt with it slowly, but like at least it would have prevented repair bills, right? Whereas the treb just doesn't really do much. Oh man, that's rough. A lot of lost now, units there. Yeah, the funny part as well is he's actually upgrading them. And now oh, the no. Lancers, this is big. Vortex needs to get Immediate out. Immediate reaction though. That's really good for him. It's a few. Vortex is going to be limited on food at home though. And that's still going to be several villages going down in the game where you know Song Dynasty has been activated for several minutes now. I think he has to figure out with this dive here, he has to know that there's no wood. He has vision on all the wood. So where is the wood coming from? He's got like, all good, huh? He has to know it's here, right? You'd think he'd be suspicious of it. Love this though, the Lance is getting in time to start hitting up these rams. He might be able to keep the barbican up longer. And that's just gonna be frustration because to that whole wood point, it's denying options still from Vortex. But sadly, nice quick on the reaction. Looks like Poppy Paul is gonna have to try and find a way to, to essentially protect himself at home here, right? Like the Lancer raids are nice, but I feel like we're approaching a point where you have to start thinking, how do I get towards Nest of Bees? Like how do I win a main fight? Well, when you're in that 18 minute mark, which is where in a slow feudal, you have three mangonels and in a FC, you would have four. He's only going to have three, right? Mm -hmm. But three mangonels is kind of generally the magic number where Ottomans can just have options. It feels like to start to like really Vortex. threaten stuff, even if they've been, oh, no way. Uh, this one might kill them all. Archers and chicken are in. Vortex, it happened again. That's <laughs> rough. Why did he go? He just uh, needs food. He needs right? food. Like, but, well, well he, he has the sheep. Still, still, right? No, no, no. It's not even the sheep. Look to the right of his base. The deer that Puppy was taking, he reclaimed that entire area. Like, why did he go back? I, I guess I just don't get it. But now he's going to have to deal with this and he's going to get the fight. But does he want to fight? The Chinese looking so strong here. Vortex has more units, but maybe of the and wrong type. It's the health the, the engagement. Meta goes down. The Hellfars are terrible. Vortex is frontline of Knights there, so he's not going to last long. He's going to lose this one. Yeah, the Archer's not bringing much to the table here for Vortex. They've been able to defend early. The Megan L uh, shots <laughs> miss <laughs> completely. He's, he might lose the Mangoes. The Lancers see it. They're going to go straight for it. That's a freebie. One more oh, hit. He's going to lose one of them here. Good. Archers with the body blocks might be able to protect the second, but that's still an expensive loss. And Vortex now quickly losing control of his own base area. Yeah, the Barbican being very awkward here for the unit pathing. There just isn't much space. So Is the Archers over? are getting a decent engagement, but yeah, the GG gets called. And oh my gosh, Puppy Paw with a dominant performance today. Holy crap. And he keeps the dream alive. Puppy Paul will make it through to that semifinals showdown with Beastie Cutie next uh, weekend. But this is an interesting game to dissect to round us out. You know, we talked about like, you know, is, is Ottomans OP? Can you let them through? I love Puppy Paul and the Chinese here, man. He's still undefeated. So he good. got two more wins in this series alone. He has seven wins, no losses. This has become a ban worthy sieve for him. And you know what was wild, Winston? is like, this wasn't a one-sided affair. I, I'd say like uh, it looked really good for Puppy Paul in the early game. But he hung, he hung around a little bit too long, right? Like, he started to go into this mass night comp. It looked like it was going to be good for Vortex, but I think the critical point you hit on at the end there is this predictability of moving back to the same area again and again just strung him up and left it yeah. hook, line, and sinker for a finish for the Canadian. I mean, think about it, K KP. We were talking about the ways that Puppy could play that, right? We were saying, okay, maybe he goes for, like, the 2TC into Jugnu or 2TC FC, all these things. And those had to be probably what Vortex was predicting as well. Do you think Vortex predicted 
archer spearman instantly <laughs> running across the map into Barbican in between his wood lines, towers around the right, denying the berries. Did you ex- did you think Vortex expected that? Because the way he played surely didn't, right? And I think credit to Vortex, he did adapt pretty well, I think, on the kind of into the mid game. I yep. think it just a couple mistakes there kind of really sealed the deal for Puppy. Whereas I think that game was up in the air before those raids. I think before that happened, if Vortex had kept his economy alive, I think we're still looking at a pretty fair game. Vortex had more units on the field. They were just so out of position twice in a row that the Ville lead just kind of became insurmountable. And then that big fight happened and Vortex wasn't ready for a fight to happen there. The Mangadels were not in position to hit on the archers and he did not have enough anti-cav. Um, so really, really tough there for Vortex. I think all around solid performance from him, but Puppy getting two wins with China, winning with Biz, um, got that really good matchup early game. He baited the Ottoman pick late game, right? Like with the redraft, he's just like, all right, I'll give you Ottomans because I have a plan if you just pick them. And I, I think wow, what we saw stuff here, all around. What we saw here is pretty interesting is an all round adaptability by Puppy Paw, I want to say. Like, mm-hmm. even that game one, with the way it opened, with the fact that he got those four eco kills, or three eco kills, almost four at the start, he immediately decided to play a longer feudal than most IB players would. Then you go into game three, where this weird tower rush happens, and his adaptability is, oh, you're playing into two TC? I'm not going to play a TC race. I'm going to all in Shukin Noom. Game four, even, I think genuinely, after getting forced to just pull the triumph the way he did, most players on the Byzantines would retract, and they play more defensive. Then the Delhi would get their edge. Once again, he denies it. And then this final game, there's so many layers to the cake, right? There's the Barbican play, which kind of screws the timing for Vortex. There's the outpost crawl afterwards. And then the most perplexing part, Vortex was probably watching the Lancer number go up and go, this doesn't make sense. I have Janissaries. I can even get my hands on some for free at any given point. Like, you should not keep doing this. I think what we were seeing there is Vortex maybe anticipating a slower approach where China booms up and goes to Spim and Nest of Bees. But Puppy Paw mm-hmm. just always setting a new precedence, always kind of unexpectedly catching Vortex with his pants down here it means he wins 4-1 and heads through that semifinal. That means both our Spaniards are gone. We've now got an interesting split here, Winston. Of the four remaining, EU is still heavily loaded. The two players that went through top of their groups from the EU region. But what I love to be able to say is that in our top four, we have got representation from North America, Asia, and Europe. That is so refreshing to be able to say, right? Because like typically, by this point in the tournament, it's always EU dominant with maybe one or two Canadians kind of hanging in there. There's never any other representation, but I love that we're getting like a more diverse pool. I am basically fanboying Louis here because I genuinely am so ecstatic that Asia is actually getting some representation, especially considering we've been losing a few of the top players recently. Yeah, just incredible series today. I really look forward to next weekend. I'll be joining you all as a spectator. Um, Yeah, but guys, keep in mind, next weekend, it's going to all come down to it. Uh, We're going to have our final two group stage toppers rejoining in. So that'll be Marine Lord and Beastie. We'll be back into the playoffs because that's how the bracket works. Um, Looks like Puppy Paw was ready and waiting for his challenger, whereas uh, we saw Louis uh, beat out Wham earlier, so... We got some solid opponents. Really, really fun series to look forward to next weekend. Be be sure to tune in. Same time as usual. Be there. Be square. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Be honest. There was a thought there in your brain. Like, same time as usual. Crap, they have the times in European. Uh, Of course, it's going to be... (laughs) Yep, I definitely was like 15 GMT. I'm pretty (laughs) sure that's the time, but I'm about to say 11 a.m. And that's going to get a lot of people confused. Oh, man. All right, guys, so make sure you're there. Uh, we are going to have semifinals, which is going to be best of sevens, mm-hmm. into a best of nine grand final, as well as we're going to have a third place match. We need to double check uh, what we confirmed the format's going to be for that. But of the remaining, you're going to have Marine Lord versus Louis MT. If you think that's going to be a stomp up, <laughs> think again. In the group stage, when they matched up, Louis was able mm-hmm. to take it 2 1. Beastie versus Puppy Paw is also a series that's become closer and closer as time has gone on. And I would fairly say that Puppy Paw is looking the best he has in a bloody long time. So make sure you're there. That's going to be it from me and Winston for now though be sure to tune in next weekend for the final weekend of the Elite Classic 2 because I promise you it's going to deliver we'll see you soon bye sweet